Chapter One of The Sword of Damocles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England. The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. Dedication. To my father, I dedicate this book as expressing some of the principles of justice and mercy which by precept and example he has instilled into my breast from early childhood when all else fails love saves damocles one of the courtiers of dionysius was perpetually extolling with rapture that tyrant's treasures grandeur the number of his troops the extent of his dominions, the magnificence of his palaces, and the universal abundance of all good things and enjoyments in his possession, always repeating that never man was happier than Dionysius. Since you are of that opinion, said the tyrant to him one day, will you taste and make proof of my felicity in person? The offer was accepted with joy, Damocles was placed upon a golden couch, covered with carpets richly embroidered. The sideboards were loaded with vessels of gold and silver. The most beautiful slaves in the most splendid habits stood around, ready to serve him at the slightest signal. The most exquisite essences and perfumes had not been spared. The table was spread with proportionate magnificence. Damocles was all joy and looked upon himself as the happiest man in the world, when, unfortunately, casting up his eyes, he beheld over his head the point of a sword, which hung from the roof only by a single horsehair. Rollin Book One Two Men Chapter One A Wanderer There's No Such Word Bulwer a wind was blowing through the city, not a gentle and balmy zephyr stirring the locks on gentle ladies' foreheads and rustling the curtains in elegant boudoirs, but a chill and bitter gale that rushed with a swoop through narrow alleys and forsaken courtyards, biting the cheeks of the few solitary wanderers that still lingered abroad in the darkened streets. In front of a cathedral that reared its lofty steeple in the midst of the squalid houses and worse than squalid saloons of one of the dreariest portions of the east side stood the form of a woman. She had paused in her rush down the narrow street to listen to the music perhaps or to catch a glimpse of the light that now and then burst from the widely swinging doors as they opened and shut upon some tardy worshipper. She was tall and fearful looking. Her face, when the light struck it, was seared and desperate. Gloom and desolation were written on all the lines of her rigid but wasted form, and when she shuddered under the gale, it was with that force and abandon to which passion lends its aid, and in which the soul proclaims its doom. Suddenly the doors before her swung wide, and the preacher's voice was heard. Love God, and you will love your fellow men. Love your fellow men, and you best show your love to God. She heard, started, and the charm was broken. Love, she echoed with a horrible laugh. There is no love in heaven or on earth. And she swept by, and the winds followed, and the darkness swallowed her up like a gulf. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A discussion. Young men think old men fools, and old men know young men to be so. Ray's Proverbs. And you are actually in earnest? I am. The first speaker, a fine-looking gentleman of some forty years of age, drummed with his fingers on the table before him, 
and eyed the face of the young man who had repeated this assent so emphatically with a certain close scrutiny indicative of surprise it is an unlooked-for move for you to make he remarked at length your success as a pianist has been so decided i confess i do not understand why you should desire to abandon a profession that in five years time has procured you both competence and a very enviable reputation for the doubtful prospects of wall street too he added with a deep and thoughtful frown that gave still further impressiveness to his strongly marked features the young man with a sweep of his eye over the luxurious apartment in which they sat shrugged his shoulders with that fine and nonchalant grace which was one of his chief characteristics with such a pilot as yourself i ought to be able to steer clear of the shoals said he a frank smile illumining a face that was rather interesting than handsome the elder gentleman did not return the smile instead of that he remained gazing at the ample coal fire that burned in the grate before him with a look that to the young musician was simply inexplicable you see the ship in haven he murmured at last but do not consider what storms it has weathered or what perils escaped it is a voyage i would encourage no son of mine to undertake yet you are not the man to shrink from danger or to hesitate in a course you had marked out for yourself because of the struggle it involved or the difficulties it presented the young man exclaimed almost involuntarily as his glance lingered with a certain sort of fascination on the powerful brow and steady if somewhat melancholy eye of his companion no but danger and difficulty should not be sought only subdued when encountered if you were driven into this path i should say god pity you and hold you out my hand to steady you along its precipices and above its sudden quicksands but you are not driven to it your profession offers you the means of an ample livelihood while your good heart and fair talents ensure you ultimate and honourable success both in the social and artistic world for a man of twenty-five such prospects are not common and he must be difficult to please not to be satisfied with them yes said the other rising with a fitful movement but instantly sitting again i have nothing to complain of as the world goes only sir he exclaimed with a sudden determination that lent a force to his features they had hitherto lacked you speak of being driven into a certain course what do you mean by that i mean returned the other forced by circumstances to enter a line of business to which many others if not all others are preferable you speak strongly speculation evidently has none of your sympathy notwithstanding the favourable results which have accrued to you from it but excuse me by circumstances you mean poverty i suppose and the lack of every other opening to wealth and position you would not consider the desire to make a large fortune in a short space of time a circumstance of a sufficiently determining nature to reconcile you to my entering wall street speculation the elder gentleman rose not as the other had done with a restless impulse quickly subsiding at the first excuse but forcibly and with a feverish impatience that to appearance was somewhat out of proportion to the occasion a large fortune in a short space of time he reiterated pausing where he had risen with an eagle glance at his companion and a ringing tone in his voice that bespoke a deep but hitherto suppressed agitation it is the alluring inscription above the pitfall into which many a noble youth has fallen the battle cry to a struggle that has led many a strong man the way of ruin the guide-post to a life whose feverish days and sleepless nights offer but poor compensation for the sudden splendours and as sudden reverses attached to it i had rather you had accounted for this sudden freak of yours 
by the strongest aspiration after power than by this cry of the merely mercenary man who in his desire to enjoy wealth prefers to win it by a stroke of luck rather than conquer it by a life of endeavour he stopped i am aware that this tirade against the ladder by which i myself have risen so rapidly must strike you as in ill taste but bertram i am interested in your welfare and am willing to incur some slight charge of inconsistency in order to ensure it and here he turned upon his companion with that expression of extreme gentleness which lent such a peculiar charm to his countenance and explained perhaps the almost unlimited power he held over the hearts and minds of those who came within the circle of his influence you are very good sir murmured his young friend who to explain matters at once was in reality the nephew of this wall street magnate though from the fact of his having taken another name on entering the musical profession was not generally known as such no one not even my father himself could have been more considerate and kind but i do not think you understand me or rather i should say i do not think i have made myself perfectly intelligible to you it is not for the sake of wealth itself or the eclat attending its possession that i desire an immediate fortune but that by means of it i may attain another object dearer than wealth and more precious than my career the elder gentleman turned quickly evidently much surprised and cast a sudden inquiring glance at his nephew who blushed with a modest ingenuousness pleasing to see in one so well accustomed to the critical gaze of his fellow-men yes said he as if in answer to that look i am in love a deep silence for a moment pervaded the apartment a sombre silence almost startling to young mandeville who had expected some audible expression to follow this announcement if only the good-natured pooh pooh of the matured man of the world in the presence of ardent youthful enthusiasm what could it mean looking up he encountered his uncle's eye fixed upon him with the last expression he could have anticipated seeing there namely that of actual and unmistakable alarm you are displeased mandeville exclaimed you have thought me proof against such a passion or perhaps you do not believe in the passion itself then with a sudden remembrance of the notable if somewhat indolent loveliness of his uncle's wife blushed again at his unusual want of tact while his eye with an involuntary impulse sought the large panel at their right where in the full bloom of her first youth the lady of the house smiled upon all beholders i do not believe in that passion influencing a man's career his uncle replied with no apparent attention to the other's embarrassment a woman needs be possessed of uncommon excellences to justify a man in leaving a path where success is certain for one where it is not only doubtful but if attained must bring many a regret and heartache in its train beauty is not sufficient he went on with sterner and sterner significance though it were of an angelic order there must be worth and here his mind's eye if not that of his bodily sense certainly followed the glance of his companion i believe there is worth the young man replied certainly it is not her beauty that charms me i do not even know if she is beautiful he continued and you believe you love the elder exclaimed after another short pause there was so much of bitterness in the tone in which this was uttered that mandeville forgot its incredulity i think i must returned he with a certain masculine naivety not out of keeping with his general style of face and manner else i should not be here three weeks ago i was satisfied with my profession if not enthusiastic over it to-day i ask nothing but to be allowed to enter upon some business 
that in three years time at least will place me where i can be the fit mate of any woman in this land that is not worth her millions the woman for whom you have conceived this violent attachment is then above you in social position yes sir or so considered which amounts to the same thing as far as i am concerned bertram i have lived longer than you and have seen much of both social and domestic life and i tell you no woman is worth such a sacrifice on the part of a man as you propose no woman of to-day i should say our mothers were different the very fact that this young lady of whom you speak obliges you to change your whole course of life in order to obtain her ought to be sufficient to prove to you he stopped suddenly arrested by the young man's lifted hand she does not oblige you then not on her own account sir this lily lifting a vase of blossoms at his elbow could not be more innocent of the necessities that govern the social circle it adorns than the pure single-minded girl to whom i have dedicated what is best and noblest in my manhood it is her father ah her father yes sir the young man pursued more and more astonished at the other's tone he is a man who has a right to expect both wealth and position in a son-in-law but i see i shall have to tell you my story sir it is an uncommon one and i never meant that it should pass my lips but if by its relation i can win your sympathy for a pure and noble passion i shall consider the sacred seal of secrecy broken in a good cause but said he seeing his uncle cast a short and uneasy glance at the door perhaps i am interrupting you you expect some one no said his uncle my wife is at church i am ready to listen the young man gave a hurried sigh cast one look at his companion's immovable face as if to assure himself that the narrative was necessary then leaned back and in a steady business-like tone that softened however as he proceeded began to relate as follows end of chapter two Chapter Three of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Mysterious Summons. Without, unspotted, innocent within, she feared no danger, for she knew no sin. Dryden. It was after a matinee performance at Blank Hall some two weeks ago that I stopped to light a cigar in the small corridor leading to the back entrance. I was in a dissatisfied frame of mind. Something in the music I had been playing, or the manner in which it had been received, had touched unwanted chords in my own nature. I felt alone. I remember asking myself as I stood there what it all amounted to. Who, of all the applauding crowd, would watch at my bedside through a long and harassing sickness, or lend their sympathy, as they now yielded their praise, if instead of carrying off the honours of the day, I had failed to do justice to my reputation. I was just smiling over the only exception I could make to this sweeping assertion, that of the pale-eyed youth you have sometimes observed dogging my steps, when Briggs came up to me. "'There is a woman here, sir, who insists on seeing you. "'She has been waiting through half the last piece. "'Shall I tell her you are coming out?' "'A woman?' exclaimed I, somewhat surprised, "'for my visitors are not apt to be of the gentler sex. "'Yes, sir, an old one. "'She seems very anxious to speak to you. "'I could not get rid of her nohow.' I hurried forward to the muffled figure which he pointed out cowering against the wall by the door. "'Well, my good woman, what do you want?' I asked, bending towards her in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the face she held partly concealed from me. "'Are you Mr. Mandeville?' she inquired, in a tone shaken as much by agitation as age. 
I bowed. The one who plays upon the piano? The very same, I declared. You are not deceiving me, she went on, looking up with a marked anxiety, plainly visible through her veil. I haven't seen you play and couldn't contradict you, but... Here, said I, calling to Briggs with a kindly look at the old woman. Help me on with my coat, will you? The, certainly, Mr. Mandeville, with which he complied, seemed to reassure her, and as soon as the coat was on and he was gone, she grasped me by the arm and drew my ear down to her mouth. If you are Mr. Mandeville, I have a message for you. This letter, slipping one into my hand, is from a young lady, sir. She bade me give it to you myself. She is young and pretty, she pursued, as she saw me make a movement of distaste, and a lady. We depend upon your honour, sir. I acknowledge that my first impulse was to fling her back the note and leave the building. I was in no mood for trifling. My next to burst into a laugh and politely hand her to the door. My last, and best, to open the poor little note and see for myself whether the writer was a lady or not. Proceeding to the door, for it was already twilight in the dim passageway, I tore open the envelope, which was dainty enough, and took out a sheet of closely written paper. A certain qualm of conscience assailed me as I saw the delicate chirography it disclosed, and I was tempted to thrust it back and return it unread to the old woman now trembling in the corner. But curiosity overcame my scruples, and hastily unfolding the sheet, I read these lines. I do not know if what I do is right. I am sure Auntie would not say it was, but Auntie never thinks anything is right but going to church and reading the papers to Papa. I am just a little girl who has heard you play and who would think the world was too beautiful if she could hear you say to her just once some of the kind things you must speak every day to the persons who know you. I do not expect very much. You must have a great many friends, and you would not care for me, but the least little look, if it were all my own, would make me so happy and so proud I should not envy anybody in the world unless it was some of those dear friends who see you always. I do not come and hear you play often, for Auntie thinks music frivolous, but I am always hearing you, no matter where I am, and it makes me feel as if I were far away from everybody in a beautiful land all sunshine and flowers. But Nurse says I must not write so much or you will not read it, so I will stop here. But if you would come, it would make someone happier than even your beautiful music could do. That was all. There was neither name nor date. A child's epistle, written with a woman's circumspection. With mingled sensations of doubt and curiosity, I turned back to the old woman who stood awaiting me with eager anxiety. Was this written by a child or woman? I asked, meeting her eye with as much sternness as I could assume. Don't ask me. Don't ask me anything. I have promised to bring you if I could, but I cannot answer any questions. I stepped back with an incredulous laugh. Here was evidently an adventure. You will at least tell me where the young miss lives, said I, before I undertake to fulfil her request. She shook her head. I have a carriage at the door, sir, said she. All you have got to do is to get into it with me and we shall soon be at the house. I looked from her face to the letter in my hand and knew not what to think. The spirit of simplicity and ingenuousness that marked the latter was scarcely in keeping with this air of mystery. The woman, observing my hesitation, moved towards the door. "'Will you come, sir?' she inquired. "'You will not regret it. "'Just a moment's talk with a pretty young girl. "'Surely—' "'Hush!' said I, hearing a hasty step behind me. 
and sure enough just then my intimate friend selby came along and grasping me by the arm began dragging me towards the door you are my property said he i've promised on my word of honour as a gentleman and a musician to bring you to the handel club this afternoon i was afraid you had escaped me but here he caught sight of the small black figure halting in the doorway and paused who's this said he i hesitated for one instant the scale of my whole future destiny hung trembling in the balance then the demon of curiosity got the better of my judgment and with the rather unworthy consideration that i might as well enjoy my youth while i could i released myself from my friend's detaining hand and replied someone with whom i have very particular business i cannot go to the handel club to-day and darting out without further delay i rejoined the old woman on the sidewalk without a word she drew me towards a carriage i now observed standing by the curbstone a few feet to the left as i got in i remember pausing a moment to glance at the man on the box but it was too dark for me to perceive anything but the fact that he was dressed in livery more and more astonished i leaned back in my seat and endeavoured to open conversation with my mysterious companion but it did not work without being actually rude she parried my questions in such a way that by the end of five minutes i found myself as far from any knowledge of the real situation of the case as when i started i therefore desisted from any further attempts and turned to look out when i made a discovery that for the first time awoke some vague feelings of alarm within my breast this was that the window was not covered by a curtain as i supposed but by closed blinds which when i tried to raise them resisted all my efforts to do so it is very close here i muttered in some sort of excuse for this display of uneasiness cannot you give us a little air but my companion remained silent and i felt ashamed to press the matter though i took advantage of the darkness to remove to a safer place a roll of money which i had about me yet i was far from being really anxious and did not once meditate backing out of an adventure that was at once so piquant and romantic for by this time i became conscious from the sounds about me that we had left the side street for one of the avenues and were then proceeding rapidly uptown listening i heard the roll of omnibuses and the jingle of car bells which informed me that we were in broadway no other avenue in the city being traversed by both these methods of conveyance but after a while the jingle ceased and presently the livelier sounds of constant commotion inseparable from a business thoroughfare and we entered what i took to be madison avenue at twenty-third street instantly i made up mind to notice every turn of the carriage that i might fix to some degree the locality towards which we were tending but it turned but once and that after a distance of steady travelling that quite overthrew any calculation i was able to make at that time of the probable number of streets we had passed since entering the avenue having turned it went but about half a block to the left when it stopped i shall see where i am when i get out thought i but in this i was mistaken first we had stopped in the middle of a block of houses built as far as i could judge all after one model next the fact of the front door being open though i saw no one in the hall somewhat disconcerted me and i hurried across the sidewalk and up the stoop in a species of maze hardly to be expected from one of my naturally careless disposition the next moment the door closed behind me and i found myself in a well-lighted hall whose quiet richness betokened it as belonging to a private dwelling of no mean pretensions to elegance this was the first surprise i received follow me said the old woman hurrying me down the hall and into a small room at the end the young lady will be here in a moment and without lifting her veil 
or affording me the least glimpse of her features, she retired, leaving me to face the situation before me as best I might. It was anything but a pleasant one, as it appeared to me at that moment, and for an instant I seriously thought of retracing my steps and leaving a domicile into which I had been introduced in such a mysterious manner. Then the quiet aspect of the room, which, though sparsely furnished with a piano and chairs, was still of an order rarely seen out of gentlemen's houses, struck my imagination and reawakened my curiosity, and nerving myself to meet whatever interview might be accorded me, I waited. It was only five minutes by the small clock ticking on the mantelpiece, but it seemed an hour before I heard a timid step at the door, and saw it swing slowly open, disclosing, well, I did not stop to inquire whether it was a child or a woman. I merely saw the shrinking modest form, the eager blushing face, and bowed almost to the ground in a sudden reverence for the sublime innocence revealed to me. Yes, it did not take a second look, to read that tender countenance to its last guileless page. Had she been a woman of twenty-five, I could not have mistaken her expression of pure delight and timid interest. But she was only sixteen, as I afterwards learned, and younger in experience than in age. Closing the door behind her, she stood for a moment without speaking, then, with a deepening of the blush which was only a child's embarrassment in the presence of a stranger, looked up and murmured my name with a word or so of grateful acknowledgement that would have called forth a smile on my lips if I had not been startled by the sudden change that passed over her features when she met my eyes. Was it that I showed my surprise too plainly? or did my admiration manifest itself in my gaze, an admiration great as it was humble, and which was already of a nature such as I had never before given to girl or woman? Whatever it was, she no sooner met my look than she paused, trembled, and started back with a confused murmur, through which I plainly heard her whisper in a low, distressed tone, "'Oh, what have I done?' called a good friend to your side said i in the frank brotherly way i thought most likely to reassure her do not be alarmed i am only too happy to meet one who evidently enjoys music so well but the hidden chord of womanhood had been struck in the child's soul and she could not recover herself for an instant i thought she would turn and flee and struck as I was with remorse at my reckless invasion of this uncontaminated temple, I could not but admire the spirited picture she presented, as, with form half-turned and face bent back, she stood hesitating on the point of flight. I did not try to stop her. She shall follow her own impulse, said I to myself but I felt a vague relief that was deeper than I imagined when she suddenly relinquished her strained attitude and advancing a step or so began to murmur, I did not know, I did not realise I was doing what was so very wrong. Young ladies do not ask gentlemen to come and see them, no matter how much they desire to make their acquaintance. I see it now, I did not before. Will you, can you, forgive me? I smiled. I could not help it. I could have taken her to my heart and soothed her as I would a child. But the pallor of womanhood, which had replaced the blush of the child, awed me and made my own words come hesitatingly. Forgive you? You must forgive me. It was as wrong for me. I went on with a wild idea of not mincing matters with this pure soul, to obey your innocent request, as it was for you to make it. I am a man of the world, and know its convenance. You are very young. I am sixteen, she murmured. The abrupt little confession, implying as it did 
her determination not to accept any palliation of her conduct which it did not deserve touched me strangely but very young for that i exclaimed so auntie says but no one can ever say it any more she answered then with a sudden gush we shall never see each other again and you must forget the motherless girl who has met you in a way for which she must blush through life it is no excuse she pursued hurriedly that nurse thought it was all right she always approves of everything i do or want to do especially if it is anything aunt would be likely to forbid i have been spoiled by nurse was nurse the woman who came for me i asked she nodded her head with a quick little motion inexpressibly charming yes that was nurse she said she would do it all i need only write the note she meant to give me a pleasure but she did wrong yes thought i how wrong you little know or realize but i only said you must be guided by someone with more knowledge of the world after this not i made haste to add struck by the misery in her child eyes that any harm has been done you could not have appealed to the friendship of any one who would hold you in greater respect than i whether we meet again or not my memory of you shall be sweet and sacred i promise you that but she threw out her hand with a quick gesture no do not remember me my only happiness will lie in the thought you have forgotten and the last remnants of the child's soul vanished in that hurried utterance you must go now she continued more calmly the carriage that brought you is at the door i must ask you to take it back to your home but i exclaimed with a wild and unbearable sense of sudden loss as she laid her hand on the knob of the door are we to part like this will you not at least trust me with your name before i go her hand dropped from the knob as if it had been hot steel and she turned towards me with a slow yearning motion that whatever it betokened set my heart beating violently you do not know it then she inquired i know nothing but what this little note contains i replied drawing her letter from my pocket oh that letter i must have it she murmured then as i stepped towards her drew back and pointing to the table said lay it there please i did so whereupon something like a smile crossed her lips and i thought she was going to reward me with her name but she only said i thank you now you know nothing and almost before i realized it she had opened the door and stepped into the hall as i made haste to follow her the sound of a low he is a gentleman he will ask no questions struck my ear and looking up i saw her just leaving the side of the old nurse who stood evidently awaiting me half down the hall bowing with formal ceremony i passed her by and proceeded to the front door as i did so i caught one glimpse of her face it had escaped from all restraint and the expression of the eyes was overpowering i subdued a wild impulse to leap back to her side and stepped at once over the threshold the nurse joined me and together we went down the stoop to the street may i inquire where you wish to be taken she asked i told her and she gave the order to the coachman together with a few words i did not hear then stepping back she waited for me to get in there was no help for it I gave one quick look behind me, saw the front door close, realized how impossible it would ever be for me to recognize the house again, and placed my foot on the carriage step. Suddenly a bright idea struck me, and hastily dropping my cane, I stepped back to pick it up. As I did so, I pulled out a bit of crayon I chanced to have in my pocket, and as I stooped, chalked a small cross on the curbstone directly in front of the house 
after which I recovered my cane, uttered some murmured word of apology, jumped into the carriage, and was about to shut the door, when the old nurse stepped in after me and quietly closed it herself. By the pang that shot through my breast as the carriage wheels left the house, I knew that for the first time in my life I loved. End of chapter 3「Four of the Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Searchings Patience and Shuffle the Cards Cervantes If I had expected anything from the presence in the carriage of the woman who had arranged this interview, I was doomed to disappointment. Reticent before, she was absolutely silent now sitting at my side like a grim statue or a frozen image of watchfulness ready to awake and stop me if i offered to open the door or make any other move indicative of a determination to know where i was or in what direction i was going that her young mistress in the momentary conversation they had held before our departure had succeeded in giving her some idea of the shame with which she had felt herself overwhelmed and her present natural desire for secrecy, I do not doubt. But I think now, as I thought then, that the unusual precautions taken both at that time and before to keep me in ignorance of the young lady's identity were due to the elderly woman's own consciousness of the peril she had invoked in yielding to the wishes of her young and thoughtless mistress, a theory which, if true, argues more for the mind than the conscience of this mysterious woman. However, it is with facts we have to deal, and you will be more interested in learning what I did than what I thought during that short ride in perfect darkness. The mark which I had left on the curbstone behind me sufficiently showed the nature of my resolve, and when we made the first turn at the end of the block, I leaned back in my seat and laying my finger on my wrist, began to count the pulsations of my blood. It was the only device that suggested itself, by which I might afterward gather some approximate notion of the distance we travelled in a straight course downtown. I had just arrived at the number 762, and was inwardly congratulating myself upon this new method of reckoning distance, when the wheels gave a lurch, and we passed over a car track. Instantly, all my fine calculations fell to the ground. We were not in Madison Avenue, as I supposed. Could not be, since no track crosses that avenue below 59th Street. And we were proceeding on as we could not have done had we gained the terminus of the avenue at 23rd Street. Could it be that the carriage had not been turned around while I was in the house, and that we had come back by way of Fifth Avenue. I could not remember. In fact, the more I tried to think which way the horses' heads were directed when we went into the house, the more I was confused. But presently I considered that wherever we were, we certainly had not passed over the narrow strip of smooth pavement in front of the Worth Monument, and therefore could not have reached 23rd Street by way of Fifth Avenue. We must be uptown, and that track we crossed must have been at 59th Street. And soon, as if to assure me of this, we took a turn, quickly followed at a block's length by another, after which I had no difficulty in recognising the smooth pavement of the entrance to the park, or the roll down Fifth Avenue afterwards. They have thought to confuse me by an extra mile or so of travel thought I with some complacency, but the streets of New York are too simply laid out to lend themselves to any such easy mode of mystification. Yet I have thought since then how, with a smarter man on the box, the affair might have been conducted so as to have baffled the oldest citizen in any attempt at calculation. When we stopped in front of the Albemarle, I quietly thanked the woman who had conducted me and stepped to the ground. Instantly, the door shut behind me, the carriage drove off, 
and I was left standing there like a man suddenly awakened from a dream. Entering my hotel, I ordered supper, thinking that the very practical occupation of eating would serve to divert my mind into its ordinary channels. But the dream, if dream it was, had made too vivid an impression to be shaken off so easily. It followed me to the hall in the evening and mingled with every chord I struck. I could scarcely sleep that night for thinking of the sweet child's face that had blossomed into a woman's before my eyes, and what a woman. With the first hint of daylight I rose, and as soon as it was in any degree suitable to be out, hired a cab and proceeded to the corner of 59th Street and Madison Avenue, where, according to my calculations of the evening before, we had crossed the car track which had first interrupted me in that very original method of computing distance of which I have already spoken, a method, by the way, which you must acknowledge is an improvement on the boy's plan of finding his way back from the woods by means of the breadcrumbs he had scattered behind him, forgetting that the birds would eat up his crumbs and leave him without a clue. Bidding the driver proceed at the ordinary jog-trot down the avenue, I laid my finger on my wrist and counted each throb of my pulse till I had reached the magical number 762. Then, putting my head out of the window, I bade him stop. We were in the middle of a block, but that did not disconcert me. I had not expected to gain more than an approximate idea of the spot where we had first turned into the avenue, it being impossible to regulate the horse's pace so as to tally with that taken by the span of the night before, even if the pulsations in my wrist were to be absolutely relied upon. Noting the streets between which we had paused, I bade the driver to turn down one and come back by the other, occupying myself in the meanwhile in searching the curbstone for the small mark I had left in front of her door the night before. But though we drove slowly, and I searched carefully, not a trace did I perceive of that tell-tale sign, and forsaking those two streets, I ordered my obedient Jehu to try the two outlying ones below and above. He did so, and I again consulted the curbstone, but with no better success. No mark or remnants of a mark was to be found anywhere. Nor, though we travelled through three or four other streets in the same way, did we come upon any clue liable to assist me in my search. Clean discouraged, and somewhat out of temper with myself, for my pusillanimity of the evening before, in not having braved the anger of my companion by opening the carriage door at the first corner and leaping out, I commanded to be taken back to the hotel, where for a whole miserable day I racked my brain with devices for acquiring the knowledge I so much desired. The result was futile, as you may imagine nor will I stop to recount the various expedients to which I afterwards resorted in my vain attempt to solve the mystery of this young girl's identity. Enough that they all failed, even the very promising one, of searching the various photographic establishments of the city for the valuable clue which her picture would give me, and so a week passed. It is time this mad infatuation was at an end said I to myself one morning as I sat down to write a letter. There is no hope of my ever seeing her again, and I am but frittering away the best emotions of my life in thus indulging in a dream that is not the prelude to a reality. But in spite of the wise determination thus made, I soon found my thoughts recurring to their old channel, and seized with sudden impatience at my evident weakness, took up the letter I had been writing, and was about to read it, when, to my great amazement, I perceived that instead of inditing the usual words of a business communication, I had been engaged in scribbling a certain number up and down the page, and even across the bottom where my signature should have been. "'Am I a fool?' I exclaimed, and was about to tear the sheet in two, when glancing again at the number, which was a simple thirty-six, I asked myself where I had got those especial figures. 
instantly there arose before my mind's eye the vision of a brownstone front with its vestibule and door it was then the number of a house but what house a chateau en espagne or a bona fide new york dwelling which for some reason had unconsciously impressed itself upon my memory i could not answer there on the page was the number thirty six and equally plain in my mind was the look of the brownstone front to which that number belonged and that was all but it was enough to awaken within me the spirit of inquiry the few houses thus numbered in that quarter of the city where i had lately been were not so hard to find but that a morning given to the business ought to satisfy me whether the vision in my mind had its basis in reality taking a cab i rode up town and into that region of streets i had traversed so carefully a week before for i was assured that if the impression had been made by an actual dwelling it had been done at that time following the same course i then took i consulted the appearance of the various houses to which that number was assigned the first was built of brick that was not it the next one had pillars to the vestibule and that was not it the third to use an irish bull was no house at all but a stable while the fourth was an elegant structure of much more pretension than the plain and simple front i had in my mind or memory i was about to utter a curse upon my folly and go home when i remembered there was yet a street or two taken in my zigzag course of the week before which i had not yet tested might as well be thorough i muttered and bade my driver proceed down blank street what was there in its aspect that dimly excited me at the first glance a dim remembrance a certain ghostly assurance that we had reached the right spot as we neared the number i sought i could not suppress an exclamation of surprise for there before me to its last detail stood the house which involuntarily presented itself to my mind when my eye first fell upon that mysterious number scribbled at the foot of the page i was writing it was then no chimera of an overwrought brain this vision of a house front which had been haunting me but a distinct remembrance of an actual dwelling seen by me in my former journey through this street but why this house front above all others what was there in it to make such an impression looking at it i could not determine but after we had passed something i cannot tell what brought back another remembrance trivial in itself but yet a link in the chain that was destined sooner or later to lead me out of the maze into which i had stumbled it was merely this that as i rode along the streets on that memorable morning searching for that mark on the curbstone from which i hoped so much I had come upon a spot where the pavement had been freshly washed. With that unconscious action of the brain with which we are familiar, I looked at the sidewalk a moment, running even then with the water that had been cast upon it, and then gave a quick glance at the house. That glance, account for it as you will, took in the picture before it as the camera catches the impression of a likeness and though in another instant i had forgotten the whole occurrence it needed but a certain train of thought or perhaps a certain state of emotion to revive it again a noble cause for such an act of unconscious cerebration you will say a freshly washed pavement le jeu ne faut pas la chandelle and so i thought too or would have thought if i had not been so interested in the pursuit in which i was engaged and if the idea had not suggested itself that water and a broom might obliterate chalk marks from curbstones and that the imps that preside over our mental forces would not indulge in such a trick at my expense unless the play was worth the candle at all events from the moment i made this discovery I fixed my faith on that house as the one which held the object of my search, 
and though I contented myself with merely noting the number of the street as we left it, I none the less determined to pursue my investigations, till I had learned beyond the possibility of a doubt whether my conjectures were not true. A perseverance worthy of a better cause, you will say, but you are no longer twenty-five and under the influence of your first passion. I own I was astonished at myself, and frequently paused in the pursuit I had undertaken, to ask if I were the same person who but a fortnight before laughed at the story of a man who had gone mad over the body of an unknown woman he had saved from a wreck only to find her dead in his arms. The first thing I did was to ascertain the name of the gentleman occupying the house I have specified. It was that of one of our wealthiest and most respectable bankers, a name as well known in the city as your own, for instance. This was somewhat disconcerting, but with a dogged resolution somewhat foreign to my natural disposition, I persevered in my investigations, and learning in the next breath that the gentleman alluded to was a widower with an only child, a young daughter of about sixteen or so, recovered my assurance, though not my equanimity. Seeking out my friend Farrar, who, as you know, is a walking gazette of New York society, I broached the subject of Mr. Excuse me if I do not mention his name. Allow me to say Preston's domestic affairs, and learned that Miss Preston, a naive little piece for so great an heiress, I remember Farrar called her, had left town within a day or two for a visit to some friends in Baltimore. I happen to know, said he, with that careless sweep of his hand at which you have so often laughed, because my friend, Miss Forsyth, met her at the depot. She was intending to be gone two weeks, I think she said. Do you know her? That last question sprung upon me unawares, and I am afraid I blushed. No, I returned, I have not that honour, but an acquaintance of mine has, well, has met her, and... I see, I see, broke in Farrar with his most disagreeable smile. Then, with a short laugh, meant to act as a warning, I suppose, added as he walked off, I hope your friend is in fair circumstances and not connected with the fine arts, Music is Mr. Preston's detestation, while Miss Preston, though too young to be much sought after yet, will in two years' time have the pick of the city at her command. So, thought I to myself, my little innocent charmer is an embryo aristocrat, eh? Well then, I was a greater fool than I imagined. And I walked out of the hotel where I had met Farrar, with the very sensible conclusion to drop a subject that promised nothing but disappointment. But the fates were against me, or the good angels perhaps, and at the next corner I met an old acquaintance, the very opposite of Farrar in character, who with a long love story of his own, fired my imagination to such an extent that in spite of myself I turned down blank street and was proceeding to pass her house when suddenly the thought struck me, how do I know that this unapproachable daughter of one of our most prominent citizens is one and the same person with my dainty little charmer? Widowers with young daughters are not so rare in this great city that I need consider the question as decided, because by a half-superstitious freak of my own I have settled upon this house as the one I was in the other night. My inamorata may be the offspring of a musician, for all I know, and inflamed at the thought of this possibility, I remembered the piano, you see, I gave to the winds all my fine resolutions, and only asked how I could determine for once and all whether I had ever crossed the threshold of the house before me. Some men would have run up the stoop, rung the bell, and asked to see Mr. Preston on some pretended business he could easily conjure up to suit the occasion. But my face is too well known for me to risk any such attempt. Besides, I was too anxious to win the confidence of the young girl, to shock her awakened sense of propriety 
by seeming to seek her where she did not wish to be found and yet i must enter that house and see for myself if it was the one that held her on that memorable evening pondering the question i looked back at the door so obstinately closed against my curiosity when to my satisfaction and delight it suddenly opened and a man stepped out whom i instantly recognized as a business agent for one of the largest pianoforte manufactories in the city the heavens smile upon my enterprise thought i and waited for the man to come up with me he was not only a friend of mine but largely indebted to me in various ways so that i knew i had only to urge a request for it to be immediately granted and that too without any questions or gossip you will not be interested in anything but the result which was somewhat out of the usual course and may therefore shock you but you must remember that i am telling you of matters which young men usually keep to themselves and that whatever i did was accomplished in a spirit of respect only a shade less constraining in its power than the love that was at once my impelling force and my constant embarrassment to come then to the point a piano was to be set up in that house on that very day mr preston having yielded to the solicitations of his daughter for a new instrument my friend was to be engaged in the transfer and at my solicitation for leave to assist in the operation gave his consent in perfect confidence as to my possessing good and sufficient reasons for such a remarkable request and appointed the hour at which i was to meet him at the ware rooms behold me then at half past two that afternoon assisting with my own hands in carrying a piano up the stoop of that house which four hours before i had regarded as unapproachable dressed in a workman's blouse and with my hair well roughened under a rude cap that effectually disguised me i advanced with but little fear of detection and yet no sooner had i entered the house and seen at a glance that the aspect of the hall coincided with my rather vague remembrance of that through which i had been ushered a week before then i was struck by a sudden sense of my situation and experiencing that uncomfortable consciousness of self-betrayal which a blush always gives a man stumbled forward under my heavy burden feeling as if a thousand eyes were fixed upon me and my cherished secret instead of the two sharp but totally unsuspicious orbs of the elderly matron that surveyed us from the top of the banisters be careful there you'll knock a hole through that glass door though a natural cry under the circumstances struck on my ears with the force and mysterious power of a secret warning and when after a moment of blind advance i suddenly lifted my eyes and found myself in the little room which like a silhouette on a white ground stood out in my memory in distinct detail as the spot where i had first heard my own heart beat i own that i felt my hands slipping from my burden and in another moment had disgraced my character of a workman if i had not caught the sudden ring of a well-known voice in the hall as nurse answered from above some question propounded by the elderly lady with the piercing eyes as it was i recovered myself and went through my duties as promptly and deftly as if my heart did not throb with memories that each passing hour and event only served to hallow to my imagination at length the piano was duly set up and we turned to leave will you think i am too trivial in my details if i tell you that i lingered behind the rest and for an instant let my hand with all its possibilities for calling out a soul from that dead instrument lie a moment on the keys over which her dainty fingers were so soon to traverse end of chapter four
Chapter Five of *The Sword of Damocles* by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rubicon. I'll stake my life upon her faith. Othello. Once convinced of the identity of my sweet young friend with the Miss Preston at whose feet a two year hence the wealth and aristocracy of New York would be kneeling. I drew back from further effort as having received a damper to my presumptuous hopes that would soon effectually stifle them. Everything I heard about the family, and it seemed as if suddenly each chance acquaintance that I met had something to say about Mr. Preston, either as a banker or a man, only served to confirm me in this view. He is a money worshipper, said one. The bluest of blue Presbyterians, declared another, the enemy of presumption and anything that looks like an overweening confidence in one's own worth or capabilities, remarked a third. A man who would beggar himself to save the honour of a corporation with which he was concerned, observed a fourth, but who would not invite to his table the most influential man connected with it if that man was unable to trace his family back to the old Dutch settlers to which Mr. Preston's own ancestors belonged. This latter statement I have no doubt was exaggerated, for I myself have seen him at dinners where half the gentlemen who lifted the wine-glass were self-made in every sense of the term, but it showed the bent of his mind, and it was a bent that left me entirely out of the sweep of his acquaintanceship, much less that of his exquisite daughter, the pride of his soul, if not the jewel of his heart." But when will a man who has seen or who flatters himself that he has seen in the eyes of the woman he admires the least spark of that fire which is consuming his own soul, pause at an obstacle which, after all, has its basis simply in circumstances of position or will? By the time the two weeks of her expected absence had expired, I had settled it in my own mind that I would see her again, and if I found the passing caprice of a child was likely to blossom into the steady regard of a woman, risk all in the attempt to win, by honourable endeavour and persistence, this bud of loveliness for my future wife. How I finally succeeded, by means of my friend Farrah, in being one evening invited to the same house as Miss Preston, it is not necessary to state. You will believe me it was done with the utmost regard for her feelings, and in a way that deceived Farrah himself, who, if he is the most prying, is certainly the most volatile of men. In a crowded parlour, then, in the midst of the flash of diamonds and the flutter of fans, Miss Preston and I again met. When I first saw her, she was engaged in conversation with some young companion, and I had the pleasure of watching for a few minutes, unobserved, the play of her ingenuous countenance as she talked with her friend, or sat silently watching the brilliant array before her. I found her like, and yet unlike, the vision of my dreams, more blithesome in her appearance, as was not strange considering her party attire, and the lustre of the chandelier under which she sat, there was still that indescribable something in her expression, which more than the flash of her eye or the curve of her lip, though both were lovely to me, made her face the one woman's face in the world for me. A charm which circumstances might alter, or suffering impair, but of which nothing save death could ever completely divest her, and not death either, for it was the seal of her individuality, and that she would take with her into the skies. If I might but advance and sit down by her side without a word of explanation or the interference of conventionalities, how happy I should be, thought I. But I knew that would not do, so I contented myself with my secret watch over her movements, longing for and yet dreading the advance of my hostess with its inevitable introduction. Suddenly the piano was touched in a distant room, and not till I saw the quick change in her face, a change hard to explain, 
did I recognise the selection as one I was in the habit of playing. She had not forgotten at least, and thrilled by the thought and the remembrance of that surge of colour which had swept like a flood over her cheek, I turned away, feeling as if I were looking on what it was for no man's eyes to see, least of all mine. My hostess's voice arrested me, and next moment I was bowing to the ground before Miss Preston. I am not a boy, nor have I been without my experiences. Life, with its vicissitudes, has taught me many a lesson, subjected me to many a trial, yet in all my career have I never known a harder moment than when I raised my eyes to meet hers after that lowly obeisance. That she would be indignant I knew, that she might even misinterpret my motives and probably withdraw without giving me an opportunity to speak, I felt to be only too probable. But that she would betray an agitation so painful I had not anticipated, and for an instant I felt that I had hazarded my life's happiness on a cast that was going against me. But the necessity of saving her from remark speedily restored me to myself, and following the line of conduct I had previously laid out, I addressed her with the reserve of a stranger, and neither by word, look, or manner conveyed to her a suggestion that we had ever met or spoken to each other before. She seemed to appreciate my consideration, and though she was as yet too much unused to the ways of the world to completely hide her perturbation, she gradually regained a semblance of self-possession and ere long was enabled to return short answers to my remarks, though her eyes remained studiously turned aside, and never so much as ventured to raise themselves to the passing throng, much less to my face, half turned away also. Presently, however, a change passed over her. Pressing her two little hands together, she drew back a step or two, speaking my name with a certain tone of command. Struck with apprehension, I knew not why, I followed her. Instantly, like one repeating a lesson, she spoke. It is very good in you to talk to me as though we were the strangers that people believe us. I appreciate it and thank you very much. But it is not being just true. That is, I feel as if I were not being just true. And as we can never be friends... Would it not be better for us not to meet in this way any more? And why, I gently asked, with a sense of struggling for my life, can we never be friends? Her answer was a deep blush, not that timid conscious appeal of the blood that is beating too warmly for reply, but the quick flush of indignant generosity, forced to do despite to its own instincts. That is a question I would rather not answer, she murmured at length. Only it is so, or I should not speak in this way. But, I ventured, resolved to know on just what foundations my happiness was tottering. You will at least tell me if this harsh decree is owing to any offence I myself may have inadvertently given. The honour of your acquaintance, I went on, determined she should know just what a hope she was slaying, is much too earnestly desired for me to wilfully hazard its loss by saying or doing aught that could be in any way displeasing to you. You have done nothing but what was generous, said she, with increasing womanliness of manner, unless it was taking advantage of my being here to learn my name and gain an introduction to me, after I had desired you to forget my very existence. I recoiled at that. The cord of my self-respect was touched. It was not here I learned your name, Miss Preston. It has been known to me for two weeks. At the risk of losing by your displeasure what is already hazarded by your prudence, I am bound to acknowledge that from the hour I left your father's house that night, 
I have spared no effort compatible with my deep respect for your feelings to ascertain who the young lady was that had done me such an honour and won from me such a deep regard. I had not intended to tell you this, I added, but your truth has awakened mine, and whatever the result may be, you must see me as I am. You are very kind, she replied, governing with growing skill the trembling of her voice. The acquaintance of a girl of sixteen is not worth so much trouble on the part of a man like yourself, and blushing with the vague apprehension of her sex in the presence of a devotion she rather feels than understands, she waved her trembling little hand and paused irresolute, seemingly anxious to terminate the interview, but as yet too inexperienced to know how to manage a dismissal requiring so much tact and judgment. I saw, comprehended her position, and hesitated. She was so young, uncle. Her prospects in life were so bright. If I left her then, in a couple of weeks she would forget me. What was I that I should throw the shadow of manhood's deepest emotion across the paradise of her young untrammelled being? But the old Adam of selfishness has his say in my soul as well as in that of my fellow men, and forgetting myself enough to glance at her half-averted face, I could not remember myself sufficiently afterwards to forego without a struggle all hope of some day beholding that soft cheek turn in confidence at my approach. Miss Preston, said I, the promise of the bud atones for its folded leaves. Then with a fervour I did not seek to disguise. You say we cannot be friends. Would your decision be the same if this were our first meeting? Again that flush of outraged feeling. I don't know. Yes, I think, I fear, it would. I strove to help her. There is too great a difference between Bertram Mandeville, the pianist, and the daughter of Thaddeus Preston. She turned and looked me gently in the eye. She did not need to speak. Regret, shame, longing flashed in her steady glance. Do not answer, said I. I understand. I am glad it is circumstances that stand in the way, and not any misconception on your part as to my motives and deep consideration for yourself. Circumstances can be changed, and satisfied with having thus dropped into the fruitful soil of that tender breast the seed of a future hope, I bowed with all the deference at my command and softly withdrew. But not to rest. With all the earnestness with which a man sets himself to decide upon the momentous question of life or death, I gave myself up to a night of reflection, and seated in my solitary bachelor apartment, debated with myself as to the resolution at which I had dimly hinted in my parting words to Miss Preston. That I am a musician by nature, my success with the public seems to indicate that by following out the line upon which I had entered, I would attain a certain eminence in my art, I do not doubt. But, uncle, there are two kinds of artists in this world. Those that work because the spirit is in them, and they cannot be silent if they would, and those that speak from a conscientious desire to make apparent to others the beauty that has awakened their own admiration. The first could not give up his art for any cause without the sacrifice of his soul's life. The latter, well, the latter could and still be a man with his whole inner being intact. Or, to speak plainer, the first has no choice, while the latter has if he has a will to exert it. Now you will say, and the world at large, that I belong to the former class. I have risen in ten years from a choir boy in Trinity Church to a position in the world of music that ensures me a full audience wherever and whenever I have a mind to exert my skill as a pianist. Not a man of my years has a more promising outlook in my profession, 
if you will pardon the seeming egotism of the remark, and yet by the ease with which I felt I could give it up at the first touch of a master passion, I know that I am not a prophet in my art, but merely an interpreter, one who can speak well, but who has never felt the descent of the burning tongue, and hence not a sinner against my own soul, if I turn aside from the way I am walking. The question was, then, should I make a choice? Love, as you say, seems at first blush too insecure a joy, if not often too trivial a one, to unsettle a man in his career and change the bent of his whole after life, especially a love born of surprise and fed by the romance of distance and mystery. Had I met her in ordinary intercourse, surrounded by her friends, and without the charm cast over her by unwanted circumstances, and then had felt as I did now, that of all women I had seen, she alone would ever move the deep springs of my being, it would be different. But with this atmosphere of romance, surrounding and hallowing her girl's form, till it seemed almost as ethereal and unearthly as that of an angel's, was I safe in risking fame or fortune in an attempt to acquire what in the possession might prove as bare and commonplace as a sweep of mountain heather stripped of its sunshine? Curbing every erratic beat of my heart, I summoned up her image as it bloomed in my fancy, and surveying it with cruel eyes, asked what was real and what the fruit of my own imagination. The gentle eye, the trembling lip, the girlish form eloquent with the promise of coming womanhood, were these so rare that beside them no other woman should seem to glance or smile or move? And her words, what had she said that any simple-minded, modest yet loving girl might not have uttered under the circumstances? Surely my belief in her being the one the best and the dearest was a delusion and to no delusion was i willing to sacrifice my art but straight upon that conclusion came sweeping down a flood of counter reasons if not the wonder she seemed she was at least a wonder to me if i had seen her under romantic circumstances and unconsciously been influenced by them the influence had remained and nothing would ever rob her form of the halo thus acquired. Whether I ever won her to my fireside or not, she must always remain the fairy figure of my dreams, and being so, the gentle eye and tender lip acquired a value that made them what they seemed, the exponent of love and happiness. And lastly, if love well or illly founded, was an uncertain joy, and the passion for a woman a poor substitute for the natural incentive of talent or ambition, this love had within it the beginning of something deeper than joy, and in the passion thus cheaply characterised dwelt a force and living fire that notwithstanding all I have hitherto achieved has ever been lacking from my dreams of endeavour. As you will see, the most natural question of all did not disturb me in these cogitations, and that was whether in making the sacrifice I proposed I should meet with the reward I had promised myself. The fancies of a young girl of sixteen are not usually of a stable enough character to warrant a man in building upon them his whole future happiness, especially a young girl situated like Miss Preston in the midst of friends who would soon be admirers, and adulators who would soon be her humble slaves. But the doubt which a serious contemplation of this risk must have presented was of so unnerving a character I dared not admit it. If I made the sacrifice, I must meet with my reward. I would listen to no other conclusion. Besides, something in the young girl herself, I cannot tell what, assured me then, as it assures me now, that whatever virtues or graces she might lack, 
that of fidelity to a noble idea was not among them that once convinced of the purity and value of the flame that had been lit in her innocent breast nothing short of the unworthiness of the object that had awakened it would ever serve to eliminate or extinguish it that i was not worthy but would make it the business of my life to become so was certain that she would mark my endeavours and bestow upon me the sympathy they deserved i was equally sure no one would ever make such a sacrifice to her love as i was willing to do and consequently in no one would i find a rival the morning light surprised me in the midst of the struggle nor did i decide the question that day mr preston might not be as determined in his prejudices against musicians as my friends or even his daughter had imagined i resolved to see him taking advantage of his connection with the blank club i procured an introducer in the shape of a highly respected person of his own class and went one evening to the club rooms with the full intention of making his acquaintance if possible he was already there and in conversation with some business associates procuring a seat as near him as possible i anxiously surveyed his countenance it was not a reassuring one and studied in this way had the effect of dampening any hopes i may have cherished in the outset he softened to the sounds of sweet strains or the voice of youthful passion as soon as the granite rock to the surge of the useless billow his very necktie spoke volumes it was an old-fashioned stock full of the traditions of other days while his coat shabbier than any i would presume to wear betrayed in every well-worn seam the pride of the aristocrat and millionaire who in his native city and before the eyes of his fellow magnates does not need to carry the evidences of his respectability upon his back it would be worse than folly for me to approach him on such a subject i mentally ejaculated if he did not stare the musician out of countenance he would the newly risen man and i came very near giving up the whole thing but the genius that watches over the affairs of true love was with me notwithstanding the unpropitious state of my surroundings in a few minutes i received my expected introduction to mr preston and i found that underneath the repelling austerity of his expression was a kindly spark for youth and a decided sympathy for all instances of manly endeavour if only it was in a direction he approved further that my own personality was agreeable to him and that he was disposed to regard me with favour until by some chance and very natural allusion to my profession by the friend standing between us he learned that i was a musician when a decided change came over his countenance and he exclaimed in that blunt decisive way of his that admits of no reply a jingler on the piano eh pretty poor use for a man to put his brains to i say or even his fingers sorry to hear we cannot be friends and without waiting for a reply took my introducer by the arm and drew him a step or so to one side why didn't you say at once he was mandeville the musician i overheard him ask in somewhat querulous tones don't you know i consider the whole race of them an abomination i would have more respect for my bank clerk than i would for the greatest man of them all were it rubenstein himself then in a lower tone but distinctly and almost as if he meant me to hear my daughter has a leaning towards this same folderol and has lately requested my permission to make the acquaintance of some musical characters but i soon convinced her that manhood under the disguise of a harlequin's jacket could have no interest for her that when a human being man or woman has sunk to be a mere rattler of sweet sounds he has reached a stage of infantile development that has little in common with the nervous energy and business force of her dutch ancestry and my daughter stoops to make no acquaintances she cannot bid sit at her father's table 
"'Your daughter is a child yet,' I thought, was ventured by his companion. "'Miss Preston is sixteen, just the age at which my mother gave her hand to my respected father sixty-seven years ago, and with this drop of burning lead let fall into my already agitated bosom, they passed on. He would have more respect for his bank clerk. Would his bank clerk, or what was better, a young man with means at his command, working in a business capacity more in consonance with the tastes he had evinced, have a chance of winning his daughter? I began to think he might. The way grows clearer, I exclaimed. But it was not till after another interview with him, ten minutes later in the lobby, that I finally made up my mind. He was standing quite alone in an obscure corner, fumbling in an awkward way with his muffler that had caught on the button of his coat. Seeing it, I hastened forward to his assistance, and was rewarded by a kind enough nod to embolden me to say, "'I have been introduced to you as a musician. Would my acquaintance be more acceptable to you?' if I told you that the pursuit of art bids fair in my case to yield to the exigencies of business, that I purpose leaving the concert room for the banker's office, and that henceforth my only ambition promises to be that of Wall Street. It most certainly would, exclaimed he, holding out his hand with an unmistakable gesture of satisfaction. You have too good a countenance to waste before a piano top, strumming to the smirks of women and the plaudits of weak-headed men. Let us see you at the desk, my lad. We are in want of trustworthy young men to take the place of us older ones. Then, politely, do you expect to make the change soon? I do, said I, and the Rubicon was passed. End of chapter 5《ハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッシュタグのハッ deciding that with such a friend in business circles as yourself i needed no other introducer to my new life i set apart this evening for a confab with you on the subject meanwhile it is pretty generally known that i make no more engagements to appear through the country i have but one more incident to relate last sunday in walking down fifth avenue i met her I did not do this inadvertently. I knew her custom of attending Bible class and for once put myself in her way. I did not give her time to remonstrate. Do not express your displeasure, said I. This shall never be repeated. I merely wish to say that I have concluded to leave a profession so little appreciated by those whose esteem I most desire to possess. That I am about entering a banker's office where it shall be my ambition to rise if possible to wealth and consequence. If I succeed, you shall then know what my incentive has been. But till I succeed, or at least give such tokens of success as shall ensure respect, silence must be my portion and patience my sole support. Only of one thing rest assured that until I inform you with my own lips that the hope which now illumines me is gone, it will continue to burn on in my breast, shedding light upon a way that can never seem dark while that glow rests upon it. And bowing with the ceremonious politeness our positions demanded, I held out my hand. One clasp to encourage me, I entreated. It seemed as if she did not comprehend. You are going to give up music? And for, for... You? said I. Yes, don't forbid me, I implored. It is too late. Like a lovely image of blushing girlhood, 
turned by a lightning flash into marble she paused pallid and breathless where she was gazing upon me with eyes that burned deeper and deeper as the full comprehension of all that this implied gradually forced itself upon her mind you make a chaos of my little world she murmured at length no said i your world is untouched if it should never be my good fortune to enter it you are not to grieve you are free miss preston free as this sunshiny air we breathe i alone am bound and that because i must be whether i will or no then i saw the woman i had worshipped in this young fair girl shine fully and fairly upon me drawing herself up she looked me in the face and calmly laid her hand in mine i am young said she and do not know what may be right to say to one so generous and so kind but this much i can promise that whether or not i am ever able to duly reward you for what you undertake i will at least make it the study of my life never to prove unworthy of so much trust and devotion and with the last lingering look natural to a parting for years we separated then and there and the crowd came between us and the sunday bells rang on and what was so vividly real to us at the moment became in remembrance more like the mist and shadow of a dream. End of chapter 6。Chapter 7 of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Sylvester. Love is more pleasant than marriage for the same reason that romances are more amusing than history. Chamfor. He draweth out the thread of his verbosity, finer than the staple of his argument. Love's labour lost. Young Mandeville, having finished his story, looked at his uncle. He found him sitting in an attitude of extreme absorption, his right arm stretched before him on the table his face bent thoughtfully downwards and clouded with that deep melancholy that seemed its most natural expression he has not heard me was the young man's first mortifying reflection but catching his uncle's eye which at that moment raised itself he perceived he was mistaken and that he had rather been listened to only too well you must forgive me if i have seemed to rhapsodize the young man stammered you were so quiet i half forgot i had a listener and went on much as i would if i had been thinking aloud his uncle smiled and throwing off the weight of his reflections whatever they might be arose and began pacing the floor i see you are past surgery quoth he any wisdom of mine would be only thrown away young mandeville was hurt he had expected some token of approval on his uncle's part, or at least some betrayal of sympathy. His looks expressed his disappointment. "'You expected to convert me by this story,' continued the elder, pausing with a certain regret before his nephew. "'Nothing could convert me, but—' "'What?' inquired Mandeville, after waiting in vain for the other to finish." something which we will never find in the whirl of new york fashionable life a woman with faith to reward and soul to understand such unqualified trust as yours but i believe miss preston is such a girl and will be such a woman her looks her last words prove it nothing proves it but time and as for your belief i have believed too then as if fearing he had said too much assumed his most business-like tone and observed but we will drop all that you have resolved to quit music and enter wall street your object money and the social consideration which money secures now why wall street 
because I can think of no other means for attaining what I desire in the space of time I would consent to keep a young lady of Miss Preston's position waiting. Ha! Huh. And you have money, I suppose, which you propose to risk on the hazard? Some? Enough to start with. A small amount to you, but sufficient if I am fortunate. And if you are not? The young man opened his arms with an expressive gesture. I am done for, that is all. Bertram, his uncle exclaimed with a change of tone, has it ever struck you that Mr. Preston might have as strong a prejudice against speculation as against the musical profession? No, that is, pardon me, but I have sometimes thought that even in the event of success, I should have to struggle against his inherited instincts of caste and his natural dislike of all things new, even wealth. But I never thought of the possibility of my arousing his distrust by speculating in stocks and engaging in enterprises so nearly in accord with his own business operations. Yet if I guess aright, you would run greater risk of losing the support of his countenance by following the hazardous course you propose than if you continued in the line of art that now engages you. Do you know? I know nothing, but I fear the chances, Bertram. Then I am already defeated and must give up my hopes of happiness. A smile, thin and indefinable, crossed the other's face. No, said he, not necessarily. And sitting down by his nephew's side, he asked if he had any objections to enter a bank. In a good capacity, he exclaimed. No, indeed, it would be an opportunity surpassing my hopes. Do you know of an opening? Well, said he, under the circumstances, I will let you into the secret of my own affairs. I have always had one ambition, and that was to be at the head of a bank. I have not said much about it, but for the last five years I have been working to this end, and today you see me the possessor of at least three-fourths of the stock of the Madison Bank. It has been deteriorating for some time, consequently I was enabled to buy it low, but now that I have got it I intend to build up the concern. I am able to throw business of an important nature in its way, and I dare prophesy that before the year is out you will see it re-established upon a solid and influential footing. I have no doubt of it, sir. You have the knack of success. Anything that you touch is sure to go straight. Unhappily, yes, as far as business operations go, but no matter about that, as if the other had introduced some topic incongruous to the one they were considering. The point is this. In two weeks' time, I shall be elected president of the bank. If you will accept the position of assistant cashier, the best I can offer in consideration of your total ignorance of all details of the business, it is open to you. Uncle, how generous! I... Hush! Your duties will be nominal. The present cashier is fully competent but the leisure thus afforded will offer you abundant opportunity to make yourself acquainted with all matters connected with the banking system, as well as with such capitalists as it would be well for you to know, so that when the occasion comes I can raise you to the cashier's place or make some other disposal of your talents as will best ensure your rapid advance. The young man's eyes sparkled. With a sudden impetuous movement, he jumped to his feet and grasped his uncle's hand. I can never thank you enough. You have made me your debtor for life. Now let anyone ask me who is my father, and I will say he was Edward Sylvester's brother. But come, come, this extreme gratitude is unnecessary. You have always been a favourite with me, Bertram, and now that I have no child, you seem doubly near. It is my pleasure to do what I can for you. But, and here he surveyed him with a wistful look, I wish you were entering into this new line from love of the business rather than love of a woman. 
I fear for you, my boy. It is an awful thing to stake one's future upon a single chance, and that chance a woman's faith. If she should fail you after you had compassed your fortune, should die, well, you could bear that perhaps. But if she turned false and married someone else, or even married you and then... What? came in silvery accents from the door, and a woman richly clad her trailing velvets filling the air at once with an oppressive perfume, entered the room and paused before them in an attitude meant to be arch, but which, from the massiveness of her figure and the scornful carriage of her head, succeeded in being simply imperious. Mr. Sylvester rose abruptly, as if unpleasantly surprised. Ona, he exclaimed, hastening, however, to cover his embarrassment by a courteous acknowledgment of her presence and a careless remark concerning the shortness of the services that had allowed her to return from church so early. "'I did not hear you come in,' he observed. "'No, I judge not,' she returned, with a side glance at Mandeville. "'But the services were not short. On the contrary, I thought I should never hear the last amen.' Mr. Turner's voice is very agreeable, she went on, in a rambling manner all her own. It never interferes with your thoughts. Not that I am considered as having any, she interjected, with another glance at their silent guest. A woman in society with a reputation for taste in all matters connected with fashionable living has no thoughts, of course. Business men with only one idea in their heads, that of making money, have more, no doubt. Do you know, Edward, she went on with sudden inconsequence, which was another trait of this amiable lady's conversation, that I have quite come to a conclusion in regard to the girl Philip Longtree is going to marry. She may be pretty, but she does not know how to dress. I wish you could have seen her tonight. She had on mauve with old gold trimmings. Now, with one of her complexion, but I forget you haven't seen her. Bertram? I think I shall give a German next month. Will you come? Oh, Edward, as if the thought had suddenly struck her. Princess Louise is the sixth child of Queen Victoria. I asked Mr. Turner tonight. By the way, I wonder if it will be pleasant enough to take the horses out tomorrow. Bird has been obliging enough to get sick just in the height of the season, Mr. Mandeville. There are a thousand things I have got to do, and I hate hired horses and with a petulant sigh she laid her prayer book on the table and with a glance in the mirror near by began pulling off her gloves in the slow and graceful fashion eminently in keeping with her every movement it was as if an atmosphere of worldliness had settled down upon this room sanctified a moment before by the utterances of a pure and noble love mr sylvester looked uneasy while Bertram searched in vain for something to say. "'I seem to have brought a blight,' she suddenly murmured, in an easy tone, somewhat at variance with the glance of half-failed suspicion which she darted from under her heavy lids, at first one and then the other of the two gentlemen before her. "'No, I will not sit,' she added, as her husband offered her a chair. "'I am tired almost to death and would retire immediately.' but I interrupted you, I believe, in the utterance of some wise saying about matrimony. It is an interesting subject, and I have a notion to hear what one so well qualified to speak in regard to it. And here she made a slow, half-lazy courtesy to her husband, with a look that might mean anything from coquetry to defiance, has to say to a young man like Mr. Mandeville. Edward Sylvester, who was regarded as an autocrat among men, and who certainly was an acknowledged leader in any company he chose to enter, bowed his head before this anomalous glance with a gesture of something like submission. One is not called upon to repeat every inadvertent phrase he may utter, said he. Bertram was consulting me upon certain topics, and you answered him in your own brilliant style, she concluded. "'What did you say?' she asked, in another moment, 
in a low unmoved tone which the final act of smoothing out her gloves on the table with hands delicate as white rose leaves but firm as marble did not either hasten or retard oh if you insist he returned lightly and are willing to bear the reflection my unfortunate remark seems to cast upon the sex i was merely observing to my nephew that the man who centred all his hopes upon a woman's faith was liable to disappointment even if he succeeded in marrying her there were still possibilities of his repenting any great sacrifice made in her behalf indeed and for once the delicate cheek flushed deeper than its rouge and why do you say this she inquired dropping her coquettish manner and flashing upon them both the haughty and implacable woman bertram had always believed her to be notwithstanding her vagaries and fashion because i have seen much of life outside my own house her husband replied with undiminished courtesy and feel bound to warn any young man of his probable fate who thinks to find nothing but roses and felicity beyond the gates of fashionable marriage ah then it was on general principles you were speaking she remarked with a soft laugh that undulated through an atmosphere suddenly grown too heavy for easy breathing i did not know wives are so little apt to be appreciated in this world mr mandeville i was afraid he might be giving you some homely advice founded upon personal experience and she moved towards their guest with that strange smile of hers which some called dangerous but which he had always regarded as oppressive she saw him drop his eyes and smiled again but in a different way this woman whom no one accused of anything worse than levity hailed every tribute to her power as a miser greets the glint of gold with a turn of her large but elegant figure that in its slow swaying reminded you of some heavy tropical flower hanging inert intoxicated with its own fragrance she dismissed at once the topic that had engaged them and launched into one of her choicest streams of inconsequent talk but mandeville was in no mood to listen to trivialities and being of a somewhat impatient nature presently rose and excusing himself took a hurried leave not so hurried however that he did not have time to murmur to his uncle as they walked towards the door you would make comparison between the girl i worship and other women in fashionable life do not i pray she is no more like them than a star that shines is like a rose that blooms my fate will not be like that of most men that we know but better and higher and his uncle standing there in the grand hallway with the fresh splendours of unlimited wealth gleaming upon him from every side looked after the young man with a sigh and repeated better and higher god in his merciful goodness grant it end of chapter seven chapter eight of the sword of damocles by anna catherine green this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shadows of the Past Memory, the Warder of the Brain Macbeth It was long past midnight. The fire in the grate burned dimly, shedding its lingering glow on the face of the master of the house, as with bowed head and folded hands he sat alone and brooding before its dying embers it was a lonesome sight the very magnificence of the spacious apartment with its lofty walls and glittering works of art seemed to give an air of remoteness to that solitary form bending beneath the weight of its reflections from the exquisitely decorated ceiling to the turkish rugs scattered over the polished floor all was elegant and luxurious and what had splendours like these to do with thoughts that bent the brows and overshadowed the lips of man the very lights burned deprecatingly 
illuminating beauties upon which no eye gazed and for which no heart beat. The master himself seemed to feel this, for he presently rose and put them out, after which he seated himself as before, only, if possible, with more abandon, as if with the extinguishing of the light some eye had been shut whose gaze he had hitherto feared. And in truth my lady's image shone fainter from its heavy panel, and the smile which had met with unrelenting sweetness the glare of the surrounding splendour softened in the mellow glimmer of the firelight to an ethereal halo that left you at rest. One, two, three, the small clock sounded from the mantel, and yet no stir took place in the sombre figure keeping watch beneath. What were the thoughts which could thus detain from his comfortable bed a man already tired with manifold cares? It would be hard to tell. The waters that gush at the touch of the diviner's rod are tumultuous in their flow and rush hither and thither with little heed to the restraining force of rule and reason, but of the pictures that rose before his eyes in those dying embers, there were two which stood out in startling distinctness. Let us see if we can convey the impression of them to other eyes and hearts. First, the form of his mother. Ah, grey-bearded men, weighted with the cares of life, and absorbed in the monotonous round of duties that to you are the be-all and end-all of existence, to whom mourning means a jostling ride to the bank, the store, or the office, and with whom night is but the name for a worse unrest because of its unfulfilled promises of slumber. What soul amongst you all is so callous to the holy memories of childhood as not to thrill with something of the old-time feeling of love and longing as the memory of that tender face with its watchful eye and ready smiles comes back to you from the midst of weary years your mother but edward sylvester with that black line across his life cutting past from present what makes him think of his mother to-night and the cottage door upon the hillside where she used to stand with eager eyes, looking up and down the road as he came trudging home from school, swinging his satchel and shouting at every squirrel that started across the road or peeped from the branches of the grand old maples overhead, and the garret chamber under the roof, the scene of many a romp with Elsie and Sunsea and Jack, neighbours' children to whom the man of today would be an awe and a mystery and the little room where he slept with Tom, his own blue-eyed brother, so soon to die of a wasting disease, but full of warm blood then, and all alive with boyish pranks. He could almost hear the wild, clear laugh with which the mischievous fellow started upon its travels, the rooster whose legs he had tied a short space apart with one of Sunsey's faded ribbons, a laugh that became unrestrained when the poor creature, in attempting to run down hill, rolled over and over, cutting such a figure before his late admirers, the hens, that even Elsie smiled in the midst of her gentle entreaties. And Jocko the crow, whom Taming had made one of the boys, poor Jocko, is it nearly thirty years since you used to stalk in majesty through the village streets, with your neat raven coat closely buttoned across your breast and your genteel caw, caw, and condescending nod for old acquaintances. The day seems but as yesterday when you marred the stolen picnic up in the woods by flying off with a flock of your fellow black coats, nor is it easy to realise that the circle of tow-headed fellows who hailed with shouts your ignominious return after a day or so's experience of the vaunted pleasures of freedom, are now sharp-featured men without a smile for youth or a thought beyond the hard, cold dollar buried deep in their pockets. And the church up over the hills, and the long Sunday walk at mother's side, with the sunshine glowing on the dusty road 
and beating on the river flowing far beyond. The same road, the same river of Monday and Tuesday, but how different it looked to the boy, almost like another scene, as if Sunday clothes were on the world as well as upon his restless little limbs. How he longed for it to be Monday, though he did not say so, and what a different day Saturday would have been, if only there was no long, sleepy Sunday to follow it. But the mother, she did not dread that day. Her eyes used to brighten when the bell began to ring from the old church steeple. Her eyes, how they mingled with every picture. They seemed to fill the night. What a sparkle they had. Yet how they used to soften at his few hurried caresses. He was always too busy for kisses. There were the snares in the north woods to be looked after, the nest in the apple trees to be inquired into, the skates to be ground before the river froze over, the nuts to be gathered and stored in that same old garret chamber under the eaves. But now how vividly her least look comes back to the tired man, from the glance of wistful sympathy with which she met his childish disappointments, to the flash of joy that hailed his equally childish delights. And another scene there is in the embers tonight, a remembrance of later days, when the mother with her love and yearning was laid low in the grave, and manhood had learned its first lessons of passion and ambition from the glance of younger eyes and the smile of riper lips. Not the picture of a woman, however, that was already present beside him, shining from its panel with an insistence that not even the putting out of the lights could quite quench or subdue, but of a child, young, pure and beautiful, sitting by the river in the glow of a June sunshine, gazing at the hills of his boyhood's home with a look on her face such as he had never before seen on that of child or woman. A simple picture, with a simple villager's daughter for its centre. But as he mused upon it tonight, the success and triumph of the last ten years faded from his sight like the ashes that fell at his feet, and he found himself questioning in vain as to what better thing he had met in all the walks of his busy life than that young child's innocence and faith as they shone upon him that day from her soft uplifted eyes. He had been sitting the whole warm noontide at the side of her whose half gracious, half scornful, wholly indolent acceptance of his homage he called love, and enervated by an atmosphere he was as yet too inexperienced to recognise as of the world, worldly, had strolled forth to cool his fevered brow in the fresh autumn breeze that blew up from the river. He was a gay-hearted youth in those days, heedless of everything but the passing moment. Nature meant little to him, and when in the course of his ramble he came upon the form of a child sitting on the edge of the river, he remembers wondering what she saw in a sweep of empty water to interest her so deeply. Indeed, he was about to inquire, when she turned and he caught a glimpse of her eyes, and knew at once without asking. Yet in those days he was anything but quick to recognise the presence of feeling. A face was beautiful or plain to him, not eloquent or expressive. But this child's countenance was exceptional. It made you forget the cotton frock she wore. It made you forget yourself. As he gazed on it, he felt the stir of something in his breast he had never known before, and half dreaded to hear her speak, lest the charm should fail or the influence be lost. Yet how could he pass on and not speak? Laying his hand on her head, he asked her what she was thinking of as she sat there all alone looking off on the river, and the wee thing drew in her breath, and surveyed him with all her soul in her great black eyes, before she replied, I do not know, I never know. Then, looking back, she dreamily added, 
It makes me want to go away, miles away. And she held out her tiny arms towards the river with a longing gesture. And it makes me want to cry. And he understood, or thought he did, and for the first time in his life looked upon the river that had met his gaze from childhood, with eyes that saw its exceeding beauty. Ah, it was an exquisite scene, a rare scene, mountain melting into mountain, and meadow vanishing into meadow, till the flow of silver waters was lost in a horizon of Asia mist. No wonder that a child without snares to set or nuts to gather should pause a moment to gaze upon it, as even he in the days gone by would sometimes stop on Sabbath eves to snatch a kiss from his mother's lips. It is like a fairyland, is it not? quoth the child, looking up into his face with a wistful glance. Do you know what it is that makes me feel so? He smiled and sat down by her side. Somehow he felt as if a talk with this innocent one would restore him more than a walk on the hills. It is the spirit of beauty, my child. You are moved by the loveliness of the scene. Is it a new one to you? No, oh no, but I always feel the same. As if something here was hungry, don't you know? And she laid her little hand on her breast. He did not know, but he smiled upon her notwithstanding, and made her talk and talk till the gush of the sweet child spirit, with its hidden longings and but half-understood aspirations, bathed his whole being in a reviving shower, and he felt as if he had wandered into a new world, where the languors of the tropics were unknown, and passion, if there was such, had the wings of an eagle, instead of the siren's voice and fascination. Her name was Paula, she said, and before leaving, he found that she was a relative of the woman he loved. This was a slight shock to him. The lily and the cactus a bloom on one stalk. How could that be? And for a moment, he felt as if the splendours of the glorious woman paled before the lustre of the innocent child. But the feeling, if it was strong enough to be called such, soon passed. As the days swept by, bringing evenings with light and music and whispered words beneath the vine leaves, the remembrance of the pure sweet hour beside the river gradually faded till only a vague memory of that gentle uplifted face, sweet with its childish dimples, remained to hallow now and then a passing reverie or a fevered dream. But tonight its every lineament filled his soul, vying with the memories of his mother in its vividness and power. Oh, why had he not learned the lesson it taught? Why had he turned his back upon the high things of life, to yield himself to a current that swept him on and on, until the power of resistance left him, and, oh, dwell not here, wild thoughts, pause not on the threshold of the one dark memory that blasts the soul and sears the heart in the secret hours of night. Let the dead past bury its dead, and if one must think, let it be of the hope which the remembrance of that short glimpse into a pure if infantile soul has given to his long darkened spirit. One, two, three, four, and the fire is dead, and the night has grown chill, but he heeds it not. He has asked himself, if his life's book is quite closed to the higher joys of existence, whether money getting and money holding is to absorb him body and soul for ever, and with the question a great yearning seizes him to look upon that sweet child again, if haply in the gleam of her pure spirit something of the noble and the pure that lay beneath the crust of life might be again revealed to his longing sight. She must be a great girl now, murmured he to himself, 
as old as if not older than she whom bertram adores so passionately but she will always be a child to me a sweet pure child whose innocence is my teacher and whose ignorance is my better wisdom if anything will save me but here the shadow settled again when it lifted the morning ray lay cool and ghostly over the hearthstone end of chapter eight chapter nine of the sword of damocles by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain paula the stars of midnight shall be dear to her and she shall lean her ear in many a secret place where rivulets dance their wayward round and beauty born of murmuring sound shall pass into her face wordsworth a wintry scene snow-piled hills stretching beyond a frozen river on the bank a solitary figure tall dark and commanding standing with eyes bent sadly on a long narrow mound at his feet it is edward sylvester and the mound is the grave of his mother it is ten years since he stood upon that spot in all that time no memories of his childhood's home no recollection of that lonely grave among the pines had been sufficient to allure him from the city and its busy round of daily cares indeed he had always shrunk at the very name of the place and never of his own will alluded to it but the reveries of a night had awakened a longing that was not to be appeased and in the face of his wife's cold look of astonishment and a secret dread in his own heart had left his comfortable fireside for the scenes of his early life and marriage and was now standing in the bleak december air gazing down upon the stone that marked his mother's grave but tender as were the chords that reverberated at this sight it was not to revisit this tomb he had returned to grotewell no that other vision the vision of young sweet appreciative life has drawn him more strongly than the memory of the dead it was to search out and gaze again upon the innocent girl whose eloquent eyes and lofty spirit had so deeply moved him in the past that he had braved the chill of the connecticut hills and incurred the displeasure of his wife yet when he turned away from that simple headstone and set his face towards the village streets it was with a sinking of the heart that first revealed to him the severity of the ordeal to which he had thus wantonly subjected himself not that the wintry trees and snow-covered roofs appealed to him as strongly as the same trees and homes would have done in their summer aspect the land was bright with verdure when that shadow fell whose gloom resting upon all the landscape made a walk down this quiet road even at this remote day a matter of such pain to him but scenes that have caught the reflection of a life's joy or a heart's sorrow lose not their power of appeal with the leaves they shake from their trees and nothing that had met the eyes of this man from the hour he left this spot no not the glance of his wife as his child fell back dead in his arms had shot such a pang to his soul as the sight of that long street with its array of quiet homes stretching out before him into the dim grey distance but for all that he was determined to traverse it ay to the very end though his steps must pass the house whose ghostly portals were fraught with memories dismal as death to him on then he proceeded walking with his usual steady pace that only faltered or broke as he met the shy eyes of some hurrying village maiden speeding upon some errand down the snowy street or encountered some old friend of his youth who despite his altered mien and commanding carriage recognized in him the slim young bank cashier who had left them now ten long years ago to make a name and fortune in the great city 
It was noon by the time he gained the heart of the village, and school was out, and the children came rushing by with just the same shout and scamper with which he used to hail that hour of joyous release, how it carried him back to the days when those four red walls towered upon him with awful significance, as with books on his back and a half-eaten apple in his pocket he crept up the walk, conscious that the bell had rung its last shrill note a good half-hour before. He felt half-tempted to stop and make his way through the crowd of shouting boys and dancing girls to that same old door again, and see for himself if the huge late which in a fit of childish revenge he had cut on its awkward panels, was still there to meet the eyes of tardy boys and loitering girls. But the wondering looks of the children, unused to behold a figure so stately in their simple streets, deterred him, and he passed thoughtfully on. So engrossed was he by the reminiscences of Tom and Elsie, which the schoolhouse had awakened, that he passed the ominous mansion which had been his dread, and the bank where he had worked, and the arbour by the side of the road, where he had sat out the first hours of his fatal courtship, almost without realising their presence, and was at the end of the street, and in full view of the humble cottage which the little Paula had pointed out as her home on that day of their first acquaintance. Good heaven! and I do not even know if she is alive, he suddenly ejaculated, stopping where he was and eyeing the lowly walls before him with a quick realisation of the possibilities of a great disappointment. Ten years have strown many a grave on the hillside, and Ona would not mention it if she lost every relative she had in this town. What a fool I have been, thought he but with the stern resolution which had carried him through many a difficulty, he prepared to advance, when he was again arrested by seeing the door of the house he was contemplating suddenly open, and a girlish figure issue forth. Could it be Paula? With eager, almost feverish interest, he watched her approach. She was a slight young thing, and came towards him with a rapid movement, almost jaunty in its freedom. If it were Paula, he would know her by her eyes, but for some reason he hoped it was not she, not the child of his dreams. At a yard or two in front of him she paused, astonished. This grave, tall figure, with the melancholy brow, deep eyes, and firmly compressed lips, was an unaccustomed sight in this primitive town. Scarcely realising what she did, she gave a little curtsy, and was proceeding on when he stopped her with a hurried gesture. "'Is Mrs. Fairchild still living?' he asked, indicating the house she had just left. "'Mrs. Fairchild? Oh, no,' she returned, surveying him out of the corner of a very roguish pair of brown eyes, with a certain sly wonder at the suspense in his voice. "'She has been dead as long as I can remember. Old Miss Abby and her sister live there now. And who are they?' he hurriedly asked. He could not bring himself to mention Paula's name. Why, Miss Abby and Miss Belinda, she returned with a puzzled air. Miss Abby sews, and Miss Belinda teaches the school. I don't know anything more about them, sir. The courteous gentleman bowed. And they live there quite alone? Oh, no, sir, Paula lives with them. Ah, she does and the young girl looking at him could not detect the slightest change in his haughty countenance. Paula is Mrs. Fairchild's daughter? Yes, sir. Thank you, said he, and allowed the pretty brown-eyed miss to pass on, which she did with lingering footsteps and many a backward glance of the eye. Halting at the door of that small cottage, Edward Sylvester reasoned with himself. She may be just such another fresh-looking, round-faced, mischievous-eyed schoolgirl. Spiritual children do not always make earnest-souled women. Let me beware what hopes I build on a foundation so unsubstantial. Yet when, in a moment later, the door opened, and a weazen-faced, dapper little woman appeared, all smiles and welcome, 
he owned to a sensation of dismay that sufficiently convinced him what a hold this hope of meeting with something exceptionally sweet and high had taken upon his hitherto careless and worldly spirit mr sylvester i am sure i thought ona would remember us after a while come in sir do my sister will be home in a few moments and with a deprecatory flutter comical enough in a woman at least seventy odd years old she led her distinguished guest into a large unused room where in spite of his remonstrances she at once proceeded to build a fire it is a pleasure sir she said to every utterance of regret on his part at the trouble he was causing and though her vocabulary was thus made to appear somewhat small her sincerity was undoubted we have counted the days belinda and i since we sent the last letter it may seem foolish to you sir but paula is growing so fast and belinda says is so uncommon smart for her age that we did think that it was time owner knew just what a strait we were in do you want to see paula very much he returned shocked and embarrassed at the position in which he found himself put by the reticence of his wife on the subject of her relations they think i have come in reply to a letter he mused and i did not even know my wife had received one you will be surprised she exclaimed with a complacent nod as the fire blazed up brightly every one is surprised who sees her for the first time is my niece well and thus it was he learned the relation between his wife of ten years and these simple inhabitants of the little cottage in grotewell he replied as in duty bound and presently by the use of a few dexterous questions succeeded in eliciting from this simple-minded old lady the few facts necessary to a proper understanding of the situation miss abby and miss belinda were two maiden ladies sisters of mrs fairchild and owner's mother who on the death of the former took up their abode in the little cottage for the purpose of bringing up the orphan paula they had succeeded in this by dint of the utmost industry but paula was not a common child and belinda who was evidently the autocrat of the house had decided that she ought to have other advantages she had therefore written to mrs sylvester concerning the child in the hopes that that lady would take enough interest in her pretty little cousin to send her to boarding school but they had received no reply till now all of which was perfectly right of course mrs sylvester being undoubtedly occupied and mr sylvester himself being better than any letter and does paula herself know what efforts you have been making in her behalf asked mr sylvester upon the receipt of this information the little lady shook her head with vivacity belinda advised me to say nothing she remarked the child is contented with her home and we did not like to raise her expectations you will never regret anything you may do for her she went on in a hurried way with a peep now and then towards the door as if while enjoying a momentary freedom of speech she feared an intrusion that would cut that pleasure short paula is a grateful child and never has given us a moment of concern from the time she began to put pieces of patchwork together but there is belinda she suddenly exclaimed rising with the little dip and jerk of her left shoulder that was habitual to her whenever she was amused or excited belinda she cried going to the door and speaking with great impressiveness mr sylvester is in the parlour and almost instantly a tall middle-aged lady entered whose plain but powerful countenance and dignified demeanour stamped her at once as belonging to a very different type of woman from her sister i am very glad to see you sir she exclaimed in a slow determined voice as dissimilar as possible from the piping tones of miss abby is not mrs sylvester with you no returned he i have come alone my wife is not fond of travelling in winter the slightest gleam shot from her bright keen eye 
Is she not well? Yes, quite well, but not over strong, he rejoined quietly. She gave him another quick look, settled some matter with herself, and taking off her bonnet, sat down by the fire. At once her sister ceased in her hovering about the room, and sitting also, became to all appearance her silent shadow. Paula has gone upstairs to take off her bonnet, the younger woman said, in a straightforward manner, just short of being brusque. She is a very remarkable girl, Mr. Sylvester, a genius, I suppose some would call her, a child of nature, I prefer to say. Whatever there is to be learned in this town, she has learned. And in a place where nature speaks and good books abound, that is not inconsiderable. I have taken pride in her talents, I acknowledge, and have endeavoured to do what I could to cultivate them to the best advantage. There is no girl in my school who can write so original a composition, nor is there one with a truer heart or more tractable disposition. You have, then, been her teacher as well as her friend. She owes you a double debt of gratitude. A look hard to understand flashed over her homely face. I have never thought of debt or gratitude in connection with Paula. The only effort which I have ever made in her behalf which cost me anything is this one which threatens me with her loss. Then, as if fearing she had said too much, set her firm lips still firmer, and ignoring the subject of the child, astonished him by certain questions on the leading issues of the day that at once betrayed a truly virile mind. She is a study, thought he to himself, but meeting her on the ground she had taken, replied at once, and to her evident satisfaction, in the direct and simple manner that appeals the most forcibly to a strong, if somewhat unpolished, understanding, while the meek little Miss Abby glanced from one to the other with a humble awe more indicative of her appreciation for their superiority than of her comprehension of the subject. But what with Miss Belinda's secret anxiety and Mr. Sylvester's unconscious listening for a step upon the stair, the conversation, brisk as it had opened, gradually languished, and ere long, with a sort of clairvoyant understanding of her sister's wishes, Miss Abby arose, and with her customary jerk, left the room for Paula. The child is not timid, but has an unaccountable aversion to entering the presence of strangers alone, Miss Belinda explained. But Mr. Sylvester did not hear her, for at that moment the door reopened, and Miss Abby stepped in with the young girl thus heralded. Edward Sylvester never forgot that moment, and indeed few men could have beheld the picture of extraordinary loveliness thus revealed, without a shock of surprise equal to the delight it inspired. She was not pretty, the very word was a misnomer. She was simply one of nature's most exquisite and undeniable beauties. From the crown of her ebon locks to the sole of her dainty foot, she was perfect as the most delicate colouring and the utmost harmony of contour could make her, and not in the conventional type either. There was an individuality in her style that was as fresh as it was uncommon. She was at once unique and faultless, something that can be said of few women, however beautiful or alluring. Mr. Sylvester had not expected this, as indeed how could he? And for a moment he could only gaze with a certain swelling of the heart at the blooming loveliness that in one instant had transformed the odd little parlour into a bower fit for the habitation of princes. But soon his natural self-possession returned, and rising with his most courteous bow, he greeted the blushing girl with words of simple welcome. Instantly her eyes, which had been hitherto kept bent upon the floor, flashed upward to his face, and a smile full of the wonder of an unlooked-for, almost unhoped-for delight, swept radiantly over her lips, and he saw with deep and sudden satisfaction that the hour which had made such an impression upon him 
had not been forgotten by her, that his voice had recalled what his face failed to do, and that he was recognised. "'It is Mr. Sylvester, your cousin Ona's husband,' Miss Belinda interposed in a matter-of-fact way, evidently attributing the emotion of the child to her astonishment at the imposing appearance of their guest. "'And it was you who married Ona,' she involuntarily murmured, blushing the next moment at this simple utterance of her thoughts. "'Yes, dear child,' Mr. Sylvester hastened to say. "'And so you remember me?' he presently added, smiling down upon her with a sense of new life, that for the moment made every care and anxiety shrink into the background. Yes, she simply returned, taking the chair beside him with the unconscious grace of perfect self-forgetfulness. It was the first time I had found any one to listen to my childish enthusiasms. It is natural such kindness should make its impression. Little Paula and I met long ago, quoth Mr. Sylvester, turning to the somewhat astonished Miss Belinda. It was before my marriage, and she was then... Just ten years old, finished Paula, seeing him cast her an inquiring glance. Very young for such a thoughtful little miss, he exclaimed. And have those childish enthusiasms quite departed, he continued, smiling upon her with gentle encouragement. Do you no longer find a fairyland in the view up the river? She flushed, casting a timid glance at her aunt, but meeting his eyes again, seemed to forget everything and everybody in the inspiration which his presence afforded. I fear I must acknowledge that it is more a fairyland to me than ever, she softly replied. Knowledge does not always bring disillusion, and though I have learned one by one the names of the towns scattered along those misty banks, and though I know they are no less prosaic in their character than our own humdrum village, yet I cannot rid myself of the notion that those verdant slopes with their archway of clouds hide the portals of paradise, and that I have only to follow the birds in their flight up the river to find myself on the verge of a mystery the banks at my feet can never disclose. May the gates of God's paradise never recede as those would do, my child, if, like the birds, you attempted to pierce them. Paula is a dreamer, quoth Miss Belinda in a matter-of-fact tone, but she is a good girl notwithstanding, and can solve a geometrical problem with the best. And so on the machine, and make a very good pie, timidly put in Miss Abby. That is well, laughed Mr. Sylvester, observing that the poor child's head had fallen forward in maidenly shame at her aunt's elogiums, as well as at the length of the speech into which she had been betrayed. It shows that her eyes can see what is at hand, as well as what is beyond our reach. Then, with a touch of his usual formal manner, intended to restore her to herself, "'Do you like study, Paula?' In an instant her eyes flashed. I more than like it. It feeds me. Knowledge has its vistas too, she added with an arch look, the first he had seen on her hitherto serious countenance. I can never outgrow my recognition of the portals it discloses or the fairyland it opens up to every inquiring eye. Even geometry, he ventured, more anxious to probe this fresh young mind than he had ever been to sound the opinions of the most notable men of the day. Even geometry, she smiled. To be sure, its portals are somewhat methodical in shape, allowing no scope to the fancy, but from its triangles and circles have been born the grandeurs of architecture, and upright on the threshold of its exact laws and undeviating calculations, I see an angel with a golden rod in his hand, measuring the heavens. Even a stone speaks to a poet, said Mr. Sylvester, with a glance at Miss Belinda. But Paula is no poet, returned that lady, with strict and impartial honesty. She has never put a line on paper to my knowledge. Have you, child? No, aunt, 
I would as soon imprison a falling sunbeam or try to catch the breeze that lifts my hair or kisses my cheek. You see, continued Mr. Sylvester, still looking at Miss Belinda. She answered with a doubtful shake of the head and an earnest glance at the girl, as if she perceived something in that bright young soul that even she had never observed before. Have you ever been away from home? he now asked. Never. I know as little of the great world as a callow nestling. No, I should not say that, for the young bird has no Aunt Belinda to tell of the great cathedrals and the wonderful music she has heard and the glorious pictures she has seen in her visits to the city. It is almost as good as travelling oneself to hear Aunt Belinda talk. It was now the turn of the mature plain woman to blush, which she did under Mr. Sylvester's searching eye. You have then been in the habit of visiting New York? I have been there twice, she returned evasively. Since my marriage? Yes, sir, with a firm closing of her lips. I did not know you were there, or I should have insisted upon your remaining at my house. Thank you, said she, with a quick triumphant glance at her demure little shadow, who looked back in amaze and was about to speak when Miss Belinda proceeded. My visits usually have been on business. I should not think of troubling Mrs. Sylvester. And then he knew that his wife had been aware of those visits if he had not. But he refrained from testifying to his discovery. You speak of music, said he, turning gently back to Paula. Have you a taste for it? Would it make you happy to hear such music as your aunt tells about? Oh, yes, I can conceive nothing grander than to sit in a church whose every line is beauty and listen while the great organ utters its song of triumph or echoes in the wonderful way it does the emotions you have tried to express and could not. I would give a whole week of my life on the hills, dear as it is, for one such hour, I think. Mr. Sylvester smiled. It is a rare kind of coin to offer for such a simple pleasure, but it may meet with its acceptance nevertheless. And in his look and in his voice there was an appearance of affectionate interest that completed the subjugation of the watchful Miss Belinda, who now became doubly assured that whatever neglect had been shown her by her niece was not due to that niece's husband. Mr. Sylvester recognised the effect he had produced and hastened to complete it, feeling that the good opinion of Miss Belinda would be valuable to any man. I have been a boy on these hills, said he, and know what it is to long for what is beyond while enjoying what is present. You shall hear the organ, my child. And stopped wondering to himself over the new sweet interest he seemed to take in the prospect of pleasures which he had supposed himself to have long ago exhausted. Hear the organ? I? Why, that means... Oh, what does it mean? she inquired, turning with a look of beaming hope towards her aunt. You must ask Mr. Sylvester, that uncompromising lady replied, with a straightforward look at the fire, and he, with a smile, told the blushing girl that according to his reading, mortals went blindfold into fairyland, and she understood what he meant, and was silent, whereupon he turned the conversation upon more commonplace subjects. For how could he tell her then of the intention that had awakened in his breast at the first glimpse of her grand young beauty? to make her his child, to bequeath to her the place of the babe that had perished in his arms three long years before. That meant to give Ona a care if not a rival in his affections, and Ona shrank from care and was not a subject for rivalry, and the if which this implied weighed heavily on his heart as moment after moment flew by and he felt again the reviving power of an unsullied mind and an aspiring nature. End of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Barred Door. A Schoolboy's Tale, The Wonder of an Hour. Byron. Did you know that your niece was gifted with rare beauty as well as talents? asked Mr. Sylvester of Miss Belinda, as a couple of hours or so later they sat alone by the parlour fire, preparatory to his departure. No, that is, she hastily corrected herself, I knew she was very pretty, of course, prettier by far than any of her mates, but I did not suppose she was what you would call a beauty, or at least would be so considered by a person accustomed to New York society. I do not know of a woman in New York who can boast of any such claims to transcendent loveliness. Such faces are rare outside of art, Miss Belinda. Was Mrs. Fairchild a handsome woman? She was my sister, and if I may say so, my favourite sister, but she was no more agreeable to the eye than some others of her family, grimly returned the heavy-browed spinster with a compression of her lips. What beauty Paula has inherited came from her father. Her chief charm in my eyes, however, springs from her pure nature and the unselfish impulses of her heart. And in mine, rejoined he quietly. Then, with a sudden change of tone, as he realised the necessity of saying something definite to this woman in regard to his intentions toward the child, he remarked, her great and unusual talents and manifest disposition to learn demand, as you say, superior advantages to any she can have in a small country town like this, fruitful as it has already been to her under your wise and fostering care, and such shall she have. But just when and how I cannot say till I have seen my wife and learned what her wishes are likely to be in regard to the subject. You are very kind, sir, returned Miss Belinda. I have no doubt as to the good will of your intentions, and the child shall be prepared at once for a change. And will the child, he exclaimed with a smile as Paula re-entered the room, be so kind as to give me her company in the walk I must now take to the cars? Of course, replied her aunt, before the young girl could speak. We owe you that much attention, I am sure. And so it was that when he came to retrace his way through the village with its heavy memories, he had a guardian spirit at his side that robbed them of their power to sadden and oppress. What shall I say for you to the grim city streets when I get back? inquired he, as they hastened on over the snow-covered road. Say to them from me, oh, you may give them my greeting she responded half shyly, half confidingly. Evidently, for her, he was one of those rare persons whose presence is perfect freedom, and with whom she could not only think her best, but speak it also. I should like to make their acquaintance, but indeed they would have to do well to vie in attraction with these white roads, girded by their silver-limbed trees. The very rush of life must seem oppressive. So many hopes, so many fears, so many interests jostling you at every step. Yet the thought is exhilarating too. Don't you find it so? It was the first question she had asked him, and he knew not how to reply. Her eyes were so confiding, he could not bear to shake her faith in his imagined superiority. Yet what thoughts had he ever cherished in walking the busy streets, save those connected with his own selfish hopes and fears, plans and operations? I have no doubt, said he, after a moment's pause, that I have felt this exhilaration of which you speak. Certainly the hurrying masses in Broadway awaken a far different sensation in a man than this solitary stretch of country road. Yet the road has its companionships, she murmured. In the city one thinks most of men, but in the country, of God, its very solitude compels you. Compels you, 
he involuntarily answered, and shuddered as he said it, remembering days when he trod these very roads with anything but reverence in his heart for the creator of the landscape before him. Not everyone has the inner vision, my child, to see the love and wisdom back of the works, or rather most men have a vision so short it does not reach so far. Yet I think I can understand what you mean, and might even experience your emotions if my eyes had leisure to explore this space and my thoughts to rise out of their usual depressing atmosphere of care and anxiety. You did not think I was a busy man, he continued, observing her gaze of wonder. You thought riches brought ease. If you ever come to think most of men, you will learn that the wealthy man is the greatest worker, for his rest comes not night or day. She shook her head with a sudden doubt. It is a problem, she said, which my knowledge of geometry does not help me to solve. No, assented he, and one in which even your fanciful soul would fail to find any poetry. But stop, Paula, isn't this the place where I found you that day, and you showed me the view up the river? Yes, and it was on that stone I sat. It has a milk-white cushion now, and there is where you stood, looking so tall and grand to my childish eyes. The gates are of pearl now, she said, pointing to the snow-covered slopes in the west. I wish the sky had been clear to-night, and you could have seen the effect of a rosy sunset falling over those domes of ice and snow. It would leave me less to expect when I come again, he responded almost gaily. The next time we will have the sunset, Paula. She smiled and they hastened on, presently finding themselves in the village streets. Suddenly she paused. Small towns have their mysteries, as well as great cities, said she. We are not without ours. Look. He turned, followed with a glance the direction of her pointing finger, and started in his sudden surprise. She had indicated to him the house whose ghostly and frowning front bore written across its grim grey boards such an inscription of painful remembrance. It is a solitary looking place, isn't it? she went on, innocent of the pain she was inflicting. No one lives there, or ever will, I imagine. Do you see that board nailed across the front door? He forced himself to look. He did more. He fixed his eyes upon the desolate structure before him, until the aspect of its huge unpainted walls, with their long rows of sealed-up windows and high smokeless chimneys, was impressed indelibly upon his mind. The large front door, with its weird and solemn barrier, was the last thing upon which his eye rested. Yes, said he, and involuntarily asked what it meant. We do not know exactly, she responded. It was nailed across there by the men who followed Colonel Jaffer to the grave. Colonel Jaffer was the owner of the house, she proceeded, too interested to observe the shadow which the utterance of that name had invoked upon his brow. He was a peculiar man, I judge, and had suffered great wrongs, they say. At all events, his life was very solitary and sad, and on his deathbed he made his neighbours promise him that they would carry out his body through that door and then seal it up against any further ingress or egress forever. His wishes were respected, and from that day to this no one has ever entered that door. But the house, stammered Mr. Sylvester in anything but his usual tone, Surely it has not been deserted all these years. Ah, said she, now we come to the greatest mystery of all. And laying her hand timidly on his arm, she drew his attention to the form of a decrepit old lady, just then advancing towards them down the street. Do you see that aged figure, she asked? Every evening at this hour, winter and summer, stormy weather or clear, she is seen to leave her home up the street and come down to this forsaken dwelling, open the worm-eaten gate before you, 
cross the otherwise untrodden garden and enter the house by a side door which she opens with a huge key she carries in her pocket for just one hour by the clock she remains there and then she is seen to issue in the falling dusk with a countenance whose heavy dejection is in striking contrast to the expression of hope with which she invariably enters why she makes this pilgrimage and for what purpose she secludes herself for a stated time each day in this otherwise deserted mansion no man knows nor is it possible to determine for though she is a worthy woman and approachable enough on all other topics on this she is absolutely mute mr sylvester started and surveyed the woman as she passed with an anxious gaze i know her he muttered she was a connection of of the family who inhabited this house he could not speak the name yes so they say and the owner of this house though she does not live here did you notice how she looked at me she often does that just as if she wanted to speak but she always goes by and opens the gate as you see her now and takes out the big key and come away cried mr sylvester with sudden impulse seizing paula by the hand and hurrying her down the street she is a walking goblin you must have nothing to do with such uncanny folk and endeavouring to turn off this irresistible display of feeling by a show of pleasantry he laughed aloud but in a strained and unnatural way that made her eyes lift in unconscious amazement you are infected by the atmosphere of unreality that pervades the spot said she i do not wonder and with the gentle perversity that sometimes affects the most thoughtful amongst us she went on talking upon the unwelcome subject i know of some folks who invariably cross to the other side of the street at night rather than go through the shadows of the two gaunt poplars which guard that house yet there has been no murder committed there or any great crime that i know of unless the disobedience of a daughter who ran away with a man her father detested could be denominated by so fearful a word the set gaze with which mr sylvester surveyed the landscape before him quavered a trifle and then grew hard and cold and so said he in a tone meant more for himself than her even your innocent ears have been assailed by the gossip about miss jaffer gossip i have never thought of it as gossip returned she struck for the first time by the change in his appearance it all happened so long ago it seems more like some quaint and ancient tale than a story of one of our neighbours besides the fact that a wilful girl ran away from the house of her father with the man of her choice is not such a dreadful one is it though she never returned to its walls with her husband and her father was so overwhelmed by the shock he was never seen to smile again no said he giving her a hurried glance of relief i only wondered at the tenacity of old stories to engage the popular ear i had supposed even the remembrance of jacqueline jaffa would have been lost in the long silence that has followed that one disobedient act and so it might were it not for that closely shut house with the sinister bar across its chief entrance inviting curiosity while it effectually precludes all investigation with that token ever before our eyes of a dead man's implacable animosity who can wonder that we sometimes ponder over the fate of her who was its object and no intimations of that fate have been ever received in grotewell for all that is known to the contrary jacqueline jaffa may have preceded her father to the tomb paula bowed her head amazed at the gloomy tone in which this emphatic assertion was made by one whose supposed ignorance she had been endeavouring to enlighten you knew her history before then observed she i beg your pardon and it is granted 
said he, with a sudden throwing off of the shadow that had enveloped him. You must not mind my sudden lapses into gloom. I was never a cheerful man, that is, not since I, since my early youth, I should say, and the shadows which are short at your time of life grow long and chilly at mine. One thing can illumine them, though, and that is a child's happy smile. You are a child to me. Do not deny me a smile, then, before I go. Not one nor a dozen, cried she, giving him her hands in good-bye, for they had arrived at the depot by this time, and the sound of the approaching train was heard in the distance. God bless you, said he, clasping those hands with a father's heartfelt tenderness. God bless my little Paula, and make her pillow soft till we meet again. Then, as the train came sweeping up the track, put on his brightest look, and added, If the fairy godmother chances to visit you during my departure, don't hesitate to obey her commands if you want to hear the famous organ peal. No, no, she cried, and with a final look and smile, he stepped upon the train, and in another moment was whirled away from that place of many memories and a solitary hope. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Stuyvesant. She smiled, but he could see arise her soul from far adown her eyes. Mrs. Browning. She is a beauty. It is only right I should forewarn you of that. Dark or light? Dark. That is, her hair and eyes are almost oriental in their blackness, but her skin is fair, almost as dazzling as yours, owner. Mrs. Sylvester threw a careless glance in the long mirror before which she was slowly completing her toilet, and languidly smiled. But whether at this covert compliment to her greatest charm, or at some passing fancy of her own, it would be difficult to decide. The dark hair and eyes come from her father, remarked she in an abstracted way, while she tried the effect of a bunch of snow-white roses at her waist, with a backward toss of her proud blonde head. His mother was a Greek. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, she exclaimed, in a voice as nearly gay as her indolent nature would allow, for this lady of fashion was in one of her happiest moods. Her dress, a new one, fitted her to perfection, and the vision mirrored in the glass before her was not lacking, so far as she could see, in one charm that could captivate. Do you think she could fasten a ribbon or arrange a bow? she further inquired. I should like to have someone about me with a knack for helping a body in an emergency, if possible. Sarah is absolutely the destruction of any bit of ribbon she undertakes to handle. Look at that knot of black velvet over there, for instance. Wouldn't you think a raw Irish girl, just from the other side, would have known better than to tie it with half the wrong side showing? With the habit long ago acquired of glancing wherever her ivory finger chanced to point, the grave man of the world slowly turned his head, full of the weightiest cares and oppressed by the burden of innumerable responsibilities, and surveyed the cluster of velvet bows thus indicated, with a mechanical knitting of the brows. I pay Sarah twenty-five dollars a month, and that is the result, his wife proceeded. Now, if Paula... Paula is not to come here as a waiting maid, her husband quickly interposed, a suspicion of colour just showing itself for a moment on his cheek. If Paula, his wife went on, unheeding the interruption, save by casting him a hurried glance over the shoulder of her own reflection in the glass, had the taste in such matters of some other members of our family, and could manage to lend me a helping hand now and then, why, I could almost imagine I had my younger sister back with me again, who, with her skill in making one look fit for the eyes of the world, was such a blessing to us in our old home. I have no doubt Paula could be taught to be equally efficient, her husband responded, 
carefully restraining any further show of impatience. She is bright, I am certain, and ribbon-tying is not such a very difficult art, is it? I don't know about that. By the way Sarah succeeds, I should say it was about on a par with the science of algebra, or what is that horrid study they used to threaten to inflict me with at the academy whenever I complained of a headache? Oh, I remember, conic sections. Well, well, laughed her husband, she ought soon to be an expert in it then. Paula is a famous little mathematician. A silence followed this response. Mrs. Sylvester was fitting in her earrings. I suppose, said she, when the operation was completed, that the snow will prevent half the people from coming tonight. It was a reception evening at the Sylvester mansion. But so long as Mrs. Fitzgerald does not disappoint me, I do not care. What do you think of the setting of these diamonds? she inquired, leaning forward to look at herself more closely, and slowly shaking her head, till the rich gems sparkled like fire. "'It is good,' came in short, quick tones from the lips of her husband. "'Well, I don't know. There might be a shade more of enamel on the edge of that ring. I shall speak to the jeweller about it tomorrow. But what were we talking about?' she dreamily asked, still turning her head from side to side before the mirror. "'We were talking about adopting your cousin in the place of our child who is dead.' replied her husband with some severity, pausing in the middle of the floor which he was pacing, to honour her with a steady glance. Oh, yes! Dear me! What an awkward clasp that man has given to these rings, after all! You will have to fasten them for me. Then, as he stepped forward with studied courtesy, yawned just a trifle, and remarked, No one could ever take the place of one's own child, of course. If Geraldine had lived, she would have been a blonde. Her eyes were blue as sapphires. He looked in his wife's face, and his hands dropped. He thought of the day when those eyes, blue as sapphires indeed, flashed burning with death's own fever from the little crib in the nursery, while with this same cool and self-satisfied countenance, the wife and mother before him had swept down the broad stairs to her carriage, murmuring apologetically as she gathered up her train. Oh, you needn't trouble yourself to look after her. She will do very well with Sarah. She may have thought of it too, for the least little bit of real crimson found its way through the rouge on her cheek as she encountered the stern look of his eye, but she only turned a trifle more towards the glass, saying, I forgot you do not admire the role of waiting maid. I will try and manage them myself, seeing that you have banished Sarah. He exerted his self-control, and again for the thousandth time buried that ghastly memory out of sight, actually forcing himself to smile as he gently took her hand from her ear and began deftly to fasten the rebellious ornaments. You mistake, said he. Love can ask any favour without hesitation. I do not object to waiting upon my own wife. She gave him a little look, which he obligingly took as a guerdon for this speech, and languidly held out her bracelets. As he stood clasping them on her arms, she quietly eyed him over from head to foot. "'I don't know of a man who has your figure,' said she, with a certain tone of pride in her voice. "'It is well you married a wife who does not look altogether inferior beside you.' Then, as he bowed with mock appreciation of the intended compliment, added with her usual inconsequence, I dare say it would give me something to interest myself in. I don't suppose she has a decent thing to wear, and the fact of her being a dark beauty would lend quite a new impulse to my inventive faculty. Mrs. Walker has a daughter with black eyes, but dear me, what a guy she does make of her. With a sigh, Mr. Sylvester turned to the window, where he stood looking out at the heavy flakes of snow falling with slow and fluctuating movement between him and the row of brown stone houses in front. Paula considered as a milliner's block upon which to try the effect of clothes. Even Mrs. Fitzgerald, with all her taste, don't know how to dress her child, proceeded his wife, 
with a hurried, Be still, Cherry, to the importunate bird in the cage. Now I should take as much pride in dressing any one under my charge as I would myself, provided the subject was likely to do credit to my efforts, and finding the bird incorrigible in his shrill singing, she moved over to the cage, where she stood balancing her white finger for the bird to peck at, with a pretty caressing motion of her lip, the little Geraldine of the wistful blue eyes had never seen. "'You are welcome to do what you please in such matters,' was her husband's reply. He was thinking again of that same little Geraldine. A fall of snow like the present always made him think of her, and her innocent query as to whether God threw down such big flakes to amuse little children. "'I give you carte blanche,' said he, with sudden emphasis. Mrs. Sylvester paused in her attentions to the bird to give him a sharp little look, which might have aroused his surprise if he had been fortunate enough to see it. But his back was towards her, and there was nothing in the languidly careless tone with which she responded to cause him to turn his head. "'I see that you would really like to have me entertain the child, but—' She paused, pursing up her lips to meet the chattering bird's caress, while her husband in his impatience drummed with his fingers on the pane. "'I must see her before I decide upon the length of her visit,' continued she, as, weary with the sport, she drew back to give herself a final look in the glass. "'Will you please to hand me that shawl, Edward?' He turned with alacrity. In his relief he could have kissed the snowy neck held so erectly before him, as he drew around it the shawl he had hastily lifted from the chair at his side. But that would not have suited this calm and languid beauty, who disliked any too overt tribute to her charms, and saved her caresses for her bird. Besides, it would look like gratitude and gratitude would be misplaced towards a wife who had just indicated her acceptance of his offer to receive a relative of her own into his house. She might as well come at once, was her final remark, as, satisfied at last with the lay of every ribbon, she swept in finished elegance from the room. Mrs. Kittredge's reception comes off a week from Thursday, and I should like to see how a dark beauty with a fair skin would look in that new shade of heliotrope. And so the battle was over, and the victory won. For Mrs. Sylvester, for all her seeming indifference, was never known to change a decision she had once made. As he realised the fact, as he meditated that ere long this very room, which had been the scene of so much frivolity, and the witness to so many secret heart-burnings, would re-echo to the tread of the pure and innocent child, whose mind had flights unknown to the slaves of fashion, and in whose heart lay impulses of goodness that would satisfy the long-smothered cravings of his awakened nature. He experienced a feeling of relenting towards the wife who had not chosen to thwart him in this the strongest wish of his childless manhood and crossing to her dressing-table, he dropped among its treasures a costly ring which he had been induced to purchase that day from an old friend who had fallen into want. "'She will wear it,' murmured he to himself, "'for its hue will make her hand look still whiter, and when I see it sparkle I will remember this hour and be patient.' Had he known that she had yielded to this wish, out of a certain vague feeling of compunction for the disappointments she had frequently occasioned him, and would occasion him again, he might have added a tender thought to the rich and costly gift with which he had just endowed her. "'I expect a young cousin of mine to spend the winter with me and pursue her studies,' were the first words that greeted his ears, as an hour or so later he entered the parlour, where his wife was entertaining what few guests had been anxious enough for a sight of Mrs. Sylvester's newly furnished drawing-room, to brave the now rapidly falling snow. I hope that you and she will be friends. Curious to see what sort of a companion his wife was thus somewhat prematurely providing for Paula, 
he hastily advanced towards the little group from which her voice had proceeded and found himself face to face with a brown-haired girl whose appealing glance and somewhat infantile mouth were in striking contrast to the dignity with which she carried her small head and managed her whole somewhat petite person miss stuyvesant my husband came in musical tones from his wife and somewhat surprised to hear a name that but a moment before had been the uppermost in his mind he bowed with courtesy and then asked if he was so happy as to speak to a daughter of thaddeus stuyvesant if it will give you a special pleasure i will say yes responded the little miss with a smile that irradiated her whole face do you know my father there are but few bankers in the city who have not that pleasure replied he with an answering look of regard i am especially happy to meet his daughter in my house to-night there was something in his manner of saying this and in the short inquiring glance which at every opportunity he cast upon her bright young face with its nameless charm of mingled appeal and reserve that astonished his wife miss stuyvesant was in the carriage with mrs fitzgerald said that lady with a certain dignity she knew well how to assume i am afraid if it had not been for that circumstance we should not have enjoyed the pleasure of her presence and with the rare tact of which she was certainly a mistress as far as all social matters were concerned she left the aspiring magnate of wall street to converse with the daughter of the man whom all new york bankers were expected to know and hastened to join a group of ladies discussing ceramics before a huge plaque of rarest cloisonne mr sylvester followed her with his eyes he had never seen her look more vivacious had the hope of seeing a young face at their board touched some secret chord in her nature as well as his was she more of a woman than he imagined and would she be though in the most superficial of ways a mother to paula flushed with the thought he turned back to the little lady at his side she was gazing in an intent and thoughtful way at an engraving of duberth's prodigal son that adorned the wall above her head there was something in her face that made him ask is that a favourite picture of yours she smiled and nodded her small and delicate head yes sir it is indeed but i was not looking at the picture so much as at the face of that dark-haired girl that sits in the centre with that far-away expression in her eyes do you see what i mean she is like none of the rest her form is before us but her heart and her interest are in some distant clime or forsaken home to which the music murmured at her side recalls her she has a soul above her surroundings that girl and her face is indescribably pathetic to me in the recesses of her being she carries a memory or a regret that separates her from the world and makes certain moments of her life almost holy you look deep said mr sylvester gazing down upon the little lady's face with strongly awakened interest you see more perhaps than the painter intended no no possibly more than the engraving expresses but not more than the artist intended i saw the original once when as you remember it was on exhibition here i was a wee thing but i never forgot that girl's face it spoke more than all the rest to me perhaps because i so much honour reserve in one who holds in his breast a great pain or a great hope the eye that was resting upon her softened indescribably you believe in great hopes said he the little figure seemed to grow tall and her face looked almost beautiful what would life be without them she answered true returned mr sylvester and entering into the conversation with unusual spirit was astonished to find how young she was and yet how thoroughly bright and self-possessed lovely girls are cropping up around me in all directions thought he 
I shall have to correct my judgment concerning our young ladies of fashion if I encounter many more as sensible and earnest-hearted as this. And for some reason his brow grew so light and his tone so cheerful that the ladies were attracted from all parts of the room to hear what the demure Miss Stuyvesant could have to say to the grave master of the house to call forth such smiles of enjoyment upon his usually melancholy countenance. Take it all together, the occasion, though small, was one of the pleasantest of the season, and so Mrs. Sylvester announced when the last carriage had driven away, and she and her husband stood in the brilliantly lighted library, surveying a new cabinet of rare and antique workmanship, which had been that day installed in the place of honour beneath my lady's picture. I thought you seemed to enjoy it, Ona, her husband remarked. Oh, it was an occasion of triumph to me, she murmured. It is the first time a Stuyvesant has crossed our threshold, mon cher. Ha! he exclaimed, turning upon her a brisk, displeased look. He was proud and considered no man his superior in a social sense. Do you acknowledge yourself a parvenu, that you rejoice at the entrance of any one special person into your doors? I thought, she replied, somewhat mortified, that you betrayed unusual pleasure yourself at her introduction. That may be. I was glad to see her here, for her father is one of the most influential directors in the bank of which I shortly expect to be made president. The nature of this disclosure was calculated to be especially gratifying to her, and effectually blotted out any remembrance of the break by which it had been introduced, after a few hasty inquiries, followed by a scene of quite honest mutual congratulation, the gratified wife left her husband to put out the lights himself, or call Samuel as he might choose, and glided upstairs to delight the curious Sarah with the broken soliloquies and inconsequent self-communings which formed another of her peculiar habits. As for her husband, he stood a few minutes where she left him, abstractedly eyeing the gorgeous vista that spread out before him, down to the further mirror of the elaborate drawing-room, thinking perhaps with a certain degree of pride of the swiftness with which he had risen to opulence, and the certainty with which he had conquered positions in the business as well as in the social world, when he could speak of such a connection with Thaddeus Stuyvesant as a project already matured. Then, with a hasty movement and a quick sigh, which nothing in his prospects, actual or apparent, would seem to warrant, he proceeded to put out the lights, my lady's picture shining with less and less importunity as the flickering jets disappeared, till all was dark, save for the faint glimmer that came in from the hall, a glimmer just sufficient to show the outlines of the various articles of furniture scattered about. And could it be the tall figure of the master himself, standing in the centre of the room, with his palms pressed against his forehead, in an attitude of sorrow or despair? Yes, or who's that wild murmur? It is never given to man to forget. Yet, no... Or who is this that calm and dignified steps at this moment from the threshold? It must have been a dream, a fantasy. This is the master of the house, who with sedate and regular step goes up flight after flight of the spiral staircase, and neither pauses or looks back till he reaches the top of the house, where he takes out a key from his pocket, and opening a certain door, goes in and locks it behind him. It is his secret study or retreat, a room which no one is allowed to enter, the mystery of the house to the servants, and something more than that to its inquisitive mistress. What he does there no man knows, but to-night, if any one had been curious enough to listen, they would have heard nothing more ominous than the monotonous scratch of a pen. He was writing to Miss Belinda, and the burden of his letter was that on a certain day he named, he was coming to take away Paula. End of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Belinda makes conditions. For of the soul the body form doth take, for soul is form and doth the body make. Spencer. Miss Belinda was somewhat taken aback at the proposal of Mr. Sylvester to receive Paula into his own house. She had not anticipated any such result to her efforts. The utmost she had expected was a couple of years or so of instruction in some state academy. Nor did she know whether she was altogether pleased at the turn affairs were taking. From all she had heard, her niece owner was, to say the least, a frivolous woman, and Paula had a mind too noble to be subjected to the deteriorating influence of a shallow and puerile companionship. Then the child had great beauty. Mr. Sylvester, who ought to be a judge in such matters, had declared it so, and what might not the adulation of the thoughtless and the envy of the jealous do towards belittling a nature as yet uncontaminated? We ought to think twice, she said to Miss Abby, with some bitterness, who, on the contrary, never having thought once, was full of the most childish hopes concerning a result which she considered with a certain secret complacency she would not have acknowledged for the world, had been very much furthered by her own wise recommendations to Mr. Sylvester in the beginning of his visit. Yet, notwithstanding her doubts, Miss Belinda allowed such preparations to be made as she considered necessary, and even lent her hand, which was deft enough in its way, to the task of enlarging the child's small wardrobe. As for Paula, the thought of visiting the great city with the dear friend whose image had stood in her mind from early childhood as the impersonation of all that was noble, generous and protecting, was more than joyful, it was an inspiration. Not that she did not cling to the affectionate, if somewhat quaint, couple who had befriended her childhood and sacrificed their comfort to her culture and happiness. But the chord that lies deeper than gratitude had been struck, and fond as were her memories of the dear old home, the charm of that deep, my child, with its hint of fatherly affection, was more than her heart could stand, and no spot no, not the realms of fairyland itself, looked so attractive to her fancy as that far fireside in an unknown home where she might sit with cousin Ona and alternately, with her, exert her wit to beguile the smile to his melancholy lips. When, therefore, upon the stated day, Mr. Sylvester made his second appearance at the little cottage in Grotewell, it was to find Paula radiant, Miss Abby tearfully exultant, and Miss Belinda, oh, anomaly of human nature, silent and severe. Attributing this, however, to her very natural regret at parting with Paula, he entered into all the arrangements for their departure on the following morning without a suspicion of the real state of her mind, nor was he undeceived until the day was nearly over and they sat down to have a few minutes of social conversation before the early tea. They had been speaking on some local topic involving a question of right and wrong, and Mr. Sylvester's ears were yet thrilling to the deep ringing tones with which Paula uttered the words, I do not see how any man can hesitate an instant when the voice of his conscience says no. I should think the very sunlight would daunt him at the first step of his foot across the forbidden line. When Miss Belinda suddenly spoke up, and sending Paula out of the room on some trivial pretext, addressed Mr. Sylvester without reserve. I have something to say to you, sir, before you take from my home the child of my care and affection. Could he have guessed what that something was, that he should turn with such a flush of sudden anxiety to meet her determined gaze. The rules of our life here have been simple, 
continued she, in a tone of voice which those who knew her well recognised as belonging to her uncompromising moods. To do our duty, love God, and serve our neighbour. Paula has been brought up to reverence those rules in simplicity and honour. What will your gay city life, with its hollow devices for pleasure, and its loose hold on the firm principles of life, do for this innocent soul, Mr. Sylvester? The city, he said firmly, but with a troubled undertone in his voice that was not unnoted by the watchful woman, is a vast cauldron of mingled good and evil. She will hear of more wrongdoing, and be within the reach of more self-denying virtue, than if she had remained in this village alone with the nature that she so much loves. The tree of knowledge bears two kinds of fruit, Miss Belinda, would you therefore hinder the child from approaching its branches? No, sir, I am not so weak as to keep a child in swaddling clothes after the period of infancy is past. Neither am I so reckless as to set her adrift on an unknown sea without a pilot to guide her. Your wife, she paused and fixed an intent look upon the flames leaping before her, Ona is my niece, she resumed, in a lower tone of voice, and I feel entitled to speak with freedom concerning her. Is she such a guide as I would choose for a young girl just entering a new sphere in life? From all I have heard, I should judge she was somewhat over-devoted to this world and its fashions. Mr. Sylvester flushed painfully but seeing that any softening of the truth would be wholly ineffectual with this woman, replied in a candid tone, Ona is the same now as she was in the days of her girlhood. If she loves the world too well, she is not without her excuse. From her birth it has strewn nothing but roses in her path. Hm, <laughs> came from the lips of the energetic spinster, then, with a second stern glance at the fire, continued, Another question, Mr. Sylvester. Does your wife consent to receive my niece into her house for the indefinite length of time which you mention, from interest in the girl herself, or indeed from any motive I should judge worthy of Paula? It is a leading question, I know, but this is no time for niceties of speech. Miss Belinda, replied he, and his voice was firm, though his fingers slightly trembled where they rested upon the arms of his chair. I will try and forget for a moment that Ona is my wife, and frankly confide to you that any such motive on her part, as would meet with your entire approval, must not be expected from a woman who has never fully recognised the solemn responsibilities of life. That she will be kind to Paula, I have no doubt. That she may even learn to take an interest in her for her own sake is also very possible. But that she will ever take your place towards her as guide or instructor, I neither anticipate nor would feel myself justified in leading you to. The look which Miss Belinda cast him was anything but reassuring. And yet, said she, you will take away my darling and give her up to an influence that cannot be for good, or your glance would not be so troubled, or your lip so uncertain. You would set her young feet in a path where the very flowers are so thick they conceal its tendency and obscure its dangers. Mr. Sylvester, you are a man who has seen life with naked eyes and must recognise its responsibilities. Dare you take this Paula, whom you have seen, out of the atmosphere of truth and purity in which she has been raised, and give her over to the enervating influences of folly and fashion? Will you assume the risk and brave the consequences? as though an electric shock had touched the nerve of his nature, 
Mr. Sylvester hastily rose and moved in a restless manner to the window. It was his favourite refuge in any time of sudden perplexity or doubt, and this was surely an occasion for both. Miss Belinda, he began, and then paused, looking out on the hills of his boyhood, every one of which spoke to him at that moment with a force that almost sickened his heart and benumbed the faculties of his mind. I recognise the love which leads you to speak in this way, and I bow before it, but... Here his tongue faltered again, that ready tongue, whose quick and persuasive eloquence on public occasions had won for him the name of Silver Speech among his friends and admirers. But there are others who love your Paula also, love her with a yearning that only the childless can feel or the disappointed appreciate. I had hoped, here he left the window and approached her side, to do more for Paula than to give her the temporal benefit of a luxurious home and such instruction as her extraordinary talents demand. If Ona, upon seeing and knowing the child had found she could love her, I had intended to ask you to yield her to us unreservedly and forever. In short, to make her my child, in place of the daughter I have lost. But now, with a quick gesture, he began pacing the floor and left the sentence unfinished. Miss Belinda's eyes, which were of a light grey, wholly without beauty, but with strange flashes of expression in them, left the fire and fell upon his face, and a tear of real feeling gathered beneath her lids. I had no idea, said she, that you cherished any such intention as that. If I had, I might have worded my apprehensions differently. The yearning feeling of which you speak, I can easily understand. Also, the strength of the determination it must take on the part of a man like yourself to give up a hope of this nature. Yet, seeing him pause in his hurried pacing and open his lips as if to speak, she deferentially stopped. Miss Belinda, said he, in the firm and steadfast way more in keeping with his features than his agitated manner of a moment before, I cannot give it up. The injury it would do me is greater than the harm which one of Paula's lofty nature would be apt to acquire in any atmosphere into which she might chance to be introduced. She is not a child, Miss Belinda, though we allude to her as such. The texture of those principles which you have instilled into her breast is of no such weak material as to give way to the first petty breeze that blows, Paula's house will stand, while mine, he paused and gave way to a momentary struggle. But that over, he set his lips firmly together, and the last vestige of irresolution vanished. Sitting down by her side, he turned his face upon her, and for the first time she realised the power which, with one exception, he had always exerted over the minds of others. Miss Belinda, said he, I am going to give you an evidence of my trust. I am going to leave with you the responsibility of Paula's future. She shall go with me and learn, if she can, to love me and mine, but she shall also be under obligations to open her heart to you on all matters that concern her life and happiness in my house. And the day you see any falling off in her pure and upright spirit, you shall demand her return. And though it tears the heart from my breast, I will yield her up without question or parley, as I am a gentleman and a Christian. Does that content you? It certainly ought to, sir. No one could ask more, I am sure, returned the other in a voice somewhat unsteady for her. It is opening my house to the gaze of a stranger, said he, for I desire you to command Paula to withhold nothing that seriously affects her. 
but my confidence in you is unbounded and i am sure that whatever you may learn in this way will be held as sacred by you as though it were buried in a tomb it certainly will sir as for the dearer hope which i have mentioned time and the condition of things must decide for us meanwhile i shall strive to win a father's place in her heart if only to build myself a refuge for the days that are to come you see i speak frankly miss belinda will you give me some token that you are not altogether dissatisfied with the result of this conversation with the straightforward if somewhat blunt action that characterized all her movements she stretched out her hand which he took with something more than his usual high-bred courtesy with you at the wheel said she i think i may trust my darling even to the whirl and follies of such a society as i know Ona loves a man who can so command himself ought to be a safe guide to pioneer others and the considerate gentleman bowed but the frank smile that hailed her genial clasp had somehow vanished and from the sudden cloud that at that moment swept over the roseate heavens fell a shadow that left its impress on his lip long after the cloud itself had departed an hour or so had passed the fire was burning brightly on the hearthstone illumining with a steady glow the array of stuffed birds worsted samplers and old-fashioned portraits with which the walls were adorned but reserving its richest glow and fullest irradiation for the bended head of paula who seated on a little stool in the corner of the hearth was watching the rise and fall of the flickering flames she had packed her little trunk had said good-bye to all her neighbouring friends and was now sitting on the old hearthstone musing upon the new life that was about to open before her it was a happy musing as the smile that vaguely dimpled her cheeks and brightened her eyes beneath their long lashes amply testified as mr sylvester watched her from the opposite side of the hearth where he was sitting alone with his thoughts he felt his heart sink with apprehension at the fervour of anticipation with which she evidently looked forward to the life in the new home the young wings think to gain freedom thought he when they are only destined to the confinement of a gilded cage he was so silent and looked so sad paula with a certain sort of sensitiveness to any change in the emotional atmosphere surrounding her which was one of her chief characteristics hastily looked up and meeting his eye fixed on her with that foreboding glance softly arose and came and sat down by his side you look tired murmured she the long ride after a day of business care has been too much for you it was the first word of sympathy with his often overwearied mind and body that had greeted his ears for years it made his eyes moisten i have been a little overworked said he for the last two months but i shall soon be myself again what were you thinking of paula what was i thinking of repeated she drawing her chair nearer to his in her loving confidence i was thinking what wonders of beauty and art lay in that great kernel which you call the city i shall see lovely faces and noble forms i shall wander through halls of music the echo of whose songs may have come to me in the sob of the river or the sigh of the pines but whose notes in all their beauty and power have never been heard by me even in my dreams i shall look on great men and touch the garments of thoughtful women i shall see life in its fullness as i have felt nature in its mightiness and my heart will be satisfied at last mr sylvester drew a deep breath and his eyes burned strangely in the glow of the firelight 
"'You expect high things,' said he. "'Did you ever consider that the life in a great city, "'with its ceaseless rush and constant rivalries, "'must be often strangely petty "'in despite of its artistic and social advantages?' "'All life has its petty side,' said she, "'with a sweet arch look. "'The eagle that cleaves the thundercloud "'must sometimes stop to plume its wings. "'I should be sorry to lose the small things out of existence. "'Even we, in the face of that great sunset "'appealing to us from the west, "'have to pile up the firewood on the hearth "'and set the table for supper.' "'But fashion, Paula,' he pursued, "'concealing his wonder at the maturity of mind "'evinced by this simple child of nature. "'That inexorable power that rules the very souls of women "'who once step within the magic circle of her realm. "'Have you never thought of her "'and the demands that she makes on the time and attention "'even of the worshippers of the good and the true?' "'Yes, sometimes,' she returned, with a repetition of her arch little smile. "'When I put on a certain bonnet I have, which Aunt Abby modelled over from one of my grandmothers. "'Fashion is a sort of obstinate step-dame, I imagine, whom it is less trouble to obey than to oppose. "'I don't believe I shall quarrel with fashion, if she will only promise to keep her hands off my soul.' "'But if,' with a pause, "'she asks your all, what then?' "'I shall consider that I am in a country of democratic principles,' "'she laughed, and begged to be excused "'from acceding to the tyrannical demands "'of any autocrat, male or female. "'You have been listening to Miss Belinda,' said he. "'She is also opposed to all and any tyrannical measures.' Then, with a grave look from which all levity had fled, he leaned toward the young girl and gently asked, Do you know that you are a very beautiful girl, Paula? She flushed, looked at him in some surprise, and slowly drooped her head. I have been told I looked like my father, said she, and I know that means something very kind. "'My child,' said he, with gentle insistence, "'God has given you a great and wonderful gift, "'a treasure casket of whose worth you scarcely realise the value. "'I tell you this myself, first because I prize your beauty "'as something quite sacred and pure, "'and secondly because you are going where you will hear words of adulation whose folly and bluntness will often offend your ears unless you carry in your soul some talisman to counteract their effect. I understand, said she. I know what you mean. I will remember that the most engaging beauty is nothing without a pure mind and a good heart. And you will remember too, continued he, that I blessed your innocent head tonight not because it is circled by the roses of a youthful and fresh loveliness, but because of the pure mind and good heart I see shining in your eyes. And with a fond but solemn aspect, he reached out his hand and laid it on her ebon locks. She bowed her head upon her breast. I will never forget, said she, and the firelight fell with a softening glow on the tears that trembled from her eyelashes. End of chapter 12
this was something so unusual for this august lady of fashion to indulge in that she found it difficult not to fall asleep in the huge crimson-backed chair in which she had chosen to ensconce herself not that she had desisted from making every effort known to mortal woman to keep herself awake and if possible amused till the expected travellers should arrive she had played with her bird till the spoiled pet had himself protested ducking his head under his wing and proceeding without ceremony to make up his little feather bed as cunning geraldine used to call the round fluffy ball into which he rolled himself at night more than that she had looked over her ornaments and taken out such articles as she thought could be spared for paula to say nothing of playing a bar or so from the last operatic sensation and laboriously cutting open the leaves of the new magazine but it was all of no use and the heavy white lids were slowly falling when the bell rang and mr bertram mandeville was announced or rather bertram sylvester as he now chose to be called it was a godsend to her as she politely informed him upon his entrance and though in his secret heart he felt anything but god sent he was not of a make to appreciate his uncle's wife at her very evident value he consented to remain and assist her in disposing of the evening till mr sylvester should return he is going to bring a pretty girl with him remarked she in a tone of some interest a cousin of mine from grotewell i should like to have you see her thank you replied he his mind roaming off at the suggestion into the region of a certain plain little music-room where the clock on the mantel ticked to the beating of his own heart and for ten minutes mrs sylvester had the pleasure of filling the room with a stream of easy talk in which grotewell dark beauties the coming seventh regiment reception the last bit of gossip from london and the exact situation of the madison bank formed the principal topics to the one last mentioned it having taken the form of a question he was forced to reply but the simple locality having been learned she rambled easily on this time indulging him with a criticism upon the personal appearance of certain business gentlemen who visited the house ending with the somewhat startling declaration if edward were not the fine appearing gentleman that he undoubtedly is i should feel utterly out of place in these handsome parlours anything but to see an elegant and modern home decorated with the costliest works of art and filled with bijouterie of the most exquisite delicacy presided over by a plain and commonplace woman or a bald-headed and inferior-looking man the contrast is too vivid works of the highest art do not need such a startling comparison to bring out their beauty now if edward stood in the throne room of a palace he would somehow make it seem to others as a handsome set-off to his own face and figure this was all very wife-like if somewhat unnecessary and bertram could have listened to it with pleasure if she had not cast the frequent and sidelong glances at the mirror which sufficiently betrayed the fact that she included herself in this complacent conclusion as indeed she may have considered herself justified in doing husband and wife being undoubtedly of one flesh as it was he maintained an immovable countenance though he admired his uncle as much as she did and the conversation gradually languished till the white somnolent lids of the lady again began to show certain premonitory signs of drooping when suddenly they were both aroused by the well-known click of a latch-key in the door and in another moment mr sylvester's voice was heard in the hall saying in tones whose cheery accents made his wife's eyes open in surprise welcome home my dear they have come murmured mrs sylvester rising with a look of undeniable expectation had paula not been a beauty she would have remained seated yes we have come was heard in hearty tones from the doorway and mr sylvester with a proud look 
which Bertram long remembered, ushered into their presence a young girl whose simple cloak and bonnet in no wise prevented Mrs. Sylvester from recognising the somewhat uncommon beauty she had been led to expect. Paula, this is your cousin, Ona, and, ah, Bertram, glad to see you. This is my only nephew, Mr. Sylvester. The young girl, lost in the sudden glamour of numerous lights, shining upon splendours such as she may have dreamed of over the pages of Irving's Alhambra, but certainly had never before seen, blushed with very natural embarrassment, but yet managed to bestow a pretty enough greeting upon the elegant woman and handsome youth, while Ona, after the first moment of almost involuntary hesitation, took in hers the two trembling hands of her youthful cousin and actually kissed her cheek. I am not given to caresses, as you know, she afterwards explained in a somewhat apologetic tone to her husband, and anything like an appeal for one on the part of a child or an inferior I detest. But her simple way of holding out her hand disarmed me, and then such a face demands a certain amount of homage, does it not? And her husband, in his surprise, was forced to acknowledge to himself that as closely as he had studied his wife's nature for ten years, there were certain crooks and turns in it which even he had never penetrated. You look dazzled, that lady exclaimed, gazing not unkindly into the young girl's face. The sudden glare of so much gaslight has bewildered you. I do not think it is that returned Paula, with a frank and admiring look at the gorgeous room and the circle of pleasant faces about her. Sudden lights I can bear, but I have come from a little cottage on the hillside, and the magnificence of nature does not prepare you for the first sudden view of the splendours of art. Mrs. Sylvester smiled and cast a side glance of amusement at Bertram, you admire our new hangings, I see, remarked she, with an indulgence of the other's naivete that greatly relieved her husband. But in that instant a change had come across Paula. The simple country maid had assimilated herself with the surroundings, and with a sudden grace and dignity that were unstudied as they were charming, dropped her eyes from her cousin's portrait that for some reason seemed to shine with more than its usual insistence, and calmly replied, I admire all beautiful colour. It is my birthright as a Walton to do so, I suppose. Mrs. Sylvester was a Walton also, and therefore smiled. But her husband, who had marked with inward distrust the sudden transformation in Paula, now stepped forward with a word or two of remark concerning his appetite, a prosaic allusion that led to the rapid disappearance of the ladies upstairs and a short but hurried conversation between the two gentlemen. I have brought you a sealed envelope from the office, said Bertram, who, in accordance with his uncle's advice, had already initiated himself into business by assuming the position of clerk in the office of the wealthy speculator. Ah, returned his uncle, hastily opening it. As I expected, a meeting has been held this day by the board of directors of the Madison Bank. A vote was cast, my proxy did his duty, and I am duly elected president. Bertram, we know what that means, smiled he, holding out his hand with an affectionate warmth greatly in advance of the emotion displayed by him on a former occasion. I hope so indeed, young Bertram responded. An increase of fortune and honour for you, though you seem to have both in the fullest measure already, and a start in the new life for me, to whom fortune and honour mean happiness. A smile younger and more full of hope than any he had seen on his uncle's face for years responded to this burst. Bertram, said he, since our conversation of a couple of weeks ago, something has occurred which somewhat alters the opinions I then expressed. 
if you have patience equal to your energy and a self-control that will not put to shame your unbounded trust in women i think i can say god speed to your serious undertaking with something like a good heart women are not all frivolous and foolish minded there are some jewels of simple goodness and faith yet left in the world thank god for your conversion returned his nephew smiling and if this lovely girl whom you have just introduced to me is the cause of it then thank god for her also his uncle bowed with a gravity almost solemn but the ladies returning at this moment he refrained from further reply after supper to which unusual meal mr sylvester insisted upon his nephew remaining the two gentlemen again drew apart if you have decided upon buying the shares i have mentioned said the former you had better get your money in a position to handle at once i shall wish to present you to mr stuyvesant to-morrow and i should like to be able to mention you as a future stockholder in the bank mr stuyvesant exclaimed bertram ignoring the rest of the sentence yes returned his uncle with a smile thaddeus stuyvesant is the next largest stockholder to myself in the madison bank and his patronage is not an undesirable one indeed i was not aware excuse me i should be happy stammered the young man as for the money it is all in governments and is at your command whenever you please that is good i'll notify you when i'm ready for the transfer and now come said he with a change from his deep business tone to the lighter one of ordinary social converse forget for a half hour that you have discarded the name of mandeville and give us an aria or a sonata from mendelssohn before those hands have quite lost their cunning but the ladies inquired the youth glancing towards the drawing-room where mrs sylvester was giving paula her first lesson in ceramics ah it is to see how the charm will act upon my shy country lassie that i request such a favour has she never heard mendelssohn not with your interpretation without further hesitation the young musician proceeded to the piano which occupied a position opposite to my lady's picture in this anomalous room denominated by courtesy the library in another instant a chord delicate and ringing disturbed the silence of the long vista and one of mendelssohn's most exquisite songs trembled in all its delicious harmony through these apartments of sensuous luxury mr sylvester had seated himself where he could see the distant figure of paula and leaning back in his chair watched for the first startled response on her part he was not disappointed at the first note he beheld her spirited head turn in a certain wondering surprise followed presently by her whole quivering form till he could perceive her face upon which were the dawnings of a great delight flush and pale by turns until the climax of the melody being reached she came slowly down the room stretching out her hands like a child and breathing heavily as if her ecstasy of joy in its impotence to adequately express itself had caught an expression from pain oh mr sylvester was all she said as she reached that gentleman's side but bertram mandeville recognized the accents of an unfathomable appreciation in that simple exclamation and struck into a grand old battle song that had always made his own heart beat with something of the fire of ancient chivalry under its breastplate of modern broadcloth it is the voice of the thunderclouds when they marshal for battle exclaimed she at the conclusion i can hear the cry of a righteous struggle all through the sublime harmony you are right it is a war song ancient as the time of battle-axes and spears quoth bertram from his seat at the piano 
I thought I detected the flashing of steel, returned she. Oh, what a world lies in those simple bits of ivory. Say rather in the fingers that sweep them, uttered Mr. Sylvester. You will not hear such music often. I am glad of that, she cried simply. Then in a quick conscious tone explained, I mean that the hearing of such music makes an era in our life, a starting point for thoughts that reach away into eternity. We could not bear such experiences often. It would confuse the spirit, if not deaden its enjoyment. Or so it seems to me, she added naively, glancing at her cousin, who now came sweeping in from the further room, where she had been trying the effect of a change in the arrangement of two little pet monstrosities of Japanese ware. "'What seems to you?' that lady inquired. "'Oh, Mr. Mandeville's playing. I beg pardon. Sylvester is the name by which you now wish to be addressed, I suppose. Fine, isn't it?' she rambled on, all in the same tone, while she cautiously hid an unfortunate gape of her rosy mouth, behind the folds of her airy handkerchief. Mr. Turner says the hiatus you have made in the musical world by leaving the concert room for the desk can never be repaired, she went on, supposedly to her nephew, though she did not look his way, being at that instant engaged in sinking into her favourite chair. I am glad, Bertram politely returned with a frank smile, to have enjoyed the approval of so cultivated a critic as Mr. Turner. I own it occasions me a pang now and then, he remarked to his uncle over his shoulder, to think I shall never again call up those looks of self-forgetful delight which I have sometimes detected on the faces of certain ones in my audience. And he relapsed without pause into a solemn anthem the very reverse of the stirring tones which he had previously accorded them. "'Now we are in a temple,' whispered Paula, subduing the sudden interest and curiosity which this young man's last words had awakened. And the awe which crept over her countenance was the fittest interpretation to those noble sounds which the one weary-hearted man in that room could have found." I have something to tell you, Ona, remarked Mr. Sylvester shortly after this, as, the music being over, they all sat down for a final chat about the fireside. I have received notice that the directors of the Madison Bank have this day elected me their president. I thought you might like to know it tonight. It is a very gratifying piece of news, certainly. President of the Madison Bank sounds very well. Does it not, Paula? The young girl, with her soul yet ringing with the grand and solemn harmonies of Mendelssohn and Chopin, turned at this with her brightest smile. It certainly does, and a little awe-inspiring too, she added with her arch glance. Your congratulations are also requested for our new assistant cashier. Arise, Bertram, and greet the ladies. With a blush, his young nephew arose to his feet. "'What? Are you going into the banking business?' queried Mrs. Sylvester. "'Mr. Turner will be more shocked than ever. He chooses to say that bankers, merchants and such are the solid rock of his church, while the lighter fry such as artists, musicians, and let us hope he includes us ladies, are its minarets and steeples.' Now, to make a foundation out of a steeple will quite overturn his methodical mind, I fear. Mr. Sylvester looked genially at his wife. She was not accustomed to attempt the facetious, but Paula seemed to have the power of bringing out unexpected lights and shadows from all with whom she came in contact. A clergyman who rears his church on the basis of wealth must expect some overturning now and then laughed he. If by means of it he turns a fresh side to the sun, it will do him no harm, chimed in Paula. Seldom had there been so much simple gaiety round that fireside. The very atmosphere grew lighter. 
and the brilliance of my lady's picture became less oppressive. We ought to have a happy winter of it, spoke up Mr. Sylvester with a glance around him. Life never looked more cheerful for us all, I think. What do you say, Bertram, my boy? It certainly looks promising for me. And for me, murmured Paula. The complacent way with which Mrs. Sylvester smoothed out the feathers of her fan with her jewelled right hand, she always carried a fan, winter and summer, some said for the purpose of displaying those same jewelled fingers, was sufficient answer for her. At that moment there was a hush, when suddenly the small clock on the mantelpiece struck eleven, and instantly, as if awaiting the signal, there came a rush and a heavy crash which drew everyone to their feet, and the brilliant portrait of my lady fell from the wall, and toppling over the cabinet beneath, slid with the various articles of bronze and china thereon, almost to the very chair in which its handsome prototype had been sitting. It was a startling interruption, and for an instant no one spoke. Then Paula, with a look towards her cousin, breathed to herself rather than said, Pray God it be not an omen, and the pale countenances of the two gentlemen, standing face to face on either side of that fallen picture, showed that the shadow of the same superstition had insensibly crossed their own minds. Mrs. Sylvester was the only one who remained unmoved. Lift it up, cried she, and let us see if it has sustained any injury. Instantly Bertram and her husband sprang forward, and in a moment its glowing surface was turned upward. Who could read the meaning of the look that crossed her husband's face, as he perceived that the sharp spear of the bronze horseman, which had been overturned in the fall, had penetrated the rosy countenance of the portrait, and destroyed that importunate smile for ever. I suppose it is a judgment upon me for putting all the money you had allowed me for charitable purposes into that exquisite bit of bronze, observed Mrs. Sylvester, stooping above the overturned horseman with an expression of regret she had not chosen to bestow on her own ruined picture. Ah, he is less of a champion than I imagined. He has lost his spear in the struggle. Paula glanced at her cousin in surprise. Was this pleasantry only a veil, assumed by this courtly lady, to hide her very natural regret over the more serious accident? Even her husband turned toward her with a certain puzzled inquiry in his troubled countenance. But her expression of unconcern was too natural. Evidently the destruction of the picture had awakened but small regret in her volatile mind. She is less vain than I thought, was the inward comment of Paula. Ah, simple child of the woods and streams, it is the extent of her vanity, not the lack of it, that has produced this effect. She has begun to realise that ten years have elapsed since this picture was painted, and that people are beginning to say, as they examine it, Mrs. Sylvester has not yet lost her complexion, I see. A break necessarily followed this disturbance, and before long Bertram took his leave, not without a cordial pressure from his uncle's hand and a look of kindly interest from the stranger lassie, upon whose sympathetic and imaginative mind the hints let fall as to his former profession had produced a deep impression. With his departure, Mrs. Sylvester's weariness returned, and ere long she led the way to her apartments upstairs. As Paula was hastening to follow, Mr. Sylvester stopped her. "'You will not allow this unfortunate occurrence,' he said, with a slight gesture towards the picture now standing with its face against the wall, "'to mar your first sleep under my roof, will you, Paula, my child?' "'No, not if you say that you think Cousin Ona will not be likely to connect it with my appearance here. I do not think she will. She is not superstitious, and besides, does not seem to greatly regret the misfortune. 
then i will forget it all and only remember the music it was all you anticipated it was more sometime i will tell you about the player and the sweet young girl he loves does he she paused blushing love was a subject upon which she had never yet spoken to any one yes he does mr sylvester returned smiling i thought there was a meaning in the music i did not quite understand good night uncle he had requested her to address him thus though he was in truth her cousin and many many thanks but he stopped her again you think you will be happy in these rooms said he you love splendor she was not yet sufficiently acquainted with his voice to detect the regret underlying its kindly tone and answered without suspicion i did not know it before but i fear that i do it dazzled at first but now it seems as if i had reached a home towards which i had always been journeying i shall dream away hours of joy before each little ornament that adorns your parlours the very tiles that surround the fireplace will demand a week of attention at least she ended with a smile but unlike formerly he did not seem to catch the infection i had rather you had cared less said he but instantly regretted the seeming reproach for her eyes filled with tears and the tones of her voice trembled as she replied do you think the beauty i have seen has made me forget the kindness that has brought me here i love fine and noble objects glory of colour and harmony of shape but more than all these do i love a generous soul without a blot on its purity or a flaw in its integrity she had meant to utter something that would show her appreciation of his goodness and the universal esteem in which he was held but was quite unprepared for the start that he gave and the unmistakable deepening of the shadow on his sombre face but before she could express her regret at the offence whatever it was he had recovered himself and it was with a fatherly tenderness that he laid his hand upon hers while he said such a soul may yours ever continue my child and then stood watching her as she glided up the stairs her charming face showing every now and then as she leaned on her winding way to the top to bestow upon him the tender little smile she had already learned was his solace and delight it was the beginning of happier days for him end of chapter thirteen book two of the sword of damocles by anna catherine green life and death this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen miss belinda has a question to decide i pray you in your letters speak of me as i am nothing extenuate nor set down aught in malice othello miss belinda sitting before her bedroom fire on a certain windy night in january presented a picture of the most profound thought a year had elapsed since with heavy heart and moistened eye she had bidden good-bye to the child of her care and beheld her drift away with her new friend into a strange and untried life and now a letter had come from that friend in which with the truest appreciation for the feelings of herself and sister he requested their final permission to adopt paula as his own child and the future occupant of his house and heart yes after a year of increased comfort mrs sylvester who would never have consented to receive as her own any child demanding care or attention had decided it was quite a different matter to give place and position to a lovely girl already grown whose beauty was sufficiently pronounced to do credit to the family while at the same time it was of a character to heighten by contrast her own very manifest attractions so the letter 
destined to create such a disturbance in the stern and powerful mind of Miss Belinda, had been written and dispatched. And indeed it was matter for the gravest reflection. To accede to this important request was to yield up all control over the dear young girl whose affection had constituted the brightness of this somewhat disappointed life, while to refuse an offer made with such evident love and anxiety was to bring a pang of regret to a heart she hesitated to wound. The question of advantage, which might have swayed others in their decision, did not in the least affect Miss Belinda. Now that Paula had seen the world and gained an insight into certain studies beyond the reach of her own attainments, any wishes in which she might have indulged on that score were satisfied, and mere wealth, with its concomitant of luxuriant living, she regarded with distrust, and rather in the light of a stumbling block to the great and grand end of all existence. Suddenly, with that energy which characterised all her movements, she rose from her seat, and first casting a look of somewhat cautious inquiry at the recumbent figure of her sister, asleep in the heavy old-fashioned bed that occupied one corner of the room, she proceeded to a bureau drawer and took out a small box which she unlocked on the table. It was full of letters, those same honest epistles, which, as empowered by Mr. Sylvester, she had requested Paula to send her from week to week. Some of them were a year old, but she read them all carefully through, while the clock ticked on the shelf and the wind soughed in the chimney. Certain passages she marked, and when she had finished the pile, she took up the letters again and re-read those passages. They were necessarily desultory in their character, but they all had, in her mind at least, a bearing upon the question on hand, and as such I give them to my readers. Oh, Auntie, I have made a friend, a sweet girl friend, who I have reason to hope will henceforth be to me as my other eye and hand. Her name is Stuyvesant, a name, by the way, that always calls up a certain complacent smile on cousin Ona's countenance and she is the daughter of one of the directors of Mr. Sylvester's bank. I met her in a rather curious way. For some reason, Ona had expressed a wish for me to ride horseback. She is rather too large for the exercise herself, but thought it looked well, she said, to see a lady and groom ride from the front of the house. Moreover, it would keep me in colour by establishing my health, so Mr. Sylvester, who denies her nothing, promised us horses and the groom, and as a preparation for acquitting myself with credit, has sent me to one of the finest riding academies in the city. It was here I met Miss Stuyvesant. She is a small, interesting-looking girl, whose chief beauty lies in her expression, which is certainly very charming. I was conscious of a calm and satisfied feeling the moment I saw her. Her eyes, which are raised with a certain appeal to your face, are blue, while her lips, that break into smiles only at rare moments, are rosy and delicately curved. In her riding habit she looks like a child, but when dressed for the street she surprises you with the reserved and womanly air with which she carries her proud head. Altogether she is a sweet study to me, alluring me with her glance, yet awing me by her dainty ladyhood, a ladyhood too unconscious to be affected, and yet so completely a part of her whole delicate being, that you could as soon dissociate the bloom from the rose as the air of high-born reserve from this sweet scion of one of New York's oldest families. I was mounting my horse when our eyes first met, and I never shall forget her look of delighted surprise. Did she recognise in me the friend I now hope to become? Later we were introduced by Mr. Sylvester, who had been so kind as to accompany me that day. The way in which he said to her, This is Paula, proved that I was no new topic of conversation between them, and indeed she afterwards explained to me that she had been forewarned of my arrival 
during an afternoon call at his house. There was in this first interview none of the unnecessary gush which you have so often reprobated as childish. Indeed, Miss Stuyvesant is not a person with whom one would presume to be familiar, nor was it till we had met several times that any acknowledgment was made of the mutual interest with which we found ourselves inspired. Cousin Ona, to whom I had naturally spoken of the little lady, wished me to cultivate her acquaintance more assiduously, but I knew that if I had excited in her the same interest she had awakened in me, this would not be necessary. Our friendship would grow of itself and blossom without any hothouse forcing. And so it did. One day she came to the riding school with her eyes like stars and her cheeks like the oleanders in your sitting room. Her brightness was so contagious I stepped up to her. But she greeted me with almost formal reserve and mounting her horse proceeded to engage in her usual exercise. I was not hurt. I recognized the presence of some thought or feeling which made a barrier around her sensitive nature and duly respected it. Mounting my own horse, I rode around the ring, which is the somewhat limited field of my present equestrian efforts, and waited, for I knew from the looks which she cast me every now and then that the flower of our friendship was outgrowing its sheath and would soon burst into the bud of perfect understanding. At the end of the lesson we approached each other. I do not know how it was done, but we walked home together, or rather I accompanied her to the stoop of her house, and before we parted we had exchanged those words which give emphasis to a sentiment long cherished, but now for the first time avowed. Miss Stuyvesant and I are friends and I feel as though a new stream of enjoyment had opened in my breast. The fact that I still call her by this formal title, instead of her very pretty name of Sicily, proves the nature of the respect she inspires, even in the breasts of her girlish associates. Why is it that I frequently hesitate as I go up the stairs, and look about me with a vague feeling of apprehension? The bronze figure of luxury that adorns the landing wears no semblance of terror to the wildest imagination, and yet I often find myself seized by an inexplicable shudder as I hurry past it, and once I actually looked behind me with the same sensation as if someone had plucked me by the sleeve. It is a folly, for recording which I make my excuses. Cousin Ona has decided that I must never wear colours. Soft greys, my dear, dead blacks and opaque whites are all that you need to bring out the fine contrast of your hair and complexion. The least hint of blue or pink would destroy it. So she says, and so I must believe, for who else has made such a study of the all-important subject of dress? Behold me then, arrayed for my first reception, in a colourless robe of rich silk, to which Ona, after long consideration, allowed me to add some ornaments of plain gold, with which Mr. Sylvester has kindly presented me. But I think more of the people I am going to meet than of anything else, though I enjoy the home feeling which a pretty dress gives me, as well as a violet does its bright blue coat. I have heard a great preacher. What shall I say? At first it seems as if nothing could express my joy and satisfaction. The sapling that is shaken to its roots by the winds of heaven keeps silence, I imagine. But, oh, auntie, if my smallness makes me quake, it also makes me feel. What gates of thought have been opened to me? What shining tracks of inquiry pointed out? I feel as if I had been shown a path where angels walked. Can it be that such words have been uttered every week of my life, and I in ignorance of them? It is like the revelation of the ocean to unaccustomed eyes. 
henceforth small things must seem like pebble stones above which stretch innumerable heavenly vistas it is not so much that new things have been revealed to me as that old things have been made strangely eloquent the voice of a daisy on the hillside the breath of thunder in the mountain gorges the blossoming of a child's smile under its mother's eye the fact that golden portals are opened in every life for the coming and going of the messengers of god all have been made real to me real as the voice of the saviour to his disciples as they walked in the fields or started back awe-stricken from the stupendous vision of the cross it is a solemn thing to see one's humble thoughts caught by the imagination of a great mind and carried on and up into regions you never realized existed i was so burdened with joy that i could not forbear asking mr sylvester if he did not feel as if the whole face of the world had changed since we entered those holy doors he did not respond with the glad yes for which i hoped and though his smile was very kind i could not help wondering what it was that sometimes fell between us like a veil oh auntie how my heart does yearn towards mr sylvester at times as i see him sitting with clouded brow in the midst of so much that ought to charm and enliven him i ask myself if the advantages of wealth compensate for all this care and anxiety but i notice he is much more cheerful now than when i first came Ona says he is in danger of losing the air of melancholy reserve which made him look so distinguished but i think we can spare a little of such doubtful distinguishment for the sake of the smiles with which he now and then indulges us i feel as if a hand had gripped my throat cousin Ona spoke to mr sylvester this morning in a way that made my very heart stand still and yet it was only a simple follow your own judgment mr sylvester but how she said it do these languid women carry venom in their tongues i had always thought she was of too easy a disposition to feel anger or display it but the spring of a serpent is all the deadlier for his long silent basking in the sun oh pardon me for making such a frightful allusion but if you had seen her and heard mr sylvester's sigh as he turned and left the room mr bertram sylvester has awakened my deepest interest his uncle has told me his story which alone of all the things i have heard in this house i do not feel at liberty to repeat and it has aroused in me strange thoughts and very peculiar emotions he is devoted to some one we do not know and the idea surrounds him in my eyes with a sort of halo that you would perhaps call fanciful but which i am nevertheless bound to reverence he does not know that i am acquainted with his story i wish he did and would let me speak the words that rise to my lips whenever i see him or hear him play there are moments when i long to flee back to grotewell it is when cousin ona comes in from shopping with a dozen packages to be opened and commented upon or when mrs fitzgerald has been here or some other of her ultra fashionable acquaintances the atmosphere of the house for hours after either of the above occurrences is too heavy for breathing i have to go away and clear my brain by a brisk walk or a look into nerdler's or Schaus. the panel where cousin ona's picture used to hang has been filled by one of maisonnier's most interesting studies and though i never thought mr sylvester particularly fond of the french style of art he seems very well satisfied with the result i cannot understand how cousin ona can regard the misfortune to her portrait so calmly i think it would break my heart to see a husband look with complacency on any picture no matter how exquisite 
that took the place of my own, especially if, like hers, it was painted in my bridal days. I sometimes wonder if those days are as sacred to the memory of husband and wife as I have always imagined them to be. Why does cousin Ona never speak of Grotewell? And why, if by chance I mention the name, does she drop her eyes and a shadow cross the countenance of Mr. Sylvester? There is a word Mr. Sylvester uses in the most curious way. It is fuss. He calls everything a fuss that, while insignificant in size or character, has power either to irritate or please. A fly is a fuss. So is a dimple in a girl's cheek, or a figure that goes wrong in accounts. I have even heard him call a child that dear little fuss. Bertram unconsciously imitates his uncle in this peculiar mannerism, and is often heard alluding to this or that as a fuss of fusses. Indeed, they say this use of the word is a peculiarity of the Sylvester family. I think from the way Mr. Sylvester spoke yesterday that he must have experienced some dreadful trouble in his life. We were walking in the wards of a hospital, that is, Miss Stuyvesant, Mr. Sylvester and myself, when someone near us gave utterance to the trite expression, Oh, it will heal, but the scar will always remain. That is a common saying, remarked Mr. Sylvester but how true a one no one realises but he who carries the scar. It may be imagination or simply the effect of increased appreciation on my part, but it does seem as if Miss Stuyvesant grew lovelier and more companionable each time that I meet her. She makes me think of a temple in which a holy lamp is burning. Her very silences are eloquent, and yet she is never distrait, but always cheerful and frequently the brightest of the company. But it is a brightness without glitter, a gentle lustre that delights you but never astonishes. I meet many sweet girls in the so-called heartless circles of society, but none like her. She is my white lily on which a moonbeam rests." This house contains a mystery, as owner is pleased to designate the room at the top of the house to which Mr. Sylvester withdraws when he desires to be alone. And indeed it is a sort of Bluebeard's chamber, in that he keeps it rigidly under lock and key, allowing no one to enter it, not even his wife. The servants declare that no one but himself has ever crossed its threshold, but I can scarcely believe that. Owner has not, but there must surely be some trusty person to whom he allots the care of its furniture. Am I only proving myself to be a true member of my sex when I allow that I cannot hinder my own curiosity from hovering about a spot so religiously guarded? Yet what should we see if its doors were thrown open? A study surrounded with books it displeases him to see misplaced, or a luxurious apartment fitted with every appointment necessary to rest and comfort him when he comes home tired from business. I never saw Mr. Sylvester angry till today. By some inadvertence he went downtown without locking the door of his private room and though he returned immediately upon missing the key from his pocket, he was barely in time to prevent cousin owner from invading the spot he has always kept so sacred from intrusion. I was not present, and of course did not hear what was said, but I caught a glimpse of his face as he left the house, and found it quite sufficient to assure me of his dissatisfaction. As for owner, she declares he pulled her back as if she had been daring the plague. I do not expect to find five beautiful wives hanging up there by their necks, concluded she with a forced laugh, but I shall yet see the interior of that room, if only to establish my prerogative as the mistress of this house. 
I do not now feel as if I wished to see it. There is one thing that strikes me as peculiar in Miss Stuyvesant, and that is that as much pleasure as she seems to take in my society when we meet, she never comes to see me in Mr. Sylvester's house. For a long time I wondered over this, but said nothing. But one day, upon receiving a second invitation to visit her, I mentioned the fact as delicately as I could, and was quite distressed to observe how seriously she took the rebuke, if rebuke it could be called. I cannot explain myself, she murmured in some embarrassment, but Mr. Sylvester's house is closed against me. You must not ask me to seek you there, or expect me to do myself the pleasure of attending Mrs. Sylvester's receptions. I cannot. Is that enough for me to say to my dearest friend? I hardly knew what to reply, but finally ventured to inquire if she was restrained by any fact that would make it undignified in me to seek her society and enjoy the pleasures she is continually offering me. And she answered with such a cheerful negative I was quite reassured. And so the matter is settled. Our friendship is to be emancipated from the bonds of etiquette, and I am to enjoy her company whenever I can. Tomorrow we are going to take our first ride in the park. The horses have been bought, and much to Cousin Ona's satisfaction, the groom has been hired. I was told something the other day of a nature so unpleasant that I should not think of repeating it if you had not expressly commanded me to confide to you everything that for any reason produced an effect upon me in my new home. My informant was Sarah, the somewhat gossiping woman whom Ona has about her as seamstress and maid. She said, and she had spoken before I could prevent her, that the way Mrs. Sylvester took on about her mourning at the time of little Geraldine's death was enough to wear out the patience of Job. She even went so far as to tell the dressmaker that if she could not have her dress made to suit her, she would not put on mourning at all. Auntie, can you wonder that Mr. Sylvester looks so bitterly sombre whenever mention is made of his child? He loved it, and its own mother could worry over the fit of a dress while his bereaved heart was breaking. I confess I can never feel the same indulgence towards what I considered the idiosyncrasies of a fashionable beauty again. Her smooth white skin makes me tremble. It has never flushed with delight over the innocent smiles of her first-born. Mr. Sylvester is very polite to Cousin Ona, and seems to yield to her wishes in everything. But if I were she, I think my heart would break over that very politeness. But then she is one who demands formality, even from the persons of her household. I have never seen him stoop for a kiss, or beheld her even so much as lay her hand on his shoulder. But I have observed him wait on her at moments when he was pale from weariness, and she flushed with long twilight reclinings before her sleepy boudoir fire. There are times when I would not exchange my present opportunities for any others which might be afforded me. General Blank dined here today, and what a vision of a great struggle was raised up before me by his few simple words in regard to Gettysburg. I did not know which to admire most, the military bearing and vivid conversation of the great soldier, or the ease and dignity with which Mr. Sylvester met his remarks and answered each glowing sentence. General Blank spoke a few words to me. How gentle these lion-like men can be when they stoop their tall heads to address little children or young women. What a noble-hearted man Mr. Sylvester is! Mr. Turner, in speaking of him the other night, declared there is no one in his congregation who in a quiet way 
does so much for the poor. He is especially interested in young men, said he, and will leave his own affairs at any time to aid or advise them. I knew Mr. Sylvester was kind, but Mr. Turner's enthusiasm was uncommon. He evidently admires Mr. Sylvester as much as everyone else loves him, and he is not alone in this. Almost every day I hear some remark made of a nature complimentary to my benefactor's character or ability. Even Mr. Stuyvesant, who so seldom appears to notice us girls, once interrupted a conversation between Cicely and myself to inquire if Mr. Sylvester was quite well. I thought he looked pale today, remarked he, in his dry but not unkindly way, and then added, he must not get sick, he is too valuable to us. This was a great deal for Mr. Stuyvesant to say, and it caused a visible gratification to Mr. Sylvester when I related it to him in the evening. I had rather satisfy that man than any other I know, declared he. He is of the stern, old-fashioned sort, and it is an honour to anyone to merit his approval. I did not tell him that I had also heard Mr. Stuyvesant observe in a conversation with some business friend of his that Edward Sylvester was the only speculator he knew in whom he felt implicit confidence. Somehow it always gives me an uncomfortable feeling to hear Mr. Sylvester alluded to as a speculator. Besides, since he has entered the bank, he has, I am told, entirely restricted himself to what are called legitimate operations. Mr. Sylvester came home with a dreadful look on his face today. We were standing in the hall at the time the door opened, and he went by us without a nod, almost as if he did not see us. Even Ona was startled, and stood gazing after him with an anxiety such as I had never observed in her before while I was conscious of that sick feeling I have sometimes experienced when he came upon me suddenly from his small room above, or paused in the midst of the gayest talk to ask me some question that was wholly irrelevant and most frequently sad. He has met with some heavy loss, murmured his wife, glancing down the handsome parlours with a look such as a mother might bestow upon the face of a sick child but I was sure she had not sounded his trouble, and in my impetuosity was about to fly to his side when we saw him pause before the image of luxury that stands on the stair, look at it for a moment with a strange intentness, then suddenly, and with a gesture of irrepressible passion, lift his arm as if he would fell it from its place. The action was so startling Ona clutched my sleeve in terror, but he passed on, and in another moment we heard him shut the door of his room. Would he be down to dinner? That was the next question. Ona thought not. I did not dare to think. Nevertheless, it was a great relief to me when I saw him enter the dining room with that set, immovable look he sometimes wears when Ona begins one of her long and rambling streams of fashionable gossip. It is nothing, flashed from his wife's eyes to mine, and she lapsed at once into her most graceful self, but she nevertheless hastened her meal, and I was quite prepared to observe her follow him, as with the polite excuse of weariness he left the table before dessert. I could not hear what she asked him, but his answer came distinctly to my ears from the midst of the library to which they had withdrawn. It is nothing in which you have an interest, owner. Thank heaven you do not always know the price with which the splendours you so love are bought. And she did not cry out, Oh, never pay such a price for any joy of mine. Sooner than cost you so dear, I would live on crusts and dwell in a garret. No. She kept silence, and when in a few minutes later I joined her in the library, it was to find on her usually placid lips a thin, cool smile that struck like ice to my heart and made it impossible for me to speak. 
but the hardest trial of the day was to hear mr sylvester come in at eleven o'clock he went out again immediately after dinner and go upstairs without giving me my usual good night it was such a grief to me i could not keep still but hurried to the foot of the stairs in the hopes he would yet remember me and come back but instead of that he no sooner saw me than he threw out his hand almost as if he would push me back and hastened on up the whole winding flight till he reached the refuge of that mysterious room of his at the top of the house i could not go back to ona after that she had been to make a call somewhere with a young gentleman friend of hers yes on this very night had been to make a call but i took advantage of the late hour to retire to my own room where for a long time i lay awake listening for his descending step and seeing as in a vision the startling picture of his lifted arm raised against the unconscious piece of bronze on the stair henceforth that statue will possess for me a still more dreadful significance it is the twenty fifth of february why should i feel as if i must be sure of the exact date before i slept the next extract followed close on this and was the last which miss belinda read mr sylvester seems to have recovered from his late anxiety he does not shrink from me any more with that half bitter half sad expression that has so long troubled and bewildered me but draws me to his side and sits listening to my talk until i feel as if i were really of some comfort to this great and able man ona does not notice the change she is all absorbed in preparing for the visit to washington which mr sylvester has promised her miss belinda calmly folded up the letters and locked them again in the little mahogany box after which she covered up the embers and quietly went to bed but next morning a letter was dispatched to mr sylvester which ran thus dear mr sylvester for the present at least you may keep paula with you but i am not ready to say that i think it would be for her best good to be received and acknowledged as your daughter yet hoping you will appreciate the motives that actuate this decision i remain respectfully yours belinda ann walton end of chapter fourteen Chapter fifteen of the Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An adventure, or something more. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Wordsworth. Ophelia. What means this, my lord? Hamlet. Marry, this is the Mitching Maleko. It means mischief. Hamlet. A ride in the Central Park is an everyday matter to most people. It signifies an indolent bowling over a smooth road, all alive with the glitter of passing equipages, waving ribbons and fluttering plumes, and brightened now and then by the sight of a well-known face amid the general rush of old and young, plain and handsome, sad and gay countenances that flash by you in one long and brilliant procession. But to Paula and her friend Miss Stuyvesant, starting out in the early freshness of a fair April morning, it meant new life, reawakening joy, the sparkle of young leaves just loosed from the bonds of winter, the sweetness and promise of spring airs, and all the budding glory of a new year with its summer of countless roses and its autumn of incalculable glories not the twitter of a bird was lost to them not the smile of an opening flower not the welcome of a waving branch youth joy and innocence lived in their hearts and showed them nothing in the mirror of nature 
that was not equally young, joyous and innocent. Then they were alone, or sufficiently so. The stray wanderers whom they met sitting under the flowering trees were equally with themselves lovers of nature, or they would not be seated in converse with it at this early hour, while the laugh of little children, startled from their play by the prance of their high-stepping horses, was only another expression of the sweet but unexpressed delight that breathed in all the radiant atmosphere. We are two birds who have escaped thraldom and are taking our first flight into our natural ether, cried Miss Stuyvesant gaily. We are two pioneers lit by the spirit of adventure who have left the cosy hearth of wintry fires to explore the domains of the Frost King and lo, we have come upon a paradise of bloom and colour, responded the ringing voice of Paula. I feel as if I could mount that little white cloud we see over there, continued Cicely, with a quick lively wave of her whip. I wonder how Dandy would enjoy an Empyrean journey. From the haughty bend of his neck, I should say he was quite satisfied with his present condition, but perhaps his chief pride is due to the mistress he carries. Are you attempting to vie with Mr. Williams, Paula? Mr. Williams was the meek-eyed, fair-complexioned gentleman whose predilection for compliment was just then a subject of talk in fashionable circles. Only so far as my admiration goes of the most charming lady I see this morning. But who is this? Miss Stuyvesant looked up. Ah, that is someone with whom there is very little danger of your falling in love. Paula blushed. The gentleman approaching them upon horseback was conspicuous for long side whiskers of a decidedly auburn tinge. His name is, but she had not time to finish, for the gentleman, with a glance of astonished delight at Paula, bowed to the speaker with a liveliness and grace that demanded some recognition. Instantly he drew rein. Do I behold Miss Stuyvesant among the nymphs? cried he, in those ringing pleasant tones that at once predispose you towards their possessor. If you allude to my friend Miss Fairchild, you certainly do, Mr. Ensign, the wicked little lady rejoined with a waving of her usual ceremony that astonished Paula. Mr. Ensign bestowed upon them his most courtly bow, but the flush that mounted to his brow, making his face one red, as certain of his friends were malicious enough to observe on similar occasions, indicated that he had been taken a little more at his word than perhaps suited even one of his easy and proverbially careless temperament. Miss Fairchild will understand that I am not a Harvey Williams, at least before an introduction, said he, with something like seriousness. But at this allusion to the gentleman, whose name had been upon their lips but a moment before, both ladies laughed outright. I have just been accused of attempting the role of that gentleman myself, exclaimed Paula. If the fresh morning air will persist in painting such roses on ladies' cheeks, continued she, with a loving look at her pretty companion, what can one be expected to do? Admire, quoth the red-bannered cavalier, with a glance, however, at the beautiful speaker, instead of the demure little Cicely at her side. Miss Stuyvesant perceived this look, and a curious smile disturbed the corners of her rosy lips. What a fortunate man to be able to do the right thing at the right time, laughed she, gaily touching up her horse that was beginning to show symptoms of restlessness. If Miss Stuyvesant will put that in the future tense, and then assure us she has been among the prophets, I should be singularly obliged, said he, with a touch of his hat and a smiling look at Paula that was at once manly and gentle, careless and yet respectful. Ah, life is too bright for prophecies this morning. The moment is enough. Is it, Miss Fairchild? queried Mr. Ensign, looking back over his shoulder. She turned just a bit of her cheek towards him. What Miss Stuyvesant declares to be true, that am I bound to believe, said she, and with the least little ripple of a laugh, 
rode on. "'It is a pity you have such a dislike for whiskers,' Cicely presently remarked, with an air of great gravity. Paula gave a start, and cast a glance of reproach at her companion. "'I did not notice his whiskers after the first word or two, said she, fixing her eyes on a turn of the road before them. "'Such cheerfulness is infectious. I was merry before, but now I feel as if I had been bathed in sunshine.' Cicely's eyes flashed wide with surprise, and her face grew serious in earnest. "'Mr. Ensign is a delightful companion,' observed she. "'A room is always brighter for his entrance, and with all that, he is the only young man I know who, having come into a large fortune, feels any of the responsibilities of his position. The sunshine is the result of a good heart and pure living.' and that is what makes it infectious i suppose let us canter said paula and so the glad young things swept on life breaking in bubbles around them and rippling away into unfathomable wells of feeling in one of their pure hearts at least suddenly a hand seemed to swoop from heaven and dash them both back in dismay they had reached one of those places where the footpath crosses the equestrian, and they had run over and thrown down a little child. "'Oh, heaven!' cried Paula, leaping from her horse. "'I had rather been killed myself.' The groom rode up, and she bent anxiously over the child. It was a boy of some seven or eight years, whose misfortune— he was lame, as the little crutch fallen at his side sufficiently denoted, made appear much younger. He had been struck on his arm, and was moaning with pain, but did not seem to be otherwise hurt. "'Are you alone?' cried Paula, lifting his head on her arm, and glancing hurriedly about. The little fellow raised his heavy lids, and for a moment stared into her face, with eyes so deeply blue and beautiful they almost startled her then with an effort pointed down the path saying dad's over there in the long tunnel talking to someone tell him i got hurt i want dad she gently lifted him to his feet and led him out of the road into the apparently deserted path where she made him sit down i am going to find his father said paula to cicely I will be back in a moment. But wait, you shall not go alone, authoritatively exclaimed that little damsel, leaping in her turn to the ground. Where does he say his father is? In the tunnel, by which I suppose he means that long passage under the bridge over there. Holding up the skirts of their riding habits in their trembling right hands, they hurried forward. Suddenly they both paused. A woman had crossed their path, a woman whom to look at but once was to remember with ghastly shrinking for a lifetime. She was wrapped in a long and ragged cloak, and her eyes, startling in their blackness, were fixed upon the pain-drawn countenance of the poor little hurt boy behind them, with a gleam whose feverish hatred and deep malignant enjoyment of his very evident sufferings was like a revelation from the lowest pit to the two innocent-minded girls hastening forward on their errand of mercy is he much hurt gasped the woman in an ineffectual effort to conceal the evil nature of her interest do you think he will die with a shrill lingering emphasis on the last word as if she longed to roll it like a sweet morsel under her tongue who are you asked cicely shrinking to one side with dilated eyes fixed on the woman's hardened countenance and the white too white hand with which she had pointed as she spoke of the child are you his mother queried paula paling at the thought but keeping her ground with an air of unconscious authority his mother shrieked the woman hugging herself in her long cloak and laughing with fiendish sarcasm i look like his mother don't i his eyes did you notice his eyes they are just like mine aren't they and his body poor wheezen little thing 
looks as if it had drawn sustenance from mine don't it his mother oh heaven nothing like the suppressed force of this invocation seething as it was with the worst passions of a depraved human nature had ever startled those ears before clasping cicely by the hand she called out to the groom behind them guard that child as you would your life and then flashing upon the wretched creature before her with all the force of her aroused nature she exclaimed if you are not his mother move aside and let us pass we are in search of assistance for an instant the woman stood awestruck before this vision of maidenly beauty and indignation then she laughed and cried out with shrill emphasis when next you look like that go to your mirror and when you see the image it reflects say to yourself so once looked the woman who defied me in the park with a quick shudder and a feeling as if the noisome cloak of this degraded being had somehow been dropped upon her own fair and spotless shoulders paula clasped the hand of cicely more tightly in her own and rushed with her down the steps that led into the underground passage towards which they had been directed there were but two persons in it when they entered a short thick-set man and another man of a slighter and more gentlemanly build they were engaged in talking and the latter was bringing down his right hand upon the palm of his left with a gesture almost foreign in its expressive energy i tell you declared he with a voice that while low reverberated through the hollow vault above him with strange intensity i tell you i've got my grip on a certain rich man in this city and if you will only wait you shall see strange things i don't know his name and i don't know his face but i do know what he has done and a thousand dollars down couldn't buy the knowledge of me but if you don't know his name and don't know his face how in the name of all that's mischievous are you going to know your man leave that to me if i once meet him and hear him talk one more rich man goes down and one more poor devil goes up or i've not the wit that starvation usually teaches the nature of these sentences together with the various manifestations of interest with which they were received had for a moment deterred the two girls in their hurried advance but now they put away every thought save that of the poor little creature awaiting his dad and lifting up her voice paula said are either of you the father of a little lame lad instantly and before she could conclude the taller of the two who had also been the chief speaker in the above conversation turned and she saw his hand begrimed though it was with dirt and dark with many a disgraceful trick go to his heart in a gesture too natural to be anything but involuntary is he hurt gasped he but in how different a tone from that of the woman who had used the same words a few minutes before then seeing that the persons who addressed him were ladies and one of them at least a very beautiful one took off his hat with an easy action that together with what they had heard proved him to be one of that most dangerous class among us a gentleman who has gone thoroughly and irretrievably to the bad i am afraid he is sir said paula he was attempting to cross the road and a horse advancing hurriedly struck him she had not courage to say her horse in face of the white and trembling dismay that seized him at these words where is he cried he where's my poor boy and he bounded up the steps his hat still in his hand his long unkempt locks flying and his whole form expressive of the utmost alarm down by the carriage road called out paula finding it impossible for them to keep up with such haste but is he much injured cried a smooth voice at their side they turned it was the short thick-set man who had been the other's companion in the conversation above recorded we trust not answered cicely his arm received the blow and he suffers very much but we hope it is not serious 
and they hurried on. They found the father seated on the grass, holding the little fellow in his arms. The look on his once handsome but now thoroughly corrupt and dissipated face made their hearts melt within them. However wicked he might be, and that sly treacherous eye, that false impudent lip, that settling of the whole face into the mould which vice applies to all her votaries, left no doubt of his complete depravity. He dearly loved his child, and love, no matter how it is expressed, or in what garb it appears, is a sacred and beautiful thing, and ennobles for the time being any creature who displays it. "'Twas a hard knock-up, Dad," came from the white lips of the child, as he felt his father's trembling hand feel up and down his arm. "'But I guess the little feller can stand it.' Little Fella was evidently the name by which his father was accustomed to address him. There are no bones broken, said the father. To be lame and maimed too would be... He did not finish, for a delicately gloved hand was here laid on his sleeve, and a gentle voice whispered, Money cannot pay for an injury like that, but please accept this, and Paula thrust a purse into his hand. He clutched it eagerly, but at her next request that he should tell her where he lived, that they might inquire after the boy, he shook his head with a return of his old emphasis. The haunts of bats and jackals are not for ladies. Then, as he caught sight of her pitiful face bending in farewell over the little urchin, some remembrance, perhaps, of the days when he had a right to stoop to the ear of beautiful women, and walk unrebuked at their side, returned to him from the past, and respectfully lowering his voice, he asked her name. She gave it, and he seemed to lay it away in his mind. Then, as the ladies turned to remount their horses, rose and began carrying the little fellow off. As he vanished in the turn of the path that led towards the main entrance, they perceived a tall, dark figure arise from a seat in the distance and stand looking after him with a leer on its face and a malicious hugging of itself in a long black cloak that proclaimed her to be the same ominous being who had before so grievously startled them end of chapter 15《ハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハMrs. Sylvester, reclining on the palest of blue couches in the slanting sunlight of an April afternoon, is a study for a painter. Not that such inspiring loveliness breathed from her person, conspicuous as it was for its rich and indolent grace, but because in every attitude of her large and well-formed limbs, in every raise of the thick white lids from eyes whose natural brightness was obscured by the mist of aimless fancies, she presented such an embodiment of luxurious ease, one might almost imagine they were gazing upon the favourite sultana of some eastern court, or, to be for once poetical as the subject demands, a full-blown Egyptian lotus floating in hushed enjoyment on the placid waters of its native stream. Indeed, for all the blonde character of her beauty, there was certainly something oriental about the physique of this favoured child of fortune. Had the tint of her skin been richened to a magnolia bloom, instead of reminding you of that description accorded to the complexion of one of Napoleon's sisters, that it looked like white satin seen through pink glass, she would have passed in any eastern market for a rare specimen of Circassian beauty. 
but mr sylvester coming home fatigued and harassed cared little for circassian beauties or oriental odalisques it was a welcome that he desired and such refreshment as a quick eye and ready hand can bestow when guided by a tender and loving heart or so thought the watchful paula as she glided from her room at the sound of his step in the hall and met him coming weary and disheartened from the side of ona's couch the sight of her revived him at once well little one what have you been doing to-day instantly a shade fell over her countenance i hardly know how to tell you it has been a day of great experiences to me i am literally shaken with them i have been wanting to talk to ona about what i have seen and heard but thought i had best wait till you came home for i could not repeat the story twice what you look pale nothing has happened to frighten you i hope exclaimed he leading her back to ona's side who stirred a little and presently deigned to take an upright position i do not know if it is fear or horror cried paula shuddering i have seen a fearful woman but first i ought to tell you that i took a ride with miss stuyvesant in the park this morning yes and persisted in going for that lady on horseback instead of sending the groom after her and all starting from the front of our house murmured mrs sylvester with lazy chagrin paula smiled but otherwise took no notice of this standing topic of disagreement it was a beautiful day she proceeded and we enjoyed it very much but we were so unfortunate as to run over a little boy at that place where the equestrian road crosses the footpath a lame child mr sylvester who could not get out of our way poor too with a ragged jacket on which seemed to make it all the worse ona gave a shrug with her white shoulders that seemed to question this did you injure him very much queried she with a show of interest not sufficient however to impair her curiosity as to the cut of one of her nails i cannot say his little arm was struck and when i went to pick him up he lay back in my lap and moaned till i thought my heart would break but that was not the worst that happened as we went hurrying up the walk to find the child's father we were met by a woman wrapped in a black cloak whose long and greasy folds seemed like the symbol of her own untold depravity her glance as she encountered the child writhing in pain at my feet made my heart stand still it was more than malignant it was actually fiendish is he hurt she asked and it seemed as if she gloated over the question she evidently longed to hear that he was longed to be told that he would die and when i inquired if she was his mother she broke into a string of laughter that seemed to darken the daylight his mother oh yes we look alike don't we she exclaimed pointing with a mocking gesture frightful to see first at his eyes which were very blue and beautiful and then at her own which were dark as evil thoughts could make them i never saw anything so dreadful malignancy and towards a little lame child what could be more horrible mr sylvester and his wife exchanged looks then the former asked did she follow you paula no after telling me that i but i cannot repeat what she said exclaimed the young girl with a quick shudder since i came home she musingly continued i have looked and looked at my face in the glass but i cannot believe that what she declared is true there is no similarity between us could never have been any i will not have it that she ever saw in all the days of her life such a picture as that in her glass and with a sudden gesture paula started up and pointed to herself as she stood reflected in one of the tall mirrors with which ona's boudoir abounded and did she dare to make any comparison between you and her own degraded self exclaimed mr sylvester with a glance at the exquisite vision of pure girlhood thus doubly presented to his notice yes what i am she was once or so she said and it may be true 
i have never suffered sorrow or experienced wrong and cannot measure their power to carve the human face with such lines as i beheld on that woman's countenance to-day but do not let us talk of her any more she left us at last and we found the child's father mr sylvester she suddenly asked are there to be found in this city men occupying honourable positions and as such highly esteemed who like damocles of old may be said to sit under the constant terror of a falling sword in the shape of some possible disclosure that if made would ruin their position before the world for ever mr sylvester started as if he had been shot paula cried he and instantly was silent again he did not look at his wife but if he had he would have perceived that even her fair skin was capable of blanching to a yet more startling whiteness and that her sleepy eyes could flash open with something like expression in their lazy depths i mean dreamily continued paula absorbed in her own remembrance that if what we overheard said by the father of that child to-day is true some one of our prominent men whose life is not all it appears is standing on the verge of possible exposure and shame that a hound is on his track in the form of a starving man and that sooner or later he will have to pay the price of an unprincipled creature's silence or fall into public discredit like some others of whom we have lately read then as silence filled the room she added it makes me tremble to think that a man of means and seeming honour should be placed in such a position but worse still that we may know such a one and be ignorant of his misery and his shame it is getting time for me to dress murmured ona sinking back on her pillow and speaking in her most languid tone of voice could you not hasten your story a little paula but mr sylvester with a hurried glance at the closing eyes of his wife requested on the contrary that she would explain herself more definitely ona will pardon the delay said he with a set strained politeness that called up the least little quiver of suppressed sarcasm about the rosy infantile lips that he evidently did not consider it worth his while to notice but that is all said paula however she repeated as nearly as she could just what the boy's father had said at the conclusion mr sylvester rose what kind of a looking man was he said that gentleman as he crossed to the window well as nearly as i can describe he was tall dark and seedy with a shock of black hair and a pair of black whiskers that floated on the wind as he walked he was evidently of the order of decayed gentlemen and his manner of talking especially in the profuse use he made of his arms and hands was decidedly foreign yet his speech was pure and without accent mr sylvester's face as he asked the next question was comparatively cheerful was the other man with whom he was talking as dark and foreign as himself oh no he was round and jovial a little too insinuating perhaps in his way of speaking to ladies but otherwise a well enough appearing man mr sylvester bowed and looked at his watch why do gentlemen always consult their watches even in the face of the clock owner you are right said he it is time you were dressing for dinner and concluding with a word or two of sympathy as to the peculiar nature of paulus adventures as he called them he hastened from the room and proceeded to his little refuge above he has not asked me what became of the child thought paula with a certain pang of surprise i expected him to say shall we not try and see the little fellow paula if only to allow me to explain that the child's father would not tell me where they lived but the later affair has evidently put the child out of his head and indeed it is only natural that a business man should be more interested in such a fact as i have related than in the sprained arm of a wretched creature's little feller and she turned to assist ona who had arisen from her couch 
and was now absorbed in the intricacies of an uncommonly elaborate toilet. "'Those men did not mention any names,' suddenly queried that lady, looking with an expression of careful anxiety at the twist of her back hair in the small hand mirror she held over her shoulder. "'No,' said Paula, dropping a red rose into the blonde locks she was so carefully arranging. He expressly said he did not know the name of the person to whom he alluded. It was a strange conversation for me to overhear, was it not? she remarked, happy to have interested her cousin in anything out of the domains of fashion. I don't know, certainly, of course, returned Mrs. Sylvester with some incoherence. Do you think red looks as well with this black as the lavender would do? she rambled on in her lightest tone pulling out a box of feathers paula gave her a little wistful glance of disappointment and decided in favour of the lavender i am bound to look well to-night if i never do so again said ona they were all going to a public reception at which a foreign lord was expected to be present how fortunate i am to have a perfect little hairdresser in my own family without being obliged to send for some gossipy, fussy old madam with her stories of how such and such a one looked when dressed for the Grand Duke's ball, or how Mrs. So-and-so always gave her more than her price because she rolled up puffs so exquisitely. And stopping to aid the deft girl in substituting the lavender feather for the red rose in her hair, she forgot to ask any more questions. Ona, remarked her husband, coming into the room on his way down to dinner. Mrs. Sylvester never dined when she was going to any grand entertainment. It made her look flushed, she said. I am not in the habit of troubling you about your family matters, but have you heard from your father of late? Mrs. Sylvester turned from her jewel casket and calmly surveyed his face. It was fixed and formal, the face he turned to his servants, and sometimes to his wife. No, said she, with a light little gesture, as though she were speaking of the most trivial matter. In one respect at least, papa is like an angel. His visits are few and far between. Mr. Sylvester's eyebrows drew heavily together. For a man with a smile of strange sweetness, he could sometimes look very forbidding. When was he here last? he inquired in a tone more commanding than he knew. She did not appear to resent it. Let me see, mused she. When was it I lost my diamond earring? Oh, I remember. It was on the eve of New Year's Day a year ago. I recollect because I had to wear pearls with my garnet brocade, she pettishly sighed. And Papa came the next week, after you had given me the money for a new pair. I have reason to remember that, for not a dollar did he leave me. Ona, exclaimed her husband, shrinking back in uncontrollable surprise, while his eyes flashed inquiringly to her ears, in which two noble diamonds were brilliantly shining. Oh, she cried, just raising one snowy hand to those sparkling ornaments, while a faint blush, the existence of which he had sometimes doubted, swept over her careless face. I was enabled to procure them in time, but for a whole two months I had to go without diamonds. She did not say that she had bartered her wedding jewels to make up the sum she needed, but he may have understood that without being told. And that is the last time you have seen him? He held her eyes with his. She could not look away. The very last, sir, strange to say. His glance shifted from her face and he turned with a bow towards the door. "'May I ask,' she slowly inquired as he moved across the floor, "'what is the reason of this sudden interest in poor papa?' "'Certainly,' said he, pausing and looking back, not without some emotion of pity in his glance. "'I am sometimes struck with a sense of the duty I owe you "'in helping you to bear the burden of certain secret responsibilities.' which I fear may sometimes prove too heavy for you. She gave a little rippling laugh that only sounded hollow to the image listening in the glass. You choose strange times in which to be struck, 
said she, holding up two dresses for his inspection, with a lift of her brows evidently meant as an inquiry as to which he thought the most becoming. "'Conscience is the chooser, not I,' declared he, for once allowing himself to ignore the weighty question of dress thus propounded. His wife gave a little toss of her head, and he left the room. "'I should like Edward very much,' murmured she, in a burst of confidence to her own reflection in the glass, "'if only he would not bother himself so much about that same disagreeable conscience.' "'You look unhappy,' said Mr. Sylvester to Paula, as they came from the dining-room. "'Have the adventures of the day made such an impression upon you "'that you will not be able to enjoy the evening's festivities?' She lifted her face, and the quick smile came. "'I do not like to see your brow so clouded,' continued he, "'smoothing his own to meet her searching eye. "'Smiles should sit on the lips of youth, or else why are they so rosy? Would you have me smile in face of my first glimpse of wickedness? asked she, but in a gentle tone that robbed her words of half their reproach. You must remember that I have had but little experience with the world. I have lived all my life in a town of wholesome virtues, and while here I have been kept from contact with anything low or base. I have never known vice, and now, all in a moment, I feel as if I have been bathed in it. He took her by the hand, and drew her gently towards him. Does your whole being recoil so from evil, my Paula? What will you do in this wicked world? What will you say to the sinner when you meet him, as you must? I don't know. It's a problem I have never been brought to consider. I feel as if launched on a dismal sea for which I have neither chart nor compass. Life was so joyous to me this morning. A flush swept over her cheek, but he did not notice it. I held, or seemed to hold, a cup of white wine in my hand, but suddenly, as I looked at it, it turned black, and... Ah, the outreach, the dismal breaking away of thought into the unfathomable that lies in the pause of an and. And do you refuse to drink a cup across which has fallen a shadow? murmured Mr. Sylvester, his eyes fixed on her face. The inevitable shadow of that great mass of human frailty and woe which has been accumulating from the foundation of the world. No, no, I cannot and retain my humanity. If there is such evil in the world, its pressure must drive it across the path of innocence. And you accept the cup? I must, but oh my vanished beliefs! This morning the wine of my life was pure and white. Now it is black and befouled. What will make it clean again? With a sigh, Mr. Sylvester dropped her hand and turned towards the mantelpiece. It was April, as I have said, and there was no fire in the grate, but he posed his foot on the fender and looked sadly down at the empty hearthstone. Paula, said he, after a space of pregnant silence, it had to come. The veil of the temple must be rent in every life. Evil is too near us all for us to tread long upon the flowers without starting up the adders that hide beneath them. You had to have your first look into the cells of darkness, and perhaps it is best you had it here and now. The deeps are for men's eyes as well as the starry heavens. Yes, yes. There are some persons, he went on slowly, you know them, who tread the ways of life with their eyelids closed to everything but the strip of velvet lawn on which they choose to walk. Earth's sighs and deep-drawn groans are nothing to them. The world may swing on its way to perdition, so long as their pathway feels soft, they neither heed nor care. But you do not desire to be one of these, Paula. With your great soul and your strong heart, you would not ask to sit in a flowery maze while the rest of the world went sliding on and down into wells of destruction, 
you might have made pools of healing by the touch of your womanly sympathy. No, no. I cannot tell you, I dare not tell you, he went on in a strange pleading voice that tore at the very roots of her heart and wrung in her memory for ever. What evil underlies the whole strata of life? At home and abroad, on our hearthstones and within our offices, the mocking devil sits. You can scarcely walk a block, my little one, without encountering a man or brushing against the dress of a woman across whose soul the black shadow lies heavier than any words of his or hers could tell. What the man you saw today said of one unhappy being in this city is true, God help us all, of many. Dark spots are easier acquired than blotted out, my Paula. In business as in society, one needs to carry the white shield of a noble purpose or a self-forgetting love to escape the dripping of the deadly upas tree that branches above all humanity. I have walked its ways, my darling, and I know of what I speak. Your white robe is spotless, but... Oh, there is where the pain comes in, she cried. There, just there, is where the dagger strikes. She says she was once like me. Oh, could any temptation, any suffering, any wrong or misfortune that might befall me ever bring me to where she is? If it could... Paula! This time his voice came authoritatively. You are making too much of a frenzied woman's impulsive exclamation. To her darkened and despairing eyes, any young woman of a similar style of beauty would have called forth the same remark. It was a sign that she was not entirely given up to evil, that she could remember her youth. Instead of feeling contaminated by her words, you ought to feel that unconsciously to yourself, your fresh young countenance with its innocent eyes did an angel's work today. They made her recall what she was in the days of her own innocence. And who can tell what may follow such a recollection? Oh, Mr. Sylvester, said she, you fill me with shame. If I could think that. You can. Nothing appeals to the heart of crime like the glance of perfect innocence. If evil walks the world, God's ministers walk it also, and none can tell in what glance of the eye or what touch of the hand that ministry will speak. It was her turn now to take his hand in hers. Oh, how good, how thoughtful you are. You have comforted me and you have taught me. I thank you very much. With a look she did not perceive, he drew his hand away. I am glad I have helped you, Paula. There is but one thing more to say, and this I would emphasize with every saddened look you have ever met in all your life. Great sins make great sufferers. Side by side came the two dreadful powers of vice and retribution into the world, and side by side will they keep till they sink at last into the awful deeps of the bottomless pit. When you turn your back on a man who has committed a crime, one more door shuts in his darkened spirit. The tears were falling from Paula's eyes now. He looked at them with strange wistfulness, and involuntarily his hand rose to her head, smoothing her locks with fatherly touches. Do not think, said he, that I would lessen by a hair's breadth your hatred of evil. I can more easily bear to see the shadow upon your cup of joy than upon the banner of truth you carry. These eyes must lose none of their inner light in glancing compassionately on your fellow men. Only remember that divinity itself has stooped to rescue, and let the thought make your contact with weary, wicked-hearted humanity a little less trying and a little more hopeful to you. And now, my dear, that is enough of serious talk for today. We are bound for a reception, you know, and it is time we were dressing. 
do you want me to tell you a secret asked he in a light mysterious tone as he saw her eyes still filling she glanced up with sudden interest i know it is treason resumed he i am fully aware of the grave nature of my offence but paula i hate all public receptions and shall only be able to enjoy myself to-night just so much as i see that you are doing so life has its dark portals and its bright ones this is one that you must enter with your most brilliant smiles and they shall not be lacking said she when a treasure box of thought is given us we do not open it and scatter its contents abroad but lay it away where the heart keeps its secrets to be opened in the hush of night when we are alone with our own souls and god he smiled and she moved towards the door none the less do we carry with us wherever we go the remembrance of our hidden treasure she smilingly added looking back upon him from the stair and again as upon the first night of her entrance into the house did he stand below and watch her as she softly went up her lovely face flashing one moment against the dark background of the luxurious bronze towering from the platform behind then glowing with faint and fainter lustre as the distance widened between them and she vanished in the regions above she did not see the toss of his arm with which he threw off the burden that rested upon his soul End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of the sword of damocles by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain grave and gay no scandal about queen elizabeth i hope sheridan stands scotland where it did macbeth who is that talking with miss stuyvesant asked mr sylvester approaching his wife during one of the lulls that will fall at times upon vast assemblies mrs sylvester followed the direction of his glance and immediately responded oh that is mr ensign one of the best parti of the season he evidently knows where to pay his court i inquired because he has just requested me to honour him with a formal introduction to paula indeed then oblige him by all means it would be a great match for her to say nothing of his wealth he is au ton and his red whiskers will not look badly beside paula's dark hair mr sylvester frowned then sighed but in a few minutes paula observed him approaching with mr ensign at once her hitherto pale cheek flushed but the young gentleman did not seem to object to that and after the formal introduction which he had sought was over he exclaimed in his own bright ringing tones the fates have surely forgotten their usual role of unpropitiousness i did not dare hope to meet you here to-night miss fairchild was the ride all that your fancy painted oh said she speaking very low and glancing around do not allude to it here we had an adventure shortly after you parted from us an adventure and no cavalier at your side if i could but have known was it so serious he inquired in a moment seeing her look grave ask miss stuyvesant said she i cannot talk about it any more to-night besides the music carries off one's thoughts it is like a joyous breeze that whirls away the thistle-down whether it will or no he gave her a short quick look grave enough in its way but responded with his usual graceful humour the thistle-down is too vicious a sprite to be beguiled away so easily if i were to give my opinion on the subject i should say there was method in its madness if you have been brought up in the country as i suspect from your remark you must know that the white floating ball is not as harmless as it would lead you to imagine it is a meddlesome nobody that's what it is and like some country gossips i know launches forth from a pure love of mischief
to establish his prickers in his neighbour's field. His? I thought it must be feminine at least to fulfil the conditions you mention. A male gossip? Oh, fie! I shall never have patience with a thistle ball after this. Well, laughed he, I did start with the intention of making it feminine, but I caught a glimpse of your eyes and lost my courage. I did what I could, added he with a mirthful glance. So do the thistles, cried she. Then, while both voices joined in a merry laugh, she continued, But where have we strayed? For a moment it seemed as if we were on the hills at Grotewell. I could almost see the blue sky. And I, said he, with his eyes on her face, I am sure the brooks bubbled. I distinctly heard a bird singing. It was a whippoorwill. But my name is Clarence? And here, both being young and without a care in the world, they laughed again. And the crowded, perfumed room seemed to freshen as with a whiff of mountain air. You love the country, Miss Fairchild? Yes, and her smile was the reflection of the summer lands that arose before her at the word. With the right side of my heart do I love the spot where nature speaks and man is dumb. And with the left? I love the place where great men congregate to face their destiny and control it. The latter is the deeper love, said he. She nodded her head and then said, I need both to make me happy. Sometimes as I walk these city streets, I feel as if my very longing to escape to the heart of the hills would carry me there. I remember when I was a child, I was one day running through a meadow, when suddenly a whole flock of birds flew up from the grass and surrounded my head. I was not sure but what I should be caught up and carried away by the force of their flight. And when they rose to mid-heaven, something in my breast seemed to follow them. So it is often with me here, only that it is the rush of my thoughts that threatens such a Hegira. Yet if I were to be transported to my native hills, I know I should long to be back again. The mountain lassie has wandered into the courts of the king. The perfume of palaces is not easily forgotten. Her eye turned towards Mr. Sylvester, standing near them, upright and firm, talking to a group of attentive gentlemen, every one of whom boasted a name of more than local celebrity. Without a royal heart to govern, there would be no palace, said she, and blushed under a sudden sense of the possible interpretation he might give to her words, till the rose in her hand looked pallid. But he had followed her glance and understood her better than she thought. And Mr. Sylvester has such a heart, so a hundred good fellows have told me. You are fortunate to see the city from the loophole of such a home as his. It is more than a loophole, said she. Of that I shall never be satisfied till I see it. And being content with the look he received, he took her on his arm and led her into the midst of the dancers. Meanwhile, in a certain corner not far off, two gentlemen were talking. Sylvester shows off well tonight. He always does. With such a figure as that, a man needs but to enter a room to make himself felt. But then he's a good talker, too. Ever heard him speak? No. Fine voice, true snap, right ring, great favourite at elections. The fact is, Sylvester is a remarkable man. Hmm, ha, ah, so I should judge. And so fortunate. He has never been known to run foul in a great operation. Put your money in his hand and, phew, your fortune is as good as made. The other, a rich man, connected heavily with the mining business in Colorado, smiled with that bland overflow of the whole countenance, which is sometimes seen in large men of great self-importance. It's a pity he's gone out of Wall Street, continued his companion. The younger fry feel now something like a flock of sheep that has lost its bellwether. They straggle, eh? returned his portly friend with an increase of his smile that was not altogether pleasant. So, Sylvester has left Wall Street. 
He closed his last enterprise two weeks before accepting the presidency of the Madison Bank. Stuyvesant is down on speculation, and, well, it looks better, you know. The Madison Bank is an old institution, and Sylvester is ambitious. There'll be no reckless handling of funds there. No. What was there in that no that made the other look up? I'm not acquainted with Sylvester myself. Has he much family? A wife. There she is, that handsome woman talking with Dittman. And a daughter, niece or somebody, who just now is setting all our young scapegraces by the ears. You can see her if you just crane your neck a little. Hmm. Ha, ah, very pretty, very pretty. How much do you suppose Mrs. Sylvester is worth as she stands? Diamonds, you know, and all that. Well, I should say somewhere near ten thousand. That sprig in her hair cost a clean five. So, so, they live in a handsome house, I suppose. A regular palace, corner of Fifth Avenue, and all his? Nobody else's, I reckon. Sports horses and carriage, I suppose? Of course. Yacht, opera box? No reason why he shouldn't. What is his salary? A nominal sum, five or ten thousand, perhaps. Owns good share of the bank's stock, I presume. Enough to control it. Below par, though? A trifle, going up, however. And don't speculate. The way this man drawled his words was excessively disagreeable. Not that anyone knows of. He's made his fortune and now asks only to enjoy it. The man from the West strutted back and looked at his companion knowingly. What do you think of my judgment, Stutler? None better this side of the Pacific. Pretty good at spying out cracks, eh? I wouldn't like to undertake the puttying up that would deceive you. Hmm. Well then, mark this. In two months from today, you will see Mr. Sylvester rent his house and go south for his health. Or the pretty one over there will marry one of the scapegraces you mention, who will lend the man who don't engage in any further ventures, more than one or two hundred thousand dollars. Ha! Huh, you know something. I own mines in Colorado, and I have my points. And Mr. Sylvester? We'll find them too sharp for him. And having made his joke, he yielded to the other's apparent restlessness, and they sauntered off. They did not observe a pale, demure little lady that sat near them abstractedly nodding her dainty head to the remarks of a pale-whiskered youth at her side, nor noticed the emotion with which she suddenly rose at their departure and dismissed her chattering companion on some impromptu errand. It was only one of the ordinary group of dancers, a pretty, plainly-dressed girl, but her name was Stuyvesant. Rising with a decision that gave a very attractive colour to her cheeks, she hastily looked around. A trio of young gentlemen started towards her, but she gave them no encouragement. Her eye had detected Mr. Sylvester's tall figure a few feet off, and it was to him she desired to speak. But at her first movement in his direction, her glance encountered another face, and like a stream that melts into a rushing torrent, her purpose seemed to vanish, leaving her quivering with a new emotion of so vivid a character she involuntarily looked about her for a refuge. But in another instant her eyes had again sought the countenance that had so moved her, and finding it bent upon her own, faltered a little, and unconsciously allowed the lilies she was carrying to drop from her hand. Before she realised her loss, the face before her had vanished, and with it something of her hesitation and alarm. With a hasty action, she drew near Mr. Sylvester. "'Will you lend me your arm for a minute?' she asked, with her usual appealing look rendered doubly forcible by the experience of a moment before. "'Miss Stuyvesant, I am happy to see you.' Never had his face looked more cheerful, she thought. Never had his smile struck her more pleasantly. A little talk with a little girl will not hinder you too much, will it? she queried, 
glancing at the group of gentlemen that had shrunk back at her approach. "'Do you call that hindrance, which relieves one from listening to quotations of bank stock at an evening reception?' She shook her head with a confused movement, and led him up before a stand of flowering exotics. "'I want to tell you something,' she said eagerly, but with a marked timidity also. The tall form beside her looked so imposing for all its encouraging bend. "'I beg your pardon if I am doing wrong, but Papa regards you with such esteem, and—' "'Mr. Sylvester, do you know a man by the name of Stadler?' Astonished at such a question from lips so young and dainty, he turned and surveyed her for a moment with quick surprise. Something in her aspect struck him. He answered at once and without circumlocution. Yes, if you refer to that spry, keen-faced man just entering the supper room. Do you know his companion? she proceeded. The portly, highly pompous-looking gentleman with the gold eyeglasses. Look quickly. No. There was an uneasiness in his tone, however, that struck her painfully. He is a stranger in town. Has not the honour of your acquaintance, he says. But from the questions he asked, I judge he has a great interest in your affairs. He spoke of being connected with mines in Colorado. I was sitting behind a curtain and overheard what was said. Mr. Sylvester turned pale and regarded her attentively. "'Might I be so bold?' he inquired after a moment, as to ask you what that was. "'Yes, sir, certainly. But it is even harder for me to repeat than it was for me to hear. He inquired about your domestic concerns, your home and your income,' she murmured, blushing, and then said, in what I thought was a somewhat exulting tone, that in two months or so, we should see you go south for your health, or is not that enough for me to tell you, Mr. Sylvester? He gave her a short stare, opened his lips as if to speak, then turned abruptly aside, and began picking mechanically at the blossoms before him. I, of course, do not know what men mean when they talk of possessing points, but the leer and side glance which accompanies such talk have a universal language we all understand, and I felt that I must warn you of that man's malice, if only because Papa regards you so highly. He shrank as if touched on a sore place, but bowed and answered the wistful appeal of her glance with a shadow of his usual smile. Then he turned, and looking towards the door through which the two men had disappeared, made a movement as if he would follow but, remembering himself, escorted her to a seat, saying as he did so, "'You are very kind, Miss Stuyvesant. Please say nothing of this to Paula.' She bowed, and a flitting smile crossed her upturned countenance. "'I am not much of a gossip, Mr. Sylvester, or I should have been tempted to have carried my information to my father instead of to you.' He understood the implied promise in this remark and gave the hand on his arm a quick pressure, before relinquishing her to the care of the pale-complexioned youth, who by this time had returned to her side. In another moment Paula came up on the arm of a black-whiskered gentleman, all shirt-front and eyeglasses. "'Oh, Cicely!' she cried. She called Miss Stuyvesant Cicely now. "'Is it not a delightful evening?' "'Are you enjoying yourself so much?' inquired that somewhat agitated little lady, with a glance at the countenance of her friend's attendant. "'I fear it would scarcely seem consistent in me now to say no,' returned the radiant girl, with a laughing glance towards the same gentleman. But when they were alone, the gentleman having departed on some of the innumerable errands with which ladies seemed to delight in afflicting their attendant cavaliers at balls or receptions, she atoned for that glance by remarking, "'I do not find the average partner that falls to one's lot in such receptions all that fancy paints,' and then, finding she had repeated a phrase of Mr. Ensign's, blushed, though no one stood near her but Cicely. 
Fancy's brush would need to be dipped in but two colours to present to our eye the mass of them, was Cicely's laughing reply. A streak of black for the coat and a daub of white for the shirt front. Voila tout. With perhaps a dash of red in some cases, murmured a voice over their shoulders. They turned with hurried blushes. Ah, Mr. Ensign, quoth Cicely in unabashed gaiety. We reserve red for the exceptions. We did not intend to include our acknowledged friends in our somewhat sweeping assertion. Ah, I see. The black streak and the white daub are a symbol of... Uh, Miss Stuyvesant, very warm this evening. Have an ice, do. I always have an ice after dancing. So refreshing, you know. The manner in which he imitated the usual languid drawl of certain of the young scapegraces heretofore mentioned was irresistible. Paula forgot her confusion in her mirth. "'You are blessed with a capacity for playing both roles, I perceive,' cried Cicely with unusual abandon. "'Well, it is convenient. There is nothing like scope.' "'Unless it is hope,' whispered Mr. Ensign so low that only Paula could hear. But I warn you, continued Cicely, with a sweet soft laugh that seemed to carry her heart far out into the passing throng, that we have no fondness for the model bow of the period. A dish of milk makes a very good supper, but it looks decidedly pale on the dinner table. Yes, said Paula, eyeing the various young men that filed up and down before them, some pale, some dark, some handsome, some plain, but all smiling and dapper, if not debonair. Some men could be endured if only they were not men. Mr. Ensign gave her a quick look, and while he laughed at the paradox, straightened himself like one who could be a man if the occasion called. She saw the action and blushed. But their conversation was soon interrupted. Mr. Sylvester was seen returning from the supper-room, looking decidedly anxious, and while Paula was ignorant of what had transpired to annoy him, her ready spirit caught the alarm, and she was about to rush up to him and address him, when one of the waiters approached, and murmuring a few words she did not hear, handed him a card, upon which she descried nothing but a simple circle. Instantly a change crossed his already agitated countenance, and advancing to the ladies with a word or two that, while seemingly cheerful, struck Paula as somewhat forced, excused himself with the information that a business friend had been so inconsiderate as to importune him for an interview in the hall, and with just a nod towards Mr. Ensign, who had drawn back at his advance, left them and disappeared in the crowd about the door. I do not like these interruptions from business friends in a time of pleasure, cried Paula, looking after him with anxious eyes. Did you notice how agitated he seemed, Cicely? And half an hour ago he was the picture of calm enjoyment. Business is beyond our comprehension, Paula, returned her friend evasively. It is something like a neuralgic twinge. It takes a man when he least expects it. Have you told Mr. Ensign of our adventure? No, but I informed Mr. Sylvester, and he said such good, true words to me, Cicely. I can never forget them. And I told Papa, but he only frowned and made some observation about the degeneracy of the times and the number of scamps thrown to the top by the modern methods of acquiring instantaneous fortunes. Your papa is sometimes hard, is he not, Cicely? With a flush, Miss Stuyvesant allowed her eye to rest for a moment on the crowd shifting before her. He was dug from a quarry of granite, Paula. He is both hard and substantial, capable of being hewn, but not of being moulded. Of such stuff are formed monuments of enduring beauty and solidity. You must do papa justice. I do, but I sometimes have a feeling as if the granite column would fall and crush me, Cicely. You, Paula? Before she could again reply, Mr. Sylvester returned. His face was still pale, 
but it had acquired an expression of rigidity even more alarming to Paula than its previous aspect of forced merriment. Lifting her by the hand, he drew her apart. "'I shall have to leave you somewhat abruptly,' said he. "'An important matter demands my instant attention. "'Bertram is somewhere here, "'and will see that you and owner arrive home in safety. "'You won't allow your enjoyment to be clouded "'by my hasty departure, will you?' "'Not if it will make you anxious, "'but I would rather go home with you now. "'I am sure cousin owner would be willing.' "'But I am not going home at present,' said he, "'and she ventured upon no further remonstrance. "'But her enjoyment was clouded. "'The sight of suffering or anxiety on that face "'was more than she could bear, "'and ere long she said good-night to Cicely, "'and accepting the arm of Mr. Ensign, "'who was never very far from her side, "'proceeded to search for her cousin. "'She found her standing in the midst of an admiring throng, to whom her diamonds, if not her smiles, were an object of undoubted interest. She was in the full tide of one of her longest and most widely rambling speeches, and to Paula, with that stir of anxiety at her breast, was an image of self-satisfied complacency from which she was fain to drop her eyes. Mrs. Sylvester shares the honours with her husband, remarked Mr. Ensign as they drew near. "'But not the trials, or the pain, or the care,' was Paula's inward comment. Mrs. Sylvester was not easily wooed away from a circle in which she found herself creating such an impression, but at length she yielded to Paula's importunities, and consented to accept young Mr. Sylvester's attendance to their home. The next thing was to find Bertram. Mr. Ensign engaged to do this. Leaving Paula with her cousin, who may or may not have been pleased at this sudden addition to her circle, he sought for the young man, who, as Mr. Mandeville, was not unknown to any of the fashionable men and women of the day. It was no easy task, nor did he find him readily, but at last he came upon him leaning out of a window and gazing at a white lily which he held in his hand. Without preamble, Mr. Ensign made known his errand, and Bertram at once prepared to accompany him back to the ladies. "'By Jove! I didn't know the fellow was so handsome,' thought the former, and frowned he hardly knew why. Bertram was not handsome, but then Clarence Ensign was plain, which Bertram certainly was not. It was to Mr. Ensign's face, however, that Paula's eyes turned as the two came up and he, with the ready vivacity of his natural temperament, observed it, and took courage. "'I shall soon wish to measure that loophole of which I have spoken,' said he. And the soft look in her large dark eye as she responded, "'It is always open to friends,' filled up the measure of his cup of happiness, a cup which, unlike hers, had not been darkened that day, by the falling of earth's most dismal shadows. End of chapter 17。chapter 18 of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。In the Night Watches。Shall I not take mine ease in mine inn? Henry the Fourth. What doth gravity out of his bed at midnight? Henry the Fourth. It has been the most delightful evening I have ever passed, said Mrs. Sylvester, as she threw aside her rich white mantle in her ample boudoir. Sarah, two loops on that dolman tomorrow, do you hear? I thought my arms would freeze. Such an elegant gentleman as the Count de Frassac is. He absolutely went wild over you, Paula, but not understanding a word of English. Oh, there, if that horrid little wretch didn't drop his spoon on my dress after all. He swore it never touched a thread of it, but just look at that spot, right in the middle of a pleating too. Paula, your opinion in regard to the lavender was correct. I heard Mrs. Forsyth Jones whisper behind my back 
that lavender always made blondes look fade. Of course I needed no further evidence to convince me that I had entirely succeeded in eclipsing her pale-faced daughter. Her daughter! And the lazy gurgle echoed softly through the room, as if every white-haired girl in the city considered herself entitled to be called a blonde. She stopped to listen, examining herself in the glass nearby. I thought I heard Edward. It was very provoking in him to leave us in the cavalier manner in which he did. I was just going to introduce him to the Count. Not that he would have esteemed it much of an honour. Edward, I mean. But when one has a good-looking husband... Sarah, that curtain over there hangs crooked. Pull it straight this instant. Did you try the oysters, Paula? They were perfection. I shall have to dismiss Lorenzo without ceremony and procure me a cook that can make an oyster fricassee. By the way, did you notice? And so on and on for five minutes additional. Presently she burst forth with, I do believe I know what it is to be thoroughly satisfied at last. The consideration which one receives as the wife of the president of the Madison Bank is certainly very gratifying. If I had known I would feel such a change in the social atmosphere, I would have advocated Edward's dropping speculation long ago. Beauty and wealth may help one up the social ladder, but only a settled position such as he has now obtained can carry you safely over the top. I feel at last as if we had reached the pinnacle of my ambition and had seen the ladder by which we mounted thrown down behind us. If I get my costume from Worth in time, I shall give a German next month. Paula, from her stand at the door, for some minutes she had been endeavouring to escape to her room, surveyed her cousin in wonder. She had never seen her look as she did at that moment. Anyone who speaks from the heart acquires a certain eloquence, and Ona for once was speaking from her heart. The unwanted emotion made her cheeks burn, and even her diamonds, ten thousand dollars worth, as we have heard declared, were less brilliant than her eyes. Paula left her station on the door sill and glided rapidly back to her side. Oh, Ona, said she, if you would only look like that when... She paused. What right had she to venture upon giving lessons to her benefactor? "'When what?' inquired the other, subsiding at once into her naturally languid manner. Then, with a total forgetfulness of the momentary curiosity that had prompted the question, held out her head to the attendant Sarah, with a command to be relieved of her ornaments. Paula sighed and hastened to her room. She could not bring herself to mention her anxiety in regard to the still absent master of the house, to this lazily smiling, thoroughly satisfied woman. But none the less did she herself sit up in the moonlight, listening with bended head for the sound of his step on the walk beneath. She could not sleep while he was absent, and yet the thoughts that disturbed her and kept her from her virgin pillow could not have been entirely for him, or why those wandering smiles that ever and anon passed flitting over her cheek, awakening the dimples that slumbered there, until she looked more like a dreamy picture of delight than a wakeful vision of apprehension. Not entirely for him. Yet when somewhere towards three o'clock she heard the long-delayed step upon the stoop, she started up with eager eyes and a nervous gesture that sufficiently betrayed how intense was her interest in her benefactor's welfare and happiness. If he goes to Ona's room, it is all right, thought she, but if he keeps on upstairs, I shall know that something is wrong and that he needs a comforter. He did not stop at Ona's room, and struck with alarm, Paula opened wide her door and was about to step out to meet him, when she caught a sight of his face and started back. Here was no anxiety that she could palliate. The very fact that he did not observe her slight form standing before him in the brilliant moonlight proved that a woman's look or touch 
was not what he was in search of and shrinking sensitively to one side she sat down on the edge of her dainty bed dropping her cheek into her hand with a weary troubled gesture from which all the delight had fled and only the apprehension remained suddenly she started alertly up he was coming down again this time with a gliding muffled tread sliding past her door he descended to the floor below she could hear the one weak stair in the heavy staircase creak and what he has passed owner's room past the bronze figure of luxury on the platform beneath is on his way to the front door has opened it shut it softly behind him and gone out again into the blank midnight streets what did it mean for a moment she thought she would run down and awaken owner but an involuntary remembrance of how those lazy eyes would open stare peevishly and then shut again stopped her on the threshold of her door and sitting down again upon the side of her bed she waited this time with opened eyes eagerly staring before her and quivering form that started at each and every sound that disturbed the silence of the great echoing house at six o'clock she again rose he had just re-entered and this time he stopped at owner's room End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the sword of damocles by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain a day at the bank there's a divinity that shapes our ends rough hew them how we will hamlet there are days when the whole world seems to smile upon one without stint or reservation bertram sylvester wending his way to the bank on the morning following the reception was a cheerful sight to behold youth health hope spake in every lineament of his face and brightened every glance of his wide-awake eye his new life was pleasant to him bach beethoven and chopin were scarcely regretted now by the ambitious assistant cashier of the madison bank with a friend in each of its directors and a something more than that in the popular president himself besides he had developed a talent for the business and was in the confidence of the cashier a somewhat sickly man who more than once had found himself compelled to rely upon the rapidly maturing judgment of his young associate in matters oftentimes of the utmost importance the manner in which bertram found himself able to respond to these various calls convinced him that he had been correct in his opinion of his own nature when he informed his uncle that music was his pleasure rather than his necessity entering the building by way of pearl street he was about to open the door leading into the bank proper when he heard a little piping voice at his side and turning confronted the janitor's baby daughter she was a sweet and interesting child and with his usual good nature bertram at once stopped to give her a kiss i likes you prattled she as he put her down again after lifting her up high over his head but i likes de other one best i hope the other one duly appreciates your preference laughed he and was again on the point of entering the bank when he felt or thought he felt a hand laid on his arm it was the janitor himself this time a worthy man greatly trusted in the bank but possessed of such an extraordinary peculiarity in the way of a pair of protruding eyes that his appearance was always attended by a shock well hopgood what is it cried bertram in his cheery tone the janitor drew back and mercifully shifted his gaze from the young man's face nothing sir did i stop you beg pardon he continued half stammering i'm dreadful awkward sometimes and with a nod he sidled off towards his little one whom he confusedly took up in his arms now bertram was sure the man had touched him and that too with a very eager hand 
but being late that morning and consequently in somewhat of a hurry he did not stop to pursue the matter hastening into the bank he assisted the teller in opening the safe that being his especial duty and was taking out such papers as he himself required when he was surprised to catch another sight of those same extraordinary organs of which i have just spoken peering upon him from the door by which he had previously entered they vanished as soon as he encountered them but more than once during the morning he perceived them looking upon him from various quarters of the bank till he felt himself growing seriously annoyed and sending for the man asked him what he meant by this unusual surveillance the janitor seemed troubled flushed painfully and fixed his eyes in manifest anxiety on the cashier who engaged in some search of his own was just handling over the tin boxes that lined the vault before them not till he had seen him shove them back into their place and leave the spot did he venture upon his reply i'm sure sir i'm very sorry if i have annoyed you but do you think mr sylvester will be down at the usual hour i know of no reason why he should not returned bertram i have something to say to him when he comes in stammered the man evidently taken aback by bertram's look of surprise will you be kind enough to ring the bell the first moment he seems to be at leisure i don't know as it is a matter of any importance but he stopped evidently putting a curb upon himself can i rely on you sir yes certainly i will tell my uncle when he comes in that you want to speak to him he will doubtless send for you at once the man looked embarrassed excuse me sir but that's just what i'd rather you wouldn't do mr sylvester is always very busy and he might think i wished to annoy him about some matters of my own sir as indeed i have not been above doing at odd times if you would ring when he comes in that is all i ask bertram thought this a strange request but seeing the man so anxious gave the required promise and the janitor hurried off curious muttered bertram can anything be wrong and he glanced about him with some curiosity as he went to his desk but every one was at his post as usual and the countenances of all were equally undisturbed it was a busy morning and in the rush of various matters bertram forgot the entire occurrence but it was presently recalled to him by hearing some one remark mr sylvester is late to-day and looking up from some papers he was considering he found it was a full hour after the time at which his uncle was in the habit of appearing just then he caught still another sight of the protruding eyes of hopgood staring in upon him from the half-open door at the end of the bank the fellow's getting impatient thought he and experienced a vague feeling of uneasiness another half-hour passed what can have detained mr sylvester cried mr wheelock the cashier hastily approaching bertram there is to be an important meeting of the directors to-day and some of the gentlemen are already coming in mr sylvester is not accustomed to keep us waiting i don't know i'm sure returned bertram remembering with an accession of uneasiness the abruptness with which his uncle had left the entertainment the evening before shall i telegraph to the house no that is not necessary besides folger says he passed him on broadway this morning going down the street with a valise in his hand that gentleman quietly put in folger was the teller he was looking very pale and didn't see me when i nodded what time was that asked bertram about twelve when i went out to lunch a quick gasp sounded at their side followed by a hurried cough turning bertram encountered for the fifth time the eyes of hopgood he had entered unperceived by the small door that separated the inner enclosure from the outer and was now standing very close to them eyeing with sidelong looks the safe at their back the faces of the gentlemen speaking yes and even the countenances of the clerks as they bent busily over their books did you ring sir asked he catching bertram's look of displeasure no 
the man seemed to feel the rebuke implied in this short response and ambled softly away but in another moment he was stopped by bertram what is the matter with you to-day hopgood can you have anything of real importance on your mind anything connected with my uncle the janitor started and looked almost frightened be careful what you say whispered he then with a keen look at mr wheelock just then on the point of entering the director's room he was turning to escape by the little door just mentioned when it opened and mr stuyvesant came in with a look almost of terror the janitor recoiled throwing himself as it were between the latter and the door of the safe but recovering himself surveyed the keen quiet visage of the veteran banker with a rolling of his great eyes absolutely painful to behold mr stuyvesant who was somewhat absorbed in thought did not appear to notice the agitation he had caused and with just a hurried nod followed mr wheelock into the director's room instantly the janitor drew himself up with an air of relief and shortly glancing at the clock which lacked a few minutes yet of the time fixed for the meeting slided hastily away from bertram's detaining hand and disappeared in the crowd without in another moment bertram saw him standing at the outer door looking anxiously up and down the street something is wrong murmured bertram what and for a moment he felt half tempted to return mr stuyvesant's friendly bow with a few words expressive of his uneasiness but the emphasis with which hopgood had murmured the words be careful what you say unconsciously deterred him and concealing his nervousness as best he might he entered the director's office it was now time for the meeting to open and the gentlemen were all seated around the low green baize table that occupied the centre of the room impatience was written on all their countenances mr stuyvesant especially was looking at the heavy gold watch in his hand with a frown on his deeply wrinkled brow that did not add to its expression of benevolence the empty seat at the head of the table stared upon bertram uncompromisingly my wife gives a reception to-day ventured one gentleman to his neighbour and i have an engagement at five that won't bear postponement sylvester has always been on hand before we can't proceed without him was the reply mr wheelock looked thoughtful with a nod of his head towards such gentlemen as met his eye bertram hastened to a little cupboard devoted to the use of himself and uncle opening it he looked within took down a coat he saw hanging before him and unconsciously uttered an exclamation it was a dress coat such as had been worn by mr sylvester the evening before what does this mean my uncle has been here were the words that sprang to his lips but he subdued his impulse to speak and hastily hanging up the coat relocked the door proceeding at once to the outer room he asked two or three of the clerks if they were sure mr sylvester had not been in during the day but they all returned an unequivocal no and that too with a certain stare of surprise that at once convinced him he was betraying his agitation too plainly i will telegraph whether wheelock considers it necessary or not thought he and was moving to summon a messenger boy when he caught sight of hopgood slowly making his way in from the street he was very pale and walked with his eyes fixed on the ground ominously shaking his great head in a way that bespoke an inner struggle of no ordinary nature bertram at once sauntered out to meet him hopgood said he your evident anxiety is infectious what has happened to make my uncle's detention a matter of such apparent import if you do not wish to confide in me his nephew almost his son speak to mr wheelock or to one of the directors but don't keep anything to yourself which concerns his welfare or what are you looking at the man was gazing as if fascinated at the keys in bertram's hand nothing sir nothing you must not detain me 
"'I have nothing to say. I will wait ten minutes,' he muttered to himself, glancing again at the clock. Suddenly he saw the various directors come filing out of the inner room, and darted for the second time from Bertram's detaining hand. "'I hope nothing has happened to Mr. Sylvester,' exclaimed one gentleman to another as they filed by. "'If he were given to a loose end sort of business, it would be another thing.' "'He looked exceedingly well at the reception last night,' exclaimed another. "'But in these days—' Suddenly there was a hush. A telegraph boy had just entered the door, and was asking for Mr. Bertram Sylvester. "'Here I am,' said Bertram, hastily taking the envelope presented him. Slightly turning his back, he opened it. Instantly his face grew white as chalk. "'Gentlemen!' said he you will have to excuse my uncle to-day a great misfortune has occurred to him then with a slow and horror-stricken movement he looked about him and exclaimed mrs sylvester is dead a confused murmur at once arose followed by a hurried rush but of all the faces that flocked out of the bank none wore such a look of blank and helpless astonishment as that of hopgood the janitor as with bulging eyes and nervously working hands he slowly wended his way to the foot of the stairs and there sat down gazing into vacancy end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dregs in the Cup. O oh, eloquent, just, and mighty death, whom none could advise, thou hast persuaded, what none hath dared, thou hast done, and whom all the world hath flattered thou only hast cast out of the world and despised thou hast drawn together all the far-stretched greatnesses all the pride cruelty and ambition of man and covered it all over with these two narrow words hic jacet sir walter raleigh bertram's hurried ring at his uncle's door was answered by samuel the butler what is this i hear cried the young man entering with considerable agitation mrs sylvester dead yes sir returned the old and trusty servant with something like a sob in his voice she went out riding this morning behind a pair of borrowed horses and being unused to michael's way of driving they ran away and she was thrown from the carriage and instantly killed and miss fairchild she didn't go with her. Mrs. Sylvester was alone. Horrible, horrible. Where is my uncle? Can I see him? I don't know, sir, the man returned with a strange look of anxiety. Mr. Sylvester is feeling very bad, sir. He has shut himself up in his room, and none of his servants dare disturb him, sir. I should, however, like him to know I am here. In what room shall I find him? in the little one sir at the top of the house it has a curious lock on the door you will know it by that very well please be in the hall when i come down i may want to give you some orders the old servant bowed and bertram hastened with hushed steps to ascend the stairs at the first platform he paused what is there in a house of death of sudden death especially that draws a veil of spectral unreality over each familiar object behind that door now inexorably closed before him lay without doubt the shrouded form of her who but a few short hours before had dazzled the eyes of men and made envious the hearts of women with her imposing beauty no such quiet then reigned over the spot filled by her presence as the vision of a dream returns he saw her again in all her splendour never a brow in all the great hall shone more brightly beneath its sparkling diamonds 
never a lip in the whole vast throng curled with more self-complacent pride or melted into a more alluring smile than that of her who now lay here a marble image beneath the eye of day it was as if a flowery field had split beneath the dancing foot of some laughing siren one moment your gaze is upon the swaying voluptuous form the half-shut beguiling eye the white outreaching arms upon whose satin surface a thousand loves seem perching the next you stare horror-stricken upon the closing jaws of an awful pit with the flash of something bright in your eyes and the sense of a hideous noiseless rush in which earth and heaven appear to join sink and be swallowed bertram felt his heart grow sick moving on he passed the bronze image of luxury lying half asleep on its bed of crumpled roses hideous mockery what has luxury to do with death she who was luxury itself has vanished from these halls shall the mute bronze go on smiling over its wine cup while she who was its prototype is carried by without a smile on the lips once so vermeil with pride and tropical languors arrived at the top of the house bertram knocked at the door with the strange lock and uttering his own name asked if there was anything he could do here or elsewhere to show his sympathy and desire to be of use in this great and sudden bereavement there was no immediate reply and he began to fear he would be obliged to retire without seeing his uncle when the door was slowly opened and mr sylvester came out instantly bertram understood the anxiety of the servant not only did mr sylvester's countenance exhibit the usual traces of grief and horror incident to a sudden and awful calamity but there were visible upon it the tokens of another and still more unfathomable emotion a wild and paralyzed look that altered the very contour of his features and made his face almost like that of a stranger uncle what is it sprang involuntarily to his lips but mr sylvester betraying by a sudden backward movement an instinctive desire to escape scrutiny he bethought himself and with hasty utterance offered some words of consolation that sounded strangely hollow and superficial in that dim and silent corridor is there nothing i can do for you he finally asked everything is being done exclaimed his uncle in a strained and altered voice robert is here and a silence fell over the hall that bertram dared not break i have help for everything but he did not say what it seemed as if something rose up in his throat that choked him bertram said he at last in a more natural tone come with me he led him into an adjoining room and shut the door it was a room from which the sunshine had not been excluded and it seemed as if they could both breathe more easily sit down said his uncle pointing to a chair the young man did so but mr sylvester remained standing then without preamble have you seen her there was no grief in the question only a quiet respect death clothes the most volatile with a garment of awe bertram slowly shook his head no said he i came at once upstairs there is no mark on her white body save the least little discoloured dent here continued his uncle pointing calmly to his temple she had one moment of fear while the horses ran and then he gave a quick shudder and advancing towards bertram laid his hand on his nephew's shoulder in such a way as to prevent him from turning his head bertram said he i have no son if i were to call upon you to perform a son's work for me to obey and ask no questions would you comply can you ask sprang from the young man's lips you know that you have only to command for me to be proud to obey 
Anything you can require will find me ready. The hand on his shoulder weighed heavier. It seems a strange time to talk about business, Bertram, but necessity knows no law. There is a matter in which you can afford me great assistance if you will undertake to do immediately what I ask. Can you doubt? Hush! It is this. On this paper you will find a name. Below it a number of addresses. They are all of places downtown, and some of them not very reputable, I fear. What I desire is for you to seek out the man whose name you here see, going to these very places after him, beginning with the first and continuing down the list until you find him. When you come upon him, he will ask you for a card. Give him one on which you will scrawl before his eyes a circle, so. It is a token which he should instantly understand. If he does, address him with freedom and tell him that your employer, you need make use of no names, re-demands the papers made over to him this morning. If he manifests surprise or is seen to hesitate, tell him your orders are imperative. If he declares ruin will follow, inform him that you are not to be frightened by words, that your employer is as fully aware of the position of affairs as he. Whatever he says, bring the papers. Bertram nodded his head and endeavoured to rise, but his uncle's hand rested upon him too heavily. He is a small man. You need have no dread of him physically. The sooner you find him and acquit yourself of your task, the better I shall be pleased. And then the hand lifted. On his way downstairs, Bertram encountered Paula. She was standing in the hall and accosted him with a very trembling tone in her voice. All her questions were in regard to Mr. Sylvester. Have you seen him? she asked. Does he speak, say anything? No one has heard him utter a word since he came in from downtown and saw her lying there. Yes, certainly. He spoke to me. He has been giving me some commissions to perform. I am on my way now to attend to them. She drew a deep breath. Oh, she cried. Would that he had a son, a daughter, a child, someone. This exclamation, following what had taken place above, struck Bertram forcibly. He has a son in me, Paula. Love, as well as duty, binds me to him. All that a child could do will I perform with pleasure. You can trust me for that. She threw him a glance of searching inquiry. His need is greater than it seems, whispered she. He was deeply troubled before this terrible accident occurred. I am afraid the arrow is poisoned that has made this dreadful wound. I cannot explain myself, she went on hurriedly. But if you indeed regard him as a father, be ready with any comfort, any help that affection can bestow or his necessities require. Let me feel that he has near him some stay that will not yield to pressure. There was so much passion in this appeal that Bertram involuntarily bowed his head. He has two friends, said he, and here is my hand that I will never forsake him. I do not need to offer mine, she returned. He is great and good enough to do without my assistance. But nevertheless, she gave her hand to Bertram, and with a glow of her lip and eye that made her beauty supreme at all times, something almost supernatural in its character. I dared not tell him, she whispered to herself, as the front door closed with the dull, slow thud proper to a house of mourning. I dare not tell anyone, but... What lay beyond that but... When Mr. Sylvester came in at six o'clock in the morning, Paula had risen from the bed on which she had been sitting, but not to make preparation for rest, for she could not rest. The vague shadow of some surrounding evil or threatened catastrophe was upon her, and though she forced herself to change her dress for a warmer and more suitable one, 
she did not otherwise break her vigil, though the necessity for it seemed to be at an end. It was a midwinter morning, and the sun had not yet risen, so being chilly as well as restless, she began to pace the floor, stopping now and then to glance out of the window, in the hopes of detecting some signs of awakening day in the blank and solemn east. Suddenly, as she was thus consulting the horizon, a light flashed up from below, and looking down upon the face of the extension that ran along at right angles to her window, she perceived that the shades were up in Mrs. Sylvester's boudoir. They had doubtless been left so the evening before, and Mr. Sylvester, upon turning up the gas, had failed to observe the fact. Instantly she felt her heart stand still, for the house being wide and the extension narrow, all that went on in that boudoir, or at least in that portion of it which Mr. Sylvester at present occupied, was easily observable from the window at which she stood, and that something was going on of a serious and important nature was sufficiently evident from the expression of Mr. Sylvester's countenance. He was standing with his face bent towards someone seated out of his sight, his wife undoubtedly, though what could have called her from her dreams, and was busily engaged in talking. The subject, whatever it was, absorbed him completely. If Paula had allowed herself the thought, she would have described him as pleading, and that with no ordinary vehemence. But suddenly, while she gazed half fascinated, and but little realising what she was doing, he started back, and a fierce change swept over his face, a certain incredulity, that presently gave way to a glance of horror and repugnance, which the quick action of his outthrown palm sufficiently emphasised. He was pushing something from him, but what? A suggestion? or a remembrance, it was impossible to determine. The countenance of Mrs. Sylvester, who that moment appeared in sight, sailing across the floor in her Asia wrapper, offered but little assistance in the way of explanation. Immovable under most circumstances, it was simply, at this juncture, a trifle more calm and cold than usual, presenting to Paula's mind the thought of a white and icy barrier, against which the most glowing of arrows must fall chilled and powerless. Oh, for a woman's soul to inform that breast, if but for a moment, cried Paula, lost in the passion of this scene, while so little understanding its import. When, as if in mockery to this invocation, the haughty form upon which she was gazing started rigidly erect, while the lip acquired a scorn and the eye a menace that betrayed the serpent ever in hiding under this white rose. Paula could look no longer. This last revelation had awakened her to the fact that she was gazing upon a scene sacred to the husband and wife engaged in it. With a sense of shame, she rushed to the bed and threw herself upon it, but the vision of what she had beheld would not leave her so easily. Like letters of fire upon a black ground, the panorama of looks and gestures to which she had just been witness floated before her mind's eye, awakening a train of thought so intense that she did not know which was worse, to be there in the awful dawn dreaming over this episode of the night, or to rise and face again the reality. The fascination which all forbidden sights insensibly exert over the minds of the best of us finally prevailed, and she crept slowly to the window to catch a parting glimpse of Mr. Sylvester's tall form hurrying blindly from the boudoir, followed by his wife's cold glance. The next minute the exposed condition of the room seemed to catch that lady's attention, and with an anxious look into the dull grey morn, Mrs. Sylvester drew down the shades, and the episode was over. Or so Paula thought, but when she was returning upstairs after her solitary breakfast, Mrs. Sylvester was too tired, and Mr. Sylvester too much engaged to eat, as the attentive Samuel informed her. The door of Ona's room swung ajar, 
and she distinctly heard her give utterance to the following exclamation. "'What? Give up this elegant home? My horses and carriage? The friends I have had such difficulty in obtaining? And the position which I was born to adorn? I had rather die!' And Paula, feeling as if she had received the key to the enigma of the last night's unaccountable manifestations, was about to rush away to her own apartment, when the door swayed open again, and she heard his voice respond with hard and bitter emphasis. And it might be better that you should. But, since you will probably live, let it be according to your mind. I have not the courage. There the door swung to. An hour from that, Mr. Sylvester left the house with a small valise in his hand, and Mrs. Sylvester, dressed in her showiest costume, entered her carriage for an early shopping excursion. And so, when Paula whispered to herself, I did not dare to tell him, I did not dare to tell anyone, but... She thought of those terrible words. Die? It might be better, perhaps, that you should and then remembered the ghastly look of immeasurable horror with which a few hours later he staggered away from that awful burden whose rigid lines would never again melt into mocking curves and to whom the morning's wide soaring hopes high-reaching ambitions and boundless luxuries were now no more than the shadows of a vanished world life love longing with all their demands, having dwindled to a noisome rest between four close planks, with darkness for its present portion, and beyond, what? End of chapter 20「twenty one of The Sword of Damocles by Anna Catherine Green this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Departure. For ever and for ever, farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why then, this parting was well made. Julius Caesar. Samuel had received his orders to admit Mr. Bertram Sylvester to his uncle's room at whatever hour of the day or night he chose to make his appearance. But evening wore away, and finally the night, before his well-known face was seen at the door. Proceeding at once to the apartment occupied by Mr. Sylvester, he anxiously knocked. The door was opened immediately. "'Ah, Bertram, I have been expecting you all night,' and from the haggard appearance of both men, it was evident that neither of them had slept." I have sat down but twice since I left you, and then only in conveyances. I have been obliged to go to Brooklyn, to... But you have found him. Yes, I found him. His uncle glanced inquiringly at his hands. They were empty. I shall have to sit down, said Bertram. His brow was very gloomy. His words came hesitatingly. I had rather have knocked my head against the wall than have disappointed you, he murmured after a moment's pause, but when I did find him, it was too late. Too late! The tone in which this simple phrase was uttered was indescribable. Bertram slowly nodded his head. He had already disposed of all the papers, and favourably, he said. But, and not only that, pursued Bertram. He had issued orders by telegraph that it was impossible to countermand. It was at the 42nd Street depot I found him at last. He was just on the point of starting for the West. And has he gone? Yes, sir. Mr. Sylvester walked slowly to the window. It was raining drearily without, but he did not notice the falling drops or raise his eyes to the leaden skies. Did you meet any one? he asked at length. Any one that you know, I mean, or who knows you? No one but Mr. Stuyvesant. Mr. Stuyvesant? Yes, sir, returned Bertram, 
dropping his eyes before his uncle's astonished glance. I was coming out of a house in Broad Street when he passed by and saw me, or at least I believed he saw me. There is no mistaking him, sir, for anyone else. Besides, it is a custom of his, I am told, to saunter through the downtown streets after the warehouses are all closed for the night. He enjoys the quiet, I suppose, finds food for reflection in the sleeping aspect of our great city. There was gloom in Bertram's tone. His uncle looked at him curiously. What house was it from which you were coming when he passed you? A building where Tuller and co. do business, shady operators in paper, as you know. And you believed he recognised you? I cannot be sure, sir. It was dark, but I thought I saw him look at me and give a slight start. Ah, how desolate sounds the drip, drip of a ceaseless rain when conversation languishes and the ear has time to listen. I will explain to Mr. Stuyvesant when I see him that you were in search of a man with whom I had pressing business, observed Mr. Sylvester at last. No, murmured Bertram with effort. It might emphasise the occurrence in his mind. Let the matter drop where it is. There was another silence during which the drip of the rain on the window-ledge struck on the young man's ears like the premonitory thud of falling earth upon a coffin lid. At length his uncle turned and advanced rapidly towards him. Bertram, said he, you have done me a favour for which I thank you. What you have learned in the course of its accomplishment I cannot tell. Enough, perhaps, to make you understand why I warned you from the dangerous path of speculation, and set your feet in a way that, if adhered to with steadfast purpose, ought to lead you at last to a safe and honourable prosperity. Now, no, Bertram, he bitterly interrupted himself as the other opened his lips, I am in need of no especial commiseration. My affairs seem bound to prosper whether I will or not, now I have one more commission to give you. Miss Fairchild. His voice quavered and he leaned heavily on the chair near which he was standing. Have you seen her, Bertram? Is the poor child quite prostrated? Has this frightful occurrence made her ill? Or does she bear up with fortitude under the shock of this sudden calamity? She is not ill, but her suffering is undoubted. If you could see her and say a few words to relieve her anxiety in regard to yourself, I think it would greatly comfort her. Her main thought seems to be for you, sir. Mr. Sylvester frowned, raised his hand with a repelling gesture, and hastily opened his lips. Bertram thought he was about to utter some passionate phrase, but instead of that he merely remarked, I am sorry I cannot see her but it is quite impossible. You must stand between me and this poor child, Bertram. Tell her I send her my love. Tell her that I am quite well. Anything to solace her and make these dark days less dreary. If she wants a friend with her, let a messenger be sent for whomever she desires. I place no restrictions upon anything you choose to do for her comfort or happiness but let me be spared the sight of any other face than yours until this is all over. After the funeral, it may sound ungracious, but I am far from feeling so, I shall wish to be left alone for a while. If she can be made to understand this, I think her instincts, sir, have already led her to divine your wishes. If I am not mistaken, she is even now making preparations to return to her relatives. Mr. Sylvester gave a start. What, so soon, he murmured, and the sadness of his tone smote Bertram to the heart. But in another moment he recovered himself, and shortly exclaimed, Well, well, that is as it should be. You will watch over her, Bertram, and see that she is kindly cared for. It would be a grief to me to have her go away with any more than the necessary regret at losing one who was always kind to her. I will look after her as after a sister, returned Bertram, 
she shall miss no attention which I can supply. With a look, Mr. Sylvester expressed his thanks. Then, while Bertram again attempted to speak, he gave him a cordial pressure of the hand, and withdrew once more to his favourite spot. And the rain beat, beat, and it sounded more and more like the droppings of earth upon a nailed-down coffin lid. The funeral was a large one, the largest, some said, that had ever been seen in that quarter of the city. If Mrs. Sylvester's position had not been what it was, the sudden and awful nature of her death would have been sufficient to draw together a large crowd. Among those who thus endeavoured to show their respect was Miss Stuyvesant. "'I could not join you here in your pleasures,' she whispered to Paula, in the short interview they had upstairs, preparatory to the services, "'but I cannot keep away in the dark hours.' And from her look and the clasp of her hand, Paula gained fresh courage to endure the slow pressure of anxiety and grief with which she was secretly burdened. Moreover, she had the pleasure of introducing her beloved friend to Mr. Bertram Sylvester, a pleasure which she had long promised herself whenever the opportunity should arrive, as Miss Stuyvesant was somewhat of an enthusiast as regards music. She did not notice particularly then, but she remembered afterwards, with what a blushing cheek and beautiful glance the dainty young girl received his bow, and responded to his few respectful words of pleasure at meeting the daughter of a man whom he had learned to regard with so much respect. Mr. Sylvester was in a room by himself. The few glimpses obtained of him by his friends convinced them all that this trouble touched him more deeply than those who knew his wife intimately could have supposed. Yet he was calm, and already wore that fixed look of rigidity which was henceforth to distinguish the expression of his fine and noble features. In the ride to Greenwood he spoke little. Paula, who sat in the carriage with him, did not receive a word, though now and then his eye wandered towards her with an expression that drove the blood to her heart and made the whole day one awful memory of incomprehensible agony and dim but terrible forebodings. The ways of the human soul in its crises of grief or remorse were so new to her. She had passed her life beside rippling streams and in peaceful meadows, and now all at once, with shadow on shadow, the dark pictures of life settled down before her, and she could not walk without stumbling upon jagged rocks, deep yawning chasms, and caves of impenetrable gloom. The sight of the grave appalled her. To lay in such a bed as that the fair and delicate head that had often found the downy pillows of its azure couch too hard for its languid pressure, to hide in such a dismal, deep, dark gap a form so white, and but a little while before, so imposing in its splendour and so commanding in its requirements. The thought of heaven brought no comfort. The beauty they had known lay here, soulless, inert, rigid and responseless, but here. It was gifted with no wings with which to rise. It owned no attachment to higher spheres. Death had scattered the leaves of this white rose, but from all the boundless mirror of the outspread heavens, no recovered semblance of its perfected beauty looked forth to solace Paula or assuage the misery of her glance into this gloomy pit. Ah, owner, the social ladder reaches high, but it does not scale the regions where your poor soul could find comfort now. Bertram saw the white look on Paula's face and silently offered his arm. But there are moments when no mortal help can aid us, instants when the soul stands as solitary in the universe as the shipwrecked mariner on a narrow strip of rock in a boundless sea. Life may touch, but eternity enfolds us. We are single before God, 
and as such must stand or fall. Upon their return to the house, Mr. Sylvester withdrew with a few intimate friends to his room, and Paula, lonely beyond expression, went to her own empty apartment to finish packing her trunks and answer such notes as had arrived during her absence. For attention from outsiders was only too obtrusive. Many whom she had never met save in the most formal intercourse flooded her now with expressions of condolence, which if they had not been all upon one pattern, and that the most conventional, might have afforded her some relief. Two or three of the notes were precious to her, and these she stowed safely away. One contained a deliberate offer of marriage from a wealthy old stockbroker. This she as deliberately burned after she had written a proper refusal. He thinks I have no home, she murmured. And had she? As she paced through the silent halls and elaborately furnished rooms on her way to her solitary dinner, she asked herself if any place would ever seem like home after this. Not that she was infatuated by its elegance. The lofty walls might dwindle, the gorgeous furniture grow dim, the works of beauty disappear, the whole towering structure contract to the dimensions of a simple cottage, or what was worse, a seedy downtown house. If only the something would remain, the something that made return to Grotewell seem like the bending back of a towering stalk to the ground from which it had taken its root. If, she cried, and stopped there, her heart swelling, she knew not why. Then again, I thought I had found a father. Then, after a longer pause, a wild, uncontrollable, bless, 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 which seemed to re-echo in the room long after her lingering step had left it. Will he let me go without a word? It was early morning, and the time had come for Paula's departure. She was standing on the threshold of her room, her hands clasped, her eyes roving up and down the empty halls. Will he let me go without a word? Oh, Miss Paula, what do you think? cried Sarah creeping slowly towards her from the spectral recesses of a dim corner. Jane says Mr. Sylvester was up all last night too. She heard him go downstairs about midnight, and he went through all the rooms like a gliding spectre, and into her room too, she fearfully whispered. And what he did there no one knows, but when he came out he locked the door, and this morning the cook heard him give orders to Samuel, to have the trunks that were ready in Mrs. Sylvester's room taken away. Oh, miss, do you think he can be going to give all those beautiful things to you? Paula recoiled in horror. Sarah, said she, and could say no more. The vision of that tall form gliding through the desolate house at midnight, bending over the soulless finery of his dead wife, perhaps stowing it away in boxes, came with too powerful a suggestion to her mind. "'Sure I thought you would be pleased,' murmured the girl, and disappeared again into one of the dim recesses. "'Will he let me go without a word?' "'Miss Paula, Mr. Bertram Sylvester is waiting at the door in a carriage,' came in low, respectful tones to her ears, and Samuel's face, full of regret, appeared at the top of the stairs. "'I am coming.' murmured the sad-hearted girl, and with a sob which she could not control, she took her last look of the pretty pink chamber in which she had dreamed so many dreams of youthful delight, and perhaps of youthful sorrow also, and slowly descended the stairs. Suddenly, as she was passing a door on the second floor, she heard a low, deep cry, Paula! She stopped, and her hand went to her heart. The reaction was so sudden. Yes, she murmured, standing still with great heartbeats of joy. Or was it pain? The door slowly opened. Did you think I could let you go without a blessing, my Paula, my little one? 
came in those deep heart tones which always made her tears start, and Mr. Sylvester stepped out of the shadows beyond and stood in the shadows at her side. I did not know, she murmured. I am so young, so feeble, such a moat in this great atmosphere of anguish. I longed to see you, to say good-bye, to thank you, but... Tears stopped her words. This was a parting that rent her tender heart. Mr. Sylvester watched her, and his deep chest rose spasmodically. Paula, said he, and there was a depth in his tone even she had never heard before. Are these tears for me? With a strong effort she controlled herself, looked up, and faintly smiled. I am an orphan, she gently murmured. You have been kind and tender to me beyond words. I have let myself love you as a father. A spasm crossed his features. The hand he had lifted to lay upon her head fell at his side. He surveyed her with eyes whose despairing fondness told her that her love had been more than met by this desolate childless man. But he did not reply as seemed natural. Be to me then as a child. I can offer you no mother to guide or watch over you. But one parent is better than none. Henceforth you shall be known as my daughter. Instead of that, he shook his head mournfully, yearningly, but irrevocably, and said, To be your father would have been a dear position to occupy. I have sometimes hoped that I might be so blessed as to call it mine, but that is all past now. Your father I can never be, but I can bless you, he murmured brokenly, not as I did that day in your aunt's little cottage, but silently and from afar, as God always meant you should be blessed by me. Goodbye, Paula. Then all the deeps in her great nature broke up. She did not weep, but she looked at him with her large dark eyes, and the cry in them smote his heart. With a struggle that blanched his face, he kept his arms at his side, but his lips worked in agony, and he slowly murmured, If after a time your heart loves me like this, and you are willing to bear shadow as well as sunshine with me, come back with your aunt and sit at my hearthstone, not as my child, but as a dear and honoured guest. I will try and be worthy. He paused. Will you come, Paula? Yes, yes. Not soon, not now, he murmured. God will show you when. And with nothing but a look, without having touched her, or so much as brushed her garments with his, he retired again into his room. End of chapter 21